us already. That's great, but we're not gonna be live for another four minutes. So go grab yourself a coffee or tea and we'll be back at 11. day four of the Weird Developers Life Week. I'm so excited to have you for day four here in Vienna in our virtual studio. Wherever you're watching us from, make sure you're comfortable because we have a full day with really interesting talks coming up. If you're just tuning in and you don't know what is this, what is happening, who am I? My name is Vilana, I'm the Community Program Manager of Weird Developers and this week's moderator. So. If you're watching the whole day and also tomorrow, you'll be seeing my face around every 45 minutes. So what is this? The Weird Developers Life Week is actually a virtual whole week conference that we put together in memory of our Weird Developers Congress that was supposed to start actually today in Berlin. But well, during the current situation, we had to postpone it for 2021. However, we put together uh, our best speakers, we invited some new faces and we have prepared this whole week for you. If you have missed to watch the first three days, you can go back and enjoy the talks as well on the weekend. Well, what is important to know for watching this is actually really simple two things. You need to have 
Slack. Our Slack channel is We're Developers Live and there is where you can connect with all the participants and discuss everything that is in interest of you and also find the speaker slides later after their presentations. And I cannot emphasize how important it is to use Slido, which is our second channel for communication, because this really, really helps the speaker to hear you, to have your feedback and to know that you're listening and you're, that you're right there watching them. Slido you can use if you watch this on our weirddevelopers.com slash live page, right next to me. Uh, you should see Slido and you can participate in polls and write questions. If you're watching this on YouTube or on any other platform, in, uh, under the video there should be a link where you can go and access um, our page or go directly to slido.com and put the, the, the code LIVE2020 so you can also participate in the discussion. And I really cannot emphasize more how important this is because it really supports everybody who is just talking to, to their laptop to know that that you're there and listening. Well, we do have one active poll right now, which we can test together shortly. Um, what for breakfast? What do you prefer to have for breakfast? Sweet, salty, boat or something else? I wonder what other would be, but well, let's see. So the majority of the people who are voting right now actually prefer sweet, but also kind of a lot of people wouldn't mind both sweet and salty. I also like really the sweet and salty combination, so I'm, I'm with you on this. So it's great to see that you're participating and you're active there because that means you have found Slido and you know how to use it. So make sure you also use it through, throughout every talk that we have. And let's look at the agenda that we have today. Whoa! It's not only diverse from topics but on the formats. We're gonna have talks, panel discussions and even a two-hour workshop today. So make sure you check the agenda so you know how to plan your day and participate to whatever is, the, is most interesting for you. We're going to start with talks about engineers life cycle, then have a call for code initiative talk. We're going to switch to a panel and then I said a workshop at 3.45, a two hours workshop to build your digital portfolio lightning fast with Corbit. So make sure you plan your day so you have time to participate in this long war workshop and enjoy the and enjoy this session. And we're gonna finish the day with Jimmy Song and uh, talk about Bitcoin. He's tuning in all the way from US for us. So it will be an exciting day as you see. And actually, if you are a person who likes to speak and who has content to share, get in touch with us because we always look for new stars for our stages, for our sessions. And now as we're gonna be doing these live events very often, you can submit, uh, send us your send us your session or your proposal and uh, you should be seeing the email right now that you can send us, uh, send us this to. It's CFP, call for papers at weardevelopers.com. We always, always appreciate your content and we would love to give stage to, to people who have something important to say and have something interesting to give to our developers community. Well, I can talk more and more. I see already questions are coming in. So it's awesome to see that you actually are using Slido. Keep doing this. Can we post the link to the Slack channel? I see that's one question. Yes, we will post it uh, just as we start the first session. Our first session is from Devlin and he's going to tell us what is Terraform and how we can use Terraform for, dev for developers. He is a full stack software developer, trainer and a speaker and he loves also sharing his expertise with university students and uh, through different courses. So let's welcome Devlin, make sure you get your questions uh, on because he will be tuning in and answering them at the end of the talk. Hello everyone, I'm Devlin Duldulao. I'm a software developer at Enmera and I'm here to talk about automating your infrastructure deployments in the Google Cloud, Azure and AWS with Terraform. But uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, our developers, for inviting me here to share with you this. Okay, so uh, 
let's start so uh, infrastructure as code which is sometimes called IAC uses automation to manage infrastructure for example instead of configuring your servers one at a time you use a tool to configure all of them at once you express the infrastructure you need for your application as code such as a configuration file or a script what is uh, what infrastructure as code can do uh, can eliminate manual error prone provisioning and changes bring software best practices to infrastructure management gain visibility of changes through code reviews and previews and now why infrastructure as code um, you have this automated and repeatable decrease time to market for new applications and ongoing maintenance safe uh, predictable changes in short you have increased speed reduce risk reduce cost and leverage developer best practices and we have terraform by hashicorp here so terraform use infrastructure as code to provision and manage any cloud infrastructure service uh, you can write declarative configuration files you know define infrastructure as code to manage the full life cycle create new resources manage 16 uh, ones and destroy those uh, no longer need needed uh, plan and uh, predict changes now terraform provides an elegant user experience for operators to safely and predictably make changes to infrastructure then uh, create reproducible infrastructure terraform makes it easy to reuse configurations for similar infrastructure helping you avoid mistakes and save time terraform in itself is an open source tool by hashicorp written in the go language the go code is compiled into a single binary this binary is used to deploy infrastructures or build a server using just a shell the terraform binary makes api calls to google cloud um, AWS, Azure, uh, OpenStack, etc. Thanks to the Terraform providers maintained by the community. And yeah, Terraform Cloud, we have their, uh, uh, their own uh, software uh, automation and you know, you can get it from Terraform Cloud this automation and collaboration uh, features to empower individuals and small teams, including VCS integration, remote operations, and state management. You can also create multiple teams and ensure that team members have the right level of access to the uh, appropriate configurations and leverage the Sentinel policy as code framework for enforcing fine grain policy against everything that Terraform Cloud provisions. You can also view cost estimation so you can preview how much configurations will cost uh, before they are deployed. Here's a sample file of uh, Terraform. Um, I name it foo.df. It, um, it's like uh, say YAML but different um braces are only uh, written once you know, per block and then yeah this is variables like a, a parameter a value you can you can pass and then resource for example this one Google Compute Network and you have fields here boolean string you know, or uh, integer and yeah after defining this actually you can also write conditional expressions here for example uh, if var a is an empty string then the result is default a but otherwise it is the actual value of var a another one in here function calls for example uh, the min function takes 
any amount of number arguments and returns uh, the one that is numerically smallest. And another example here, for expressions, um, if var list is a list of objects that all have an attribute ID, then a list of the IDs could be uh, produced with this expression. And here are the um, common commands, uh, yeah, Terraform commands. You have Terraform in it that will uh, download the plugins that you need for a provider. And then Terraform validate, you know, it's grayed out because, uh, yeah, you can, you can run it or not. Um, it will just validate you know, your, your code inside the file. Uh, what's, uh, this, this Terraform plan is more important here. Well, it's like a dry run. It shows you what's going to happen in, in your own uh, uh, cloud service account. Like, will it create um, new resources or update it or delete them and delete some. And you have here also, by the way, that's a best practice always uh, our run Terraform plan for applying, you know, and then Terraform apply. Uh, there's also a Terraform apply a uh, flag that you can use auto approve because uh, if you uh, don't put auto approve, it will ask you or prompt you if you're sure of these changes, and like that. Um, so, and there's also a Terraform destroy which um, destroys all the resources you created. And yeah, it by the way. Uh, you can it can also uh, delete resources through just by deleting uh, the code of a resource in your your file, and then Terraform plan again, and then uh, it will tell you if you know these resources will be deleted from say an existing uh, resources. Okay. Demo time some demo here so uh, okay let's try this um, local or Azure so here's a sample of Azure code we have service plan here resource uh, no I think this uh, there's a better way show you this is just a basic one and I'll just delete this this is from you know a previous uh, testing that I did here normally it's just like that it's the original uh, uh, status of that and then let's run this terraform in it uh, no. let's go to that directory first local Terraform in it. Checking for available provider plugins. <laughs> That's fast. Here's the binary. And then Terraform uh, plan. Let's see. Let's move this here. So, See, okay, while waiting for that, oh, yeah, here we are. So, as you can see, here there are green cross here icons, meaning they'll be added. And the plan is five resources will be added, there'll be no changes, and there'll be uh, nothing to destroy here. Nothing gets destroyed, and yeah, after this. Can now run uh, Terraform apply then of course gonna ask me yes 
Terraform will perform the actions described above. Only yes will be accepted to approve. Yes. Now, while waiting for that, let's uh, check this out first. What's inside of this main.tf Terraform file? So we have the requ uh, required version here, Terraform. Uh, this, you know, 0 0.12 uh, version or above. And the provider, but uh, which provider? Here is Azure. Hmm. And these are required here, by the way. Features. Uh, resource group, so this is what we're you know building here. And there's an alias dev. You can you know you can write anything you want here. And it requires uh, name field, location, here's service plan. Uh, and there's uh, the, the another dev um, alias and the uh, service plan needs name location resource group name so this is how you write it just to get the, the value of this so resource you can see resource uh, group this is dot dev then dot name basically you're also uh, reading this here hmm. then sq standard s1 what about the app service dev uh, we have name here location resource group name app service plan id site config .NET framework version app settings yeah some secret Connection string um, for SQL Server. These are the fields. So this is not advisable. You should put this in environment variable. Hmm. There are three ways to do that. Uh, you'll find that later. So SQL database here. With some fields and tags, environment production, right? And then the Terraform state file. See, here. oh, it's being uh, uh, used by Terraform apply that we just run. Just leave it there for now so yeah it's not that hard but let's go to an, uh, uh, another example here well um, there are outputs here you can see outputs file it actually just helps you uh, see for example you want to um, get a value or the name say the main name or what's the URL so just a helper in your uh, command line For example here if you want to know the SQL server name it will be uh, shown here and then the value of it so that's uh, what outputs are for uh, providers here subscription client ID client secret the variables well actually you can write your variables here and outputs and you can also put it in a separate uh, files like so and then you also have versions here you can separate it you can see here we didn't do that so this is just one single file with all the uh, things that you can do first this one is we separate the, uh, the outputs variables providers and version uh, put in their own uh, own file okay I think uh, we're done here apply complete resources 5 uh, added 0 change 0 destroyed and we can take a look in the terraform tf state file um, here it is 
so you have to keep it uh, this one and put it in a, a safe place so this is the history of your resources and you don't you don't you know you don't want to to edit that you know, just don't touch it now let's go to my Zur account and see if um, the resources do exist there. Mm -hmm. mm. Let's refresh. There you go. Local, Terraform, Demo, RG. I think I can move this up here. And here's the app service plan, the app service, SQL server, and the SQL database. So it's very simple. Now next is, let's try Google Cloud. CD Google Cloud, oh, GCP. Also, okay. I'll try to delete this also. So, Terraform in it. Let's clear this up first. Terraform in it. See no Terraform here. Downloading plugin. Again. For provider Google. Now here it is binary then uh, next is for validate let's see the code is um, configuration is valid how does it look like uh, so here it is so we uh, stated provider is Google and for the credential uh, it's saving this um, File service account.json that's being referred here. Then needs a project field, region, zone. We're using variable here. Let me show it to you. Variables. So these are the values. So this default. And you have this optional description. So this is just a uh, compute instance and firewall instance group health checks here compute backend service security policy uh, open for what your rule target HTTP proxy URL map yeah. And here's an output that uh, you don't, you know, you, no need for putting in a separate file, it's just one line here. So, yeah, there's an IP. Let's see that later. Let's try to run that Terraform. Did I? Oh, Terraform, not yet. Plan. No. So here it is, and it says eleven to add, zero to change, zero to destroy. Okay. So before we uh, add this, let's. Huh. Let's delete the other one first, the Azure resources is created, see the local 
and then terraform destroy terraform 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 Form, yeah, destroy uh, auto proof. Yeah, that's it. And the other one, just terraform, um, apply, then auto proof. It's just, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Top proof. Okay, this will take probably five minutes so we have to move to um, our next slide I guess or maybe we can check out this one for the AWS yeah so for the AWS here it is um, we have provider here again we're stating um, AWS be the provider and region us is to now this is sample of uh commenting here i have to use this pound sign or sharp sign and here um, we're going to create uh, configuration launch configuration which is just t3 micro ami uh, image this unique serial number and then with the security group oh, there we go I think we're done here uh, hmm. Let's check this out. so yeah this is the remember the output that I told you what it does it shows you something here um, sample this one this is GCP, so you want to know the IP, the Google Compute Global for Roger World, the port IP address, so here it is. It's just for the developers. Okay, we're able also to delete the resource as a resource. Uh, let's check that out. Okay, you refresh this, it's begun, right? And what about the Google uh, Cloud? Okay, refresh and refresh this, refresh, just refresh. And here it is. And Yep, this is the resource we created. From GCE. That's right. Yep. You can delete it here. You can also delete it through uh, Terraform. Okay. So next is would be AWS mm -hmm. here. Let's try that. Mm -hmm. I think it here. Then uh, CD AWS Terraform in it then terraform plan I don't think we still have enough time for this AWS as you can see there it is 
then 5 to add, 0 to change, 0 to destroy and I can move to uh, next slide so basically that's it now uh, you can deploy to uh, Azure you can create resources you can also create resources in Google Cloud and AWS so Terraform state uh, again it's JSON format do not touch it do not try to edit it so resources mappings and metadata and you can save it uh, locally on your machine or save it uh, remotely in AWS Azure and our Terraform cloud um, and also in Terraform workspaces so this is Terraform included in a CI/CD pipeline and here's a build process after uh, checking out your code pushing your code creates an ASP package here zip and the release definition you know, creates a storage account in AWS a separate uh, you know, resource group save it save the key and then yeah it's provision the, the for example here app service and then storing the terraform state here and eventually here comes the asp.net package zip deployment and now you have this application so you can uh, include yeah again you can include the terraform file in a monorepo or you can put it in a separate uh, git repository yeah depends you know it's it's uh, it's just self preference well maybe if the project is um, a, just a small project you can put it in a, a same uh, repository but if it's a large project I think it's a better to you know put the uh, terraform file in a separate repository So, uh, yeah, you can save it in a, a storage account inside a container. So this is uh, actually in, in Azure and for AWS, um, S3 bucket and for the Google Cloud, that would be Google Storage or the GCS. And then more time. Yeah, I think I have to show you that uh, CICD pipeline and the release pipeline in Azure. So here it is. So why? Okay, let me st uh, step back here. Ooh, I forgot to ask you why do you have to put it in a separate a uh, resource group, the storage? So you know, not be able to accidentally delete the the. Terraform state. You know, for example, if you run Terraform a destroy accidentally, uh, of course you will not be able to recover it. It's lost. So it's a good uh, practice to put in a separate uh, entity. And here's the release pipeline. Um, first task to use this Azure CLI to deploy our required Azure resources and that would be the uh, for the storage as you can see here it's a resource group a location and then uh, with the container account name here then after that running a PowerShell script here so basically this thing here uh, gets the Azure Arm storage account key you know so that uh, you can save the Terraform state file in this um, Azure storage here and here's the Terraform here installation then running the Terraform init 
from plan then terraform approve and as you can see here, here this is auto set the, uh, to auto approve here's a flag here we're using so to uh, you know not interrupt the, the, the process here then finally the service deploy so let's uh, differentiate terraform from the other tools out there and uh, like other uh, provisionary tool or configuration management so anyway uh, here's chef first of all chef is a configuration management tool versus the provisioning tool that terraform is chef is concerned with the installation and management of software on existing servers while terraform provisions the servers themselves in this case when you when using docker or packer terraform is a better choice than a configuration management tool but it's more uh, uh, chef defaults to um, mutable infrastructure paradigm leading to uh, hard to diagnose configuration bugs but terraform uh, treats every change as a deployment of a new service configuration chef also represents a procedural style to code everything and requires running a master server for state storing as well as agent software on each configurable server so what about puppet you know similarly to chef Puppet is also a configuration management tool used to install and manage software on already existing servers. It also requires a master server for storing the infrastructure state as well as the uh, installation of an agent software for installing the latest configuration management updates. Puppet is also four years old than Chef. Um, it was released in 2005. However, Puppet has a more declarative style, just like Terraform. And here's a salt stack. You know, although salt stack is again a configuration management tool, it has a more declarative style, like Terraform. And then, uh, yeah, like Ansible, Chef, and Puppet, it is mutable infrastructure paradigm. It requires the installation of agent software and uh, to run as a master server. Lately, SaltStack has been gaining an increase in developers' interest. There's even an annual uh, SaltStack user conference. Uh, so here's Ansible. Like Chef represents a procedural style of coding. Uh, yeah, so it's a configuration management tool. And follows a mutable infrastructure paradigm. Here's Ansible here. You can see, and this is uh, how would you use it along with Terraform. So you use Terraform to deploy all the underlying infrastructure, including the network topology. That would mean uh, VPCs subnets um, route the root tables then data stores like mysql redis and you have load balancers and servers you then use ansible to deploy your apps on top of those so servers here's a, a quick diagram of that uh, we have Terraform here, and then Ansible. So let's go to Packer. Uh, Packer automates the creation of any type of machine image. It embraces modern configuration management by encouraging you to use automated scripts to install and configure the software uh, within your Packer-made images. Packer is an say, uh, automated build system to manage the creation of images 
for containers and virtual machines. Docker, on the other hand, is a system for building, distrib uh, distributing, and running uh, Docker containers. Containers can be run on Linux and Windows. So basically, it does to differentiate Docker uh, from uh, Docker. So here's uh, Terraform and Packer. You use Packer to package your apps as virtual machine images. You then use Terraform to deploy servers with these virtual machine images. And then uh, the rest of your infrastructure, including the network topology, then data stores, and then load balancers. I'll give you an example of that. Here's a Packer, Ansible, and then Terraform. Packer uh, sends this Packer image built to create a VM. And then the Ansible install middleware and application. And then the Terraform provision uh, load balancer you know, VM scale sets using management this image. That's an example of that. So here, both uh, Kubernetes and Terraform can help you with orchestration and scalability. Kubernetes deals with Docker containers. So if your application isn't yet containerized, it will require some preliminary work. Terraform operates on what can be seen as hardware. So it's suited for any kind of workload. Hmm. So. Uh, here's a table of Kubernetes and HashiCorp stack. Here's Kubernetes and packaging. This is Docker uh, deployment and provisioning. This is Helm here. Here's Terraform and then it Packer. Then here's uh, Terraform, Packer, and Docker. Uh, Terraform, Packer, Docker, and Kubernetes. You use Packer to create a virtual machine image that has Docker and Kubernetes installed. You then use Terraform to deploy a cluster of servers, each of which runs this virtual machine image and the rest of your infrastructure, including the network topology, data stores, and load balancers. Uh, finally, when the cluster of servers boots up, it forms a Kubernetes cluster that you use to run and manage your Dockerized applications. And here's uh, Pulumi, um, pretty much the same as Terraform. The only different is that Pulumi uses JavaScript, TypeScript, Go, Python, and C Sharp. They both, they both do the same thing. Okay, so. Yeah, this is just a sample of, you know, uh, package managers, JavaScript, TypeScript, Rumi, and Azure. Uh, yeah, the, this, uh, this is a, a provider of links. Yeah. So let's move to CloudFormation. So it is also a provisioning tool. Uh, however, uh, CloudFormation is non-open uh, source. It's like Terraform. Uh, Terraform is open source. This is non-open source. Uh, the tool belongs to AWS services, which means it can only be used within AWS scope. And we have here Azure Resource Manager of Azure. Um, same as Terraform, but can only be used in uh, Azure uh, resources. Yeah. And then uh, Cloud Deployment Manager, Flugel Cloud, uh, yeah, yeah. non-open source as well. Uh, it uses uh, Jinja of Python. Jinja is a modern and designer-friendly templating language for Python, modeled after Django's templates. So we're almost done here. Summary, IAC consistent uh, gives you these things here. Consistent configurations, improved scalability, faster deployments, uh, less documentation because the scripts <laughs> replace it already, right? That is so good. 
um, better traceability. And the term from here, you have one tool and one language for describing infrastructure for uh, Google Cloud, AWS, OpenStack, and any other cloud. Uh, switching a provider is not a headache anymore. You can have Amazon instances running Kubernetes containers with your workloads and manage the whole system from one tool. Uh, you can go here to learn more about Terraform, terraform.io. And here's a link to uh, Terraform Associate Certification. If you want to add formal industry accepted credentials, digital badge upon passing a certification exam. And yeah, here's a Terraform book. Uh, you learn here a lot of stuff uh, like how to create reusable infrastructure with Terraform modules, uh, some Terraform tips and tricks, like you know, in, in let's say loops, if statements, and pitfalls in Terraform. And how to use Terraform as a team, which is uh, really important also. So, uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Please uh, follow me here, my Twitter. Um, yeah, that's all. And I'm out. Cool. Yeah, what a great talk. Devlin, hello. Thank you very much for the talk. I'm um, very excited that uh, you opened our fourth day of the We Developers Life Week. I Thank you as well, yeah, <laughs> for this opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you had fun with the topic. Um, I saw that our participants did and uh, questions are coming in or were coming in also throughout your talk and keep coming in. So for everybody who hasn't submitted their question or opinion or feedback, please uh, go on Slido with the code LIFE2020 and you can uh, actually submit your questions. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now so you can see the questions together with me mm -hmm. and um, we can uh, go ahead and, and answer them. So I'm going to mark them and we uh, so everybody knows what actually we're answering. So the first couple of comments are actually since uh, from, from the opening, but then we're going to go to Philip. What's the difference to Anzibo? Uh, yeah, I think I answered that in my presentation, but to uh, just a, a bit recap, Ansible, it install, so to make it short, it install uh, software like, for example, runtime or database in a VM or server. So that's what it, it does. Whereas the, the Terraform, it, it provides you all the, the servers that you need. Mm -hmm. It's like a configuration of the servers. Okay, it looks very similar to Anzivo. It's our next comment. And then Philip, who asked the question about what's the difference, uh, has also written a nice explanation to Anzivo. LOL. So I guess he got his <laughs> explanation. Yeah. Uh, then we're going to look to this longer question. What is your opinion in, ter in terms of security concerning using cloud services like the ones you mentioned? Companies usually don't use this because it seems unsecure. Oh, yeah, that this time around, uh, it's, I don't think so. It's, it's, it's more secure, most of the time it's more secure than your typical uh, odd companies, you know, that has this uh, infrastructure in their on the premises because most of the, the cloud services provider, they have advanced firewalls, you have intrusion uh, detection, uh, event logging, uh, internal firewall, firewalls, encryption, physical security. You know they have also uh, uh, they also hired the best, usually the best uh, security engineers. So yeah, you know it, it's this is uh, it's been a um, question for a while of, of um, owners, business owners. If, Cloud services are, are secured. Yeah, yeah. My answer is like, you know, they're they're more advanced than uh, typical of business uh, infrastructure. So yeah, they, they're one hundred percent more more secure than than everyone else. 
and uh, maybe a an, uh, follow-up questions from my side. Why do you think, uh, in your opinion, why do you think company actually think that those are insecure? Maybe lack of of uh, knowledge of you know uh, the, the the latest technology and what is what those cloud services companies really do you know internally and 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 their uh, uh, their struct infrastructure yeah and the uh, policies and everything you know you just we just need to to educate them and tell them that this, these are the the things that you know uh, cloud services um, do every day and their um and that is how they work this is their business model mm -hmm. okay yeah thank you a... then we have a couple of comments yay live coding and heart so people really enjoyed your <laughs> what you showed uh, big thank you for the part with the differences to puppet chef salt stack and Anzibo and such Wow. Welcome. <laughs> uh, then we have another question. What is your preferred stack in combination with Terraform? Uh, Kubernetes <laughs> and Terraform. Yeah, we, that's and it. It's really that, that's what you'll, you'll see in, in uh, enterprise infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You have and Terraform for, yeah, for automation of provisioning of the resources and then you know, Kubernetes. Yeah. I actually want to ask why Kubernetes, but also this question came up right in that moment. Why Kubernetes? It's, it's it became a, a de facto in, uh, in you're talking about scalability in, in your resources, your infrastructure. So when you say uh, how you can scale this, uh, Kubernetes, you know, uh, it's been but it's been a battle tested by large companies and it's been used uh, google has been using uh, kubernetes i think more than more than 15 years 10 years yeah and it's everyone you can you can you can learn kubernetes there's a lot of our resources out there for free you can start it uh, you know on your own and um what else companies are hiring um sys absolute who knows kubernetes so yeah, so th those are just just the minor thing, but yeah, it's really uh, mm -hmm. Terraform for automating your uh, provisioning, and then Kubernetes for scaling the, the VMs and whatnot database. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so it's to sum it up, it's actually also quite easy if you don't know Kubernetes to to start with it. Um, <laughs> ah, and here is another related question to my follow up question. Which uh, resources would you recommend to start with? Resources. Uh, you can go to uh, Terraform uh, website itself. And you can also, uh, yeah, to, to learn Terraform, you can also learn uh, the, the top three uh, cloud service providers there, like Azure, AWS, and, and uh, GCP or Google Cloud. You can also learn uh, Kubernetes, the basic Kubernetes in Terraform.io. Okay, so we can basically actually... it's a yeah, well, one stop shop. Okay, so um, we can actually, I saw uh, Devin that you're already in our Slack channel, so we can also go ahead uh, after the talk and post this there. Uh, so everybody mm -hmm. has the. Uh, has yeah, that. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will share the, the slides and the, the link that I'm, uh, I was telling you where you mm -hmm. can learn the, the, the Kubernetes and the Terraform. Perfect. Yes. Uh, also, the the uh, the next question is: Could you share the slides? And yes, yeah. in, in the Slack channel, uh, mm -hmm. you can do that. We, yeah, I will uh, upload it there. <laughs> uh, we should also have our Slack channel by now uh, on our web page, uh, so you can go and find it there as well. Good. I'm just gonna wait a couple of more seconds to see if there are any coming questions questions coming in because uh, it does happen that when I want to wrap it up, people do send questions. And I'll just remind you that in a couple of seconds there will be also a poll coming up, which is a short feedback survey for uh, this presentation for Devlin's talk, because uh, it's so important for all of us or for both sides to to know how you liked it, how you like the topic. 
um, if you would like to see something more like this or in what direction uh, we should uh, go as well for Devlin as a presenter. So make sure you rate the talk and also give your opinion on, uh, on, on the details personally to Devlin or to us as the organizers. So there are some more comment, comments coming in. Thanks for the talk. Thanks, thanks. Uh, so everybody really enjoyed it. And I think it was a great opening talk for our day four of the We Are Developers Life Week. In case some more questions come in, we'll make sure we forward them to Devlin so they get answered. And um, yeah, if there is nothing more coming in currently, uh, we should uh, see, you should also have access now to the poll. Uh, there was a question, how can people reach you, Devlin? Uh, Twitter, you can send me a direct message uh, to Twitter. I'm always okay. open, I always uh, reply. <laughs> yeah, and as I said, Devlin is also in the Slack channel, so if you want to reach him today, he'll be sharing the stuff there, but Twitter, he's online there always. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 I forgot that, that's Slack, yeah. That's okay, just, just wait for my slides. And then yeah. the links. Exactly. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the feedback is there. I see people participating on Reddit. So that's awesome. And with this being said, I do want to thank you for, for your participation today. And um, for everybody else, we will be back at 12.15 with our next talk with our dear friend, Bjorn Wendland. So stay tuned.
Hello everybody, it's me again for our second session of the fourth day of the Weird Developers Life Week. I'm really excited for our next speaker because he has been present at our events for the past one year and we always have so much fun working with him and also at the event and everybody who has listened to his talks always leaves the room with a happy feeling and very, very energized. So I just want to remind you to use Slido. You can do this in a couple of ways. Either go directly to slido.com because Bjorn is a really interested speaker. Put the code 20, um, LIFE2020 and then you can participate in the session. Uh, he's very engaging and I'm sure you have comments. I'm sure you have questions with a really interesting topic. I'm very happy to present you right now, Bjorn Venland. He's a passionate full-stack developer, clean code evangelist, and he has work, uh, he's working in the past one year at Metronome, and he managed to establish their Kotlin as the programming, programming language. So he is also now a Kotlin ambassador uh, in, his, uh, in his company, as he likes to say. Yeah, let's welcome Bjorn, give him a warm welcome of virtual applauses. Hi, Bjorn, how are you? So happy to welcome you on our virtual stage this time. I'm happy to be here. Nice. Uh, I hope you're ready because our audience for sure is. They're already on Slido, uh, ready to in give your input, give your feedback, come give your comments and also ask you questions. I told them already that we'll be looking at it at the end. Uh, so the stage is yours. I'm going to mute myself, turn off my video, and you can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you. So, where do you see yourself in five years? This is a question that basically uh, followed me around my whole career by now. And it started all when I, when I have been in my first years of master studies. Um, one of the first lessons was in general software engineering. And our professor, a tall and quite, author, author, quite an authority in his field, asked us this quite broad question. And this is actually him, Thomas Siebmann. Um, we were all quite new to this. Um, we did our, basically, our basic computer science studies. We knew programming. But we never really been into this, where do we see yourself in five years in your career? So we started thinking and for me, the answer was in five years, I want to be leading my own development team. And I got scolded for it. He was quite harsh with us and said like, you're studying, you're doing your master's degree. You have to have ambition. So think harder, where do you see yourself in five years? And Many things continue to follow me after this, but this question stuck with me quite strong. And it's a question that I keep reiterating all the time in my professional career, but also in my private life. And it was a wake up call to actually discover my own ambition, to discover your ambition. And today, I would like to share my journey and also what I learned from it, how to discover my ambition and what I see as very important to do so. And as I said, it all started around university and continued in my early career. The first thing was still with this question in my mind was basically, okay, I need to learn. I need to build up experience. Experience is one of the three most important things that you need to build up for your ambition. So when I started, I started as a regular engineer. I learned the technologies. I learned working with a team. We've worked with teams in university, but that was like friends. We were sitting together, working on common problems 
and trying to solve them. But all of a sudden, I was thrown into a work environment. And I'm sure that most of you know this. Um, starting your first job is hard. Like there's so much you don't know and you completely get lost into this whole flood of information. And even if you have an ambition already, if you already discovered this, this is something you completely forget about and it's normal and it's fine. First of all, it's important to see, okay, where am I? How can I gather from this? How can I find information? How can I learn? So the first project I worked on, I basically was only concerned with doing little bug fixes, getting support, learning how technology works. Doing this, I continued to grow in my role. And you will see the same experience for yourself. The more you learn, the more experience you gather, the more peers you will have, the more people you will have asking you for it, questions, um, asking your support. So these are the first small opportunities that you can seize. So you need, um, with this experience, you will get opportunities and you will need to seize these opportunities. These are small steps, you might not even notice them. So from being an engineer to being a tech lead, for me, I didn't even recognize making this step because while I jumped from one project to the other over time, I also picked up more responsibility. If you think back, what was your first job? It's probably a programming job um, where you basically ask for your tasks, tasks were given to you, um, you fulfilled them. And after some time, you pick tasks yourself and you started to fulfilling them yourself. Um, for me, it grew from being the one who implemented the task to being the person who also started coordinating tasks. So working in a team, but also knowing the strengths and weaknesses of my peers. I had a good colleague at that time from uh, Croatia that at the very beginning, I would always ask for help because he really understood the way I asked questions, which was very important to build my experience, asking questions, um, trying to figure out where I see problems and how can I use technology better. But over time, this relationship changed. So I would no longer ask him, hey, how do I do this? But I would go ahead and ask him, hey, I have this idea of doing this. So how would you do this? And this grew myself into a role of actually defining problems um, and sharing them with others. And at that, some point, getting to know people as well as saying like, hey, I have this problem and I know you can solve it. So to start distributing problems. Um, at that time, I transitioned to taking up the responsibility as a tech lead for a minor project. And from learning something, I discovered, hey, like it's really a lot of fun to also distribute this, to know the strengths and weaknesses of my team and share this. And this is the next big step to take, to refine your ambition. So at the first point, I said, okay, I want to lead my own team. And now I'm roughly two years into my professional career and I take responsibility. I'm not having my own team. I'm still the same. I'm, I'm tech lead at this uh, point, but it's a minor project. So basically being the tech lead was working with one other person on a support project. Um, but I started to pick up responsibility. I started to see this is what's fun to me. And I thought, how can I grow this? Um, but it's important to know when you're working in projects, you cannot always change at the point you want. So I was a little bit stuck because this project continued uh, for another year without big chances to grow, which is completely fine. So 
you hear a lot like you need to achieve um, what you would like to achieve in your career by a certain time, like after 10 years, for instance. So you might feel pressure. And this is also the time where I started to feel pressure. But I did not have any chance to move anywhere. And looking back, this is quite fine. Um, I was at the very beginning of my career, I felt pressured uh, for no reason. Now, years later, I see that, yeah, it actually threw me back um, because it put me under a lot of pressure that I could not mitigate. I could not um, relate to other people. Um, I've always been looking out for opportunities for new projects where I can be the tech lead of a big team. But this is something you might not always see. So I refine my ambition at that point to be, OK, I'm in this project, and I want to create for myself full knowledge of all different areas of this project. Um, I'm not stuck, but I can refine my knowledge in this certain area. And I want to be the one person that if somebody needs help about this or needs information, they can come to. Um, and after some time, uh, this really helped me a lot um, because I knew the technology really well. And um, people started to approach me. Hey, we have this project and we have new people and we need to train them. Would you like to do a training? And yeah, it opened up new opportunities. I never thought about, hey, do you want to be a trainer or anything? At that point, I just thought, hey, yeah, sure. I know it. I know the technology. So why not just teach this to others? I was interested in learning myself. Maybe I can share this. So by growing your ambition, it's very important to not only focus on your immediate goal leading a team, um, but also to see which opportunities does your career, does life give you? And does this sound interesting to you? Does this fit you on a personal level? If somebody would have asked me, hey, we have this the sales project um, that you could take a part in, I might not have been very interested in um, because it's a very different area, even though it might have given me more responsibility. Um, but this training part this struck me and I continued to do this. At some point, I was asked, hey, um, I have this all like it was from um, the CEO of our company. He said, I have this old friend. He's working in Dubai and he's training engineers for other companies. But currently he's short on people. So he doesn't have anyone to train. And he reached out to me because we're still in contact. And I thought, maybe this is something where you could come in. So he asked me, hey, Bjorn, do you want to go to Dubai to do a training? And I was very hesitant because I'm, I'm from, from the Düsseldorf area. And I, I'm born here. I never went really far. Um, and this seemed very frightening to me. And in this time, it was very important for me that my family and also my girlfriend supported me and said like, hey, this is a great opportunity. You have to take it, um, which I did. And I learned a lot about working with different people in different culture and grew a lot in terms of working independently because over this time, being away from home, being away from my peers, put me into the challenge of having to organize all of this on my own. And this is something that I didn't identify at that point in time, um, which is really important and something to look out for, to identify how can things that do not contribute to your goal immediately help you towards this goal. Nowadays, I need to be responsible for other people. I need to organize myself. And organizing myself is a key aspect of being a leader in your team. 
you cannot help people to achieve their role, to achieve their goals without being able to organize yourself. So be on the lookout for opportunities that might seem not focused towards your goal, but contribute to skills and responsibilities you might have to take up to reach your goal. So a long time after that, um, there was not, nothing out of the ordinary. I continued my work and I continued to grow in these areas. I continued to grow my technology skills and I continued as a trainer to work with people, to share the knowledge. I was really happy with that. And at some point I really forgot about the initial uh, answer to the question, where do you see yourself in five years? I did forget about, I want to have my own team. At that point, I just focused on training my, my experience and sharing my experience because I really enjoyed that. And having an ambition, having a goal, doesn't always mean you have to pursue it. This is very important. Um, to be happy with the point where you are is great. Um, and don't feel pressured to always follow an ambition, but also to calm down, to resent on what you're currently doing, that you're enjoying, and focus on what you're enjoying. Because there will come a time when you feel like, hey, I'm, I've been doing this for quite some time. And looking back at myself, if I would tell my 10-year-old self now, I'm sitting here as, as a developer, sometimes training people, but I had this great ambition to be a team leader at some point. My 10-year-old self would tell me, oh, you didn't achieve anything. This moment will come back. And be on lookout that opportunities will provide this. Sometimes this happens quite naturally. Because I started defining my own personal and also professional goals. And this mixture is very important. So I refocused on my professional goal to grow into a team leader role, um, which led me to change companies. And with companies, I also got to learn a lot of new people. I joined a new team. And this has been the first team where I felt like this is a team where I actually don't, I am not in the position to teach anything. At my previous company, I was the one responsible for the project, teaching the others. Now I joined a new team. I took a step back, actually. I took a step back to just being a developer. Um, but I learned so much because I joined a team where I was the trainee again, um, which just accelerated the growth in the end. Um, because a little time later, like I joined the team in, uh, in June and uh, starting off fall, uh, beginning of winter, um, so um, October, November time, I got approached by my manager um, and he asked like, hey, we're planning to move the domain your team's in. We're planning to move the whole customer domain to our location in Berlin. Would you be interested in helping to transition your team to move over to Berlin and to train a new team? And I said like, hey, this is, this is where I want to go. I want to build up a team. I want to train a team. And at the same point, I thought like, if I start commuting to Berlin now or move to Berlin at all, what does this mean for my private life? What does this mean for um, having a relationship, um, being with my family, um, being at home with my friends? And this was a really tough decision because at the one hand, career-wise, this would really elevate it. But on the personal side, I would have to take, to, to put back, um, to see my friends less, um, to basically not be able to maintain a relationship, um, to see my family less. 
Um, but I knew this was just limited time. So this was a project for half a year. And I decided to take the project. Really important for you to see where do I want to go? Which are steps to take? But what's also the impact on my professional life and my private life? And which do I value more? Because it might also be your decision, like a friend of mine, Vladimir, he said, um, I joined the payments team in Dusseldorf and I really enjoyed it. But for private reasons, I want to stay with my wife. I want to stay here in Dusseldorf. I decided to move to Dusseldorf. I'm not going to take this. So these are two very different decisions. And I think he made the right decision for himself because he was very happy during the time um, I've been going to Berlin here in Düsseldorf. And for myself, I also made a very different decision. And I think this was very helpful to me. So it's all about the environment. I was given an opportunity here at Metronome to move, to grow myself, but to also come back. After this half year, I learned a lot. I consulted a lot with people. I learned a lot about the different locations, what it means to be responsible for a team and to be switching between contexts, moving back and forth from Berlin to Dusseldorf, talking to the people in different locations and learning from them, learning about their problems, learning about what they're good at. And this is something that I consider to be very valuable when following your own ambition. How can you grow it in terms of also having the right environment to foster it. So you might be really at the peak of, of what you wanted to achieve. Like you want to be a technological leader and you've been working in an area for 10 years now. You're the one that everybody is talking to, but you might feel like this is quite not doing it. And that's the point where you might want to look out for your environment. Are you in the right environment? Can you help to grow in other people in your environment or is it keeping you back? When I left Berlin, I came back to Dusseldorf. I came back to Dusseldorf as a developer and I rejoined the team that my friend Vladimir moved to, which was a lot of fun in the very beginning. But after a short time, I felt like I'm missing the part of helping people to achieve their goals that I had while I've been traveling to Berlin, building the new team. And when I came back, uh, the new team, the API team was struggling with our uh, product owner because he was also responsible as domain owner for a lot of other teams. So he was very little available to us. So, and this is again, where we get back to the opportunity point. Um, he approached me and said like, hey, you've been to Berlin. I know you're interested into helping to grow a team, uh, also to move around. And you're not, really, you're not focused on just being the te technological leader, but you also strongly focus on growing your team. So do you want to take up this position? And this would not have happened if I wouldn't have voiced the idea that um, developing is is something that I really like, I enjoy. I enjoy technology and I could not imagine myself working without technology, without using the skills that I acquired during the past years. But I'm also very interested in working with people. And I feel this is even more rewarding for me to work with people than to just work with technology. And this is something to identify also for you. Like what are the things you're good at what are the things you like? What are the things you feel rewarding? And voice them. Voice them in an environment where there's room for change, where you feel your voice is heard. If you sit in your office every day, being the best at programming, but you really like to use new technologies, but you don't tell anyone, you probably won't get the opportunity to use them. But at the point where you uh, raise this voice 
And you can do this in very different ways. You can just share your knowledge with your colleagues in small shareback sessions, um, maybe doing something like lightning talks over lunch, doing so-called brown bag sessions where you discuss technical topics also over lunch, or being a speaker at a conference. You can share these ambitions, share these ideas that might create opportunities for you to grow in your environment, or maybe just change the environment to get these opportunities. See like, hey, I'm, technolo I'm a technological leader, but I have nobody around myself to, to really spread this. So it might be a good idea to maybe change teams, change locations, change companies even. Um, I'm not, not saying you should change your company if you don't want to, but uh, sometimes this is a good thing to be on the lookout. And the most important thing, and I'm currently being a product owner, uh, I'm learning a lot of new stuff. I feel like I know very little about my role at this point because I, yeah, I just took it up half a year ago. So I'm back at the learning phase. I'm reiterating uh, from the very beginning. Um, but the one thing that was the most important through of all this time is to actually do the things that I'm passionate about and that I love. And I never really did something where somebody said, hey, you should go there. And I just said, yes, I want to go there because you said I should. But it was something where I felt this is something I really want to do. I really feel like this would be a great opportunity. This would be a lot of fun. Going to Dubai was a hard decision for me because it was far, far away. But on the other hand, I really wanted to see this very different people, these, to meet the whole team of people that was newly joined together and teach them about what I know, what I do, um, and what I love. The same with going to Berlin. Um, it was all about getting to know new people. I was really looking forward to meet these people, to be there, um, to go with the people of my team who also decided to do this and to take up this new challenge. So if I ask you, where do you see yourself in five years? Reflect on what do I really love? How do I want to grow this? And not only what might be the expectation of ambition and growth. Don't say, hey, five years, I want to step up in the corporate ladder. But say like, in five years, I really want to follow this ambition. I want to identify, like, I really love technology, for instance. And I really want to be the person that knows all about this technology. And I want to share this with my peers. So do this. Start digging into your passion and grow your passion. And as a last thing, I would like to ask you, where do you see yourself in five years? And I would be happy if you share this with me and everybody else. Nice. Thank you, Bjorn. What an insightful talk to actually how life can turn out and what we can do and what but so many paths actually to follow and opportunities come all the like all the way uh, in our careers and personal lives. Uh, people are commenting, people are uh, submitting their questions already on Slido. Cool. So I think now is the time also to encourage them to maybe even share some answers uh, of your final questions. Where do you see yourself mm -hmm. in, uh, in five years? Not only asking uh, questions, but you can also right now in Slido um, tell us if you want to share where do you see yourself in five years while we take the first questions. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go uh, ahead and share my screen. Mm -hmm. So you can see also the questions. Cool. As you see, 11 questions are already in and we uh, have more pouring in. Um, well, let's start with the first one, which is uh, more of a comment. I made the experience that the rule at age X, you have to be Y, is not working any longer. For me, it's now get better at what you know and do new stuff. 
Yes, I would completely agree with that. Um, so the question, where would you be in, where do you see yourself in five years was something that triggered me, but I would agree with Mike that it transformed into um, what are the things that you're good at, you like, and how can you add to it? Yeah, I, I agree as well. That's my philosophy currently in life as well. Good, uh, anonymous person is asking us, uh, asking you, how would you value the role of curiosity in your career? Um, I personally value it quite high. Um, being curious about things is in my personal nature. Um, if somebody is, is telling me a story, I'm also the one always asking more questions, um, asking silly questions even, um, because I'm, I'm very, a very curious person. So for me personally, that was a personal driver. Thank you. Did you feel prepared in university to actually lead your dev team? No, not at all. Um, university taught me a lot about structured thinking, approaching problems, but not leading a team. Um, because in university, we mostly work together as, um, yeah, as peers, as people on the same level and as friends. And you work very different with your friends than when you lead a team. Uh, leading a team means taking up different responsibilities, uh, means also making hard decisions, uh, but also ident like really approaching people on a different level. Um, I told you about my friend Vladimir. Vladimir has a very different way of thinking than I do. Um, he's very detail focused, while I try to be on an abstraction level, so quite the opposite. And when I discuss problems with him, it takes a lot of effort from me to get into his way of thinking, to be able to discuss problems, which I think is very important. As a leader, you need to be able to try to put yourself in the position of your peer and to support him. And this is something university did not tell, uh, taught me. Yeah, and in, in a team, you can have so many different personalities, yeah. way of thinking and uh, ways of working and even understanding the world. So I, I think only with experience you get there to prepare to lead a team. Thank you for this answer. Um, career and family should go together, don't you think? And in that world, it's hard. I think this question was submitted around the time you were talking about moving to Berlin. Yeah. Um, it, it depends. So I fully agree. Career and family should go together. I'm personally, um, I'm very close to my family. Um, and it's an important part of my life. To getting this together with your job, depending on what you do, can be really hard. Um, if you're working in one location, as I do, um, I'm based in Dusseldorf. I'm living in Dusseldorf. I'm working in Dusseldorf. It's, I don't want to say it's your average nine to five job, um, but it's closer to being your average nine to five job where you can get home to your family. Um, but also in the development world, there's a lot of consulting jobs um, where the client requires you to be on location, which puts a strong toll on your family life. Yes. Um, but this is a very personal decision. If you're up to this, um, and this is also something you have to maybe discuss with your family. How does your family see this? Um, is this a problem? Um, if you're working freelance, for instance, um, you might spend way more time on a project um, during your working time, having less time for your family. But on the other hand, um, a friend of mine who's also a product owner but working freelance, um, he has this thing where he works really hard when he's working on a project, but then between projects, he takes a month or two off mm -hmm. because he can compensate for this and spend the time with his wife during this time off. Um, so he tries to have a balance, even if it's to some degree extremes. So extreme working, extreme family life. Yeah, um, finding the balance. I think that's always the, yeah. the hard part, the yeah. hard part. But overall, there is a balance. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I see people are upvoting questions. That's great because um, we have enough time left. Uh, but if you have if you interested uh, questions, interesting questions already submitted, give your thumb up for them so we can go ahead and uh, look at them first. Our next question is, uh, and it's a kind of a comment combined. I had similar experiences, but I would like to know: Did you have had? Uh, did you have a bad experience? And what about when colleges refuse switching technologies? Don't touch if it runs. Um, yes, surely they have a bad experience, but um, I would say they, in the end, they are outweighed by the good experiences. So bad experience often has been uh, single discussions, single decisions, um, which honestly I'm not able to recall now. Mm -hmm. um, refusing to switch technologies um, can be an issue. Um, it might be an identification that, or an, um, it might be a hint that your environment might be thinking different than you. Um, for instance, if you have a team that's very open to change and you're very open to change, this will not happen. But if you have a team that's focused on stability and um, yeah, don't touch it if it runs, but you're somebody thinking, hey, how can we innovate? How can we change this? This is a conflict in your environment. And you might be looking out to how can I either get to a common understanding that we can have stability on the one side, but innovation on another side, or it might really be an indication that maybe you need to change. Yeah, so you just say, get me to look around and see also yeah. what's more important. Um, and this was one of the biggest drivers for me to switch into the, um, the product on a roll. Because I felt like going back to being a developer was too narrow in, in terms of my scope. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't um, help my team in the way that I would like to, but the role as product owner allowed me to be a support to my team again, um, which is something I was missing. So that was definitely a bad experience as, as a developer because I felt helpless towards my team. But it's, it's good that you actually then realized what was stopping you and took an action. Uh, that's for sure something to, to admire. Uh, our next question is, do you think that the developer careers will change in the next years? Um, I think the role of a developer is, is already changing quite a lot in the past years. Um, we did go from quite hierarchical structures to very flat structures. Um, the common image is we are no more that a developer is somebody sitting in the basement hidden behind a computer, but um, we also see how we present ourselves at conferences, how we um, um, how we're perceived in public, how much technology and also software is changing our everyday life. Um, and yeah, sure, this will also continue in the future, but um, we already see a huge change which will continue but i have no idea how this will continue thank you another upvoted question we have how can you find a good way through this flood of information about your field oh, th th this is a tough question <laughs> um sometimes being stubborn and ignoring information helps um or like, because if you're too open-minded and try to know everything, you will just get lost in this flood of information. Um, knowing a rough direction, uh, also relying on, on peers, knowing their part of information, you knowing your part, uh, helps a lot to split this and then consolidate on a more abstract level, at least for me. Okay. The biggest obstacle to remote work in software development is the in-place micromanagement mindset. Do you agree? Yes. Um, I, I, like micromanagement is a big problem um, because it takes away freedom uh, from your team to evolve, to try out new things. And it also puts it all on you doing the micromanagement. So if you do micromanagement, you will spend most of your time doing the micromanagement and trying to make everyone do the right thing at the right time. Um, and this also leads to being frustrated um, 
as the one being micromanaged because you have no freedom. Um, on the other hand, um, it takes a lot of trust to actually let go of, of the regular management of your team um, and trust them to do the right things. Um, so you have to find the balance between um, yeah, trying to lead and not manage um, and providing freedom for everyone to grow. And this is not an obstacle, but a really big challenge uh, in remote and also in uh, non-remote working. Yeah, I, I agree fully. And I think this is a problem seen also not only in uh, developers' teams, and this could be a problem on any yeah. kind of... This uh, translates to every aspect the, of work. Exactly. Or I, Actually, also every aspect of life. If you try to micromanage your friends, um, if you're doing like a, a game night and you try to micromanage what they do, um, it won't be fun at all. Yeah, no, that turns into, <laughs> into something else. Then. Um, our, next, <laughs> <laughs> our next question is, uh, how important are you, in your opinion, soft skills for a team leader? Very important, uh, if not the most important. Mm -hmm. Um, to be respected by your team, you also need to have uh, your hard skills. You need to know what you're talking about. Uh, but it's even more important to be able to, to work with your people, to get to know your people, to um, be able to uh, put yourself into their shoes, to understand their problems, uh, to understand their opinions, um, to understand their reason. So soft skills is the most important are the most important skills for being a team leader. And with team leader, I'm, I'm not necessarily referring to the person who sits on top of a team, like the mm -hmm. uh, tech lead, or um, you might say product owner might be in some kind of a lead role, uh, or even a manager. But you can also be a team leader from within the team, you can be the driving force, um, the one that helps push your team just as part of, of yeah, the whole team, like being just five developers. Mm -hmm. So you have a team of just five developers. One can still be the lead, even though there's no um, yeah, hierarchy in this team Official by just hierarchy. driving people, by helping people to achieve their goals. Yeah, I also believe so that you don't need to have the official title of a, of a yeah. team lead to, to help people, to drive them and to, to motivate the people that you work with. Yeah. And I think that's also something that I would say changed the most uh, from my time in university when I said I want to be a team lead and today. Mm -hmm. In university, it was really the hierarchical position. Nowadays, it's more like I want to be the person that helps to drive my team and to enable my team to do the best work. I, I'm sure you're doing so. And <laughs> uh, I, I've seen uh, you interact with your, with your team members and people from Metrodon, so I'm sure they, uh, they enjoy working with you a lot. Uh, was Kotlin a career enabler or a career driver in your opinion? Uh, I wouldn't say so, no. Um, Kotlin was a personal, it was following my passion to move at some point from Java to Kotlin. It was a new technology that I was very interested about. Um, it also provided uh, a few topics for doing talks, uh, but if it wouldn't have been Kotlin, it would have been different topics. So it was, yeah, something nice to have, and it was a passion, but it was not a career enabler or driver. Thank you. Uh, Fatima is asking, I never thought about the environment aspect, but it's really important. And sometimes the company or the project where you are can limit your growth. Um, okay, that's more as a comment as a, yeah. um, as a but I think we, we do agree on both with this. Another question from uh, Chon Chongor. I'm not sure how to read that name. Don't you think soft skills are overemphasized for simple coder coders? Uh, to be honest, I don't think that nowadays there are, there is something like a simple coder. Um, because when working, and and I especially refer to professional software development here. If you're doing it in your free time, that's something else. Um, but if you work in a professional environment you always have to be part of a team 
you're never a, a single entity working alone on something. And as soon as you're part of a team, soft skills are something that becomes very important. Um, let's think about code review, pair programming, um, exchanging knowledge. These are all topics that are part of your day-to-day -day work and where you have to work with, with other people. And you have to make sure that you convey your information in a way that the other person receives it and actually takes on on it. Mm -hmm. um, at some point in my, uh, in my past, um, we did code reviews with a colleague and I had a few annotations for him where I said like, hey, this is where, where you can improve. But I did it in a bad way. And he was really offended by it, how I um, provided this information to him. And I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you any example because this is years past now. Mm -hmm. um, but we really had some trouble communicating because of this, because I didn't think about how to convey this information in a way that it was not offensive to him. Yeah. So it's really important to, um, to have the soft skills to convey the information in a way that they are received and not in an offensive way. And um, therefore, I don't think it's overemphasized. Um, I think maybe the scale you need to have soft skills sometimes is uh, exaggerated. So you know, don't need to be the best people person, public speaker, um, most empathic person all the time, but you need to know how to convey your message. That's a really good advice and approach to this question. Um, another, uh, that's actually an answer of your, <laughs> of your question, how do you see yourself in five years? I'd like to be a society-driven developer in five years, probably humanity needs society and ecology-based goals to survive. I really like that answer. Thank you for, for sharing your, your vision. Uh, the inspiration and motivation come, come from the inside. I guess this was a comment during your talk or now during one of your answers. Um, another answer of your question. When my manager asked me where do I see myself in five years, uh, the answer is on the seat of your manager. That's ambitious. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, but uh, but um, it's good to have ambitious goals and um, you, you might refine this in the future. And uh, you might also have to think about what happens if this seat doesn't get freed? Mm. Um, sometimes it's hard to sit on your manager's lap just to sit in his chair. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> cool. And then another uh, comment, it seems to be the last one for, for now. Uh, career, it uh, equals getting out of the comfort zone. Um, yes, for sure. Sure. If you want to, I would say, uh, in, in my personal opinion. Yeah. yeah like uh, not, not necessarily a career, but, but mm -hmm. growth in any kind, like personal growth or career growth uh, always means that you have to, to stretch your comfort zone at some point. Yeah, yeah totally agree there. But awesome. there's also a point where you find your comfort zone and we'll say like, this is where I want to, to stay. Mm -hmm. This might also be an ambition um, and it's completely fine. I completely agree here with you and pretty much on everything that uh, that we have discussed and, and came in as, as questions or comments. So yeah, thank you very much for the for the talk and for for your for being so open to to share your experience, uh, your personal thoughts and your personal opinions. As you say, as you see, people do think about it. People uh, are in your shoes right now or have been, uh, and they really relate to to the topic. Um, yeah. Again, thanks for, for joining us for the live week. Always, always nice to have you on board uh, in our schedule, in our agenda. Thank you for having me. And everybody else, uh, we will be activating shortly the feedback survey for the, for the talk. Uh, very appreciated if you submit your opinion, how you liked it, what you enjoyed, what you didn't. Um, and we'll be back at 1.30 with two wonderful ladies from, uh, from IBM. And we'll, they'll be telling us uh, about their Call for Code initiative. So see you in 25 minutes.
everybody. Hi again from me, Vilana, your host for the Real Developers Life Week. I'm here to present you our next session. If you have had lunch already, that's great. Now you can enjoy and get your energy back with our two lovely ladies that will talk, talk to us about tech for good. Or if you haven't had lunch, this is actually a perfect session for you to watch during your lunch break. So make sure you have something delicious and um, pay attention to what it's about to come. For this, I need to remind you and emphasize again how important for us and for our speaker is for you to be on Slido and ask them questions, uh, give your comments, just so you know that you're listening and you are there because it's really weird to talk just to, to a screen. Without further ado, then I want to present you Miriam and Marion. They both work for, I, for IBM. Marion is an IBM developer advocacy for the German uh, for the DAC region, and Miriam is a digital strategist IBM. What unites them is the passion for people and tech together, and in particularly tech for good. They're both involved uh, with different initiatives uh, for tech for good and also for diversity in tech. So let's give it up for Mariam and Marion. I'm waiting for the sign. <laughs> okay, I got the sign. We are live uh, again with Miriam and Marion. Very welcome, very happy to have you here. I hope you're comfortable and you're ready for, for, this, uh, for this session. I already told people, reminded them, like I do for every session, that they should uh, turn on Slido so they can put their comments and their questions for you later. Uh, and we'll be looking at them after the session. So the stage is yours. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. Uh, so you can go ahead, share your screen. I'm gonna mute myself and stop my video, so. Okay. Uh, let me shortly. Uh... All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you to us today's session, Call for Code 2020, Build Solutions That Fight Back. Um, but at the very beginning, we would like to take a moment to point out how amazing the developer community is actually handling the current corona situation. I mean, we see all those huge events uh, being digitalized just in a snap just four months ago. We have been uh, hit with the news about the corona pandemic and it was followed by some actions we have actually never seen before. Yeah, and despite all that, organizers such as We Are Developers are making it possible to attend these kind of events from home, digitally. And this deserves a lot of respect and a big thank you. So thank you to the We Are Developers team. Um, you made us feel really welcome. And yeah, we're really excited to be here today. Marion and I know how hard it is to get all this organized, especially in a short amount of time. Usually we're behind the scenes, bringing events to life for the IBM Developer Advocacy Team here in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So welcome to our home offices <laughs> and welcome to our session. Uh, we're gonna start today's talk with a short video. Yes, so I hope you enjoyed the short uh, wake up call. And um, I think now it's time to first of all introduce ourselves. My name is Marianne. Um, I'm working for the IBM Developer Advocacy Team and I'm actually already more than 15 years within the tech industry. I started from being a developer and working in lab services, um, supporting customers with their challenges uh, to being a, a, um, 
a project manager and now I'm a program manager within the developer advocacy team. And next to that, I'm actually a passionate snowboarder and a mom of two kids. And I also have a little weakness for smarter homes because they make my life so much more effective. And this is my lovely colleague, Miriam. Hi, so I'm working with Marion in the developer advocacy team here in Berlin. But as you might notice from my accent, I'm not originally from here. I'm from the UK and I moved to Berlin about five years ago uh, to do a dual study program. So I was working and studying for my master's alongside. I decided to write my thesis about women in tech and was so inspired that I wanted to continue com contributing to this industry and making a difference. Um, I should mention my photo is about uh, my reaction to the pandemic. I decided one, I mean, we're all looking for things to do indoors. And one of the things that we decided to do was to paint a very white wall, very green. <laughs> so we've actually been thinking about how our lives has been affected by this pandemic. And I know that personally I'm aware and grateful for my extremely privileged position. I mean, I'm here able to keep working from home. And to be honest, the times when I noticed most how COVID-19 has affected my life is when my travel plans were canceled, or I think it's now three weddings which have been postponed, <laughs> or even organizing a surprise video party for my sister's birthday, instead of having her like by my side and celebrating together. So, yeah, I mean, Marion, that's that's my how my life's been affected, but I know your life has been turned upside down. That is true, Miriam. I, um, as I said, I have two kids, and from one mo from one moment to the next, um, I actually have to cope with the situation of having two small kids running around in my house and working at the same time, and I have to get started thinking about how do I educate them while they're at home, like remote education. And um, I was scrolling the news every day for what is the local situation. I had to uh, filter out what is fake, what is real. And um, also I had to find completely new ways to collaborate with my um, friends and family as every one of you know, community life was uh, completely shut down. So this actually brings us to the uh, to the reason why we are actually hosting this meetup today, Call for Code um, 2020 Build Solutions That Fight Back. Um, as our world and lives are changing and from day to day, um, uh, we still do see a lot of people getting engaged in all those uh, great projects that are tackling this crisis, which has, uh, which has actually the, um, 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 which has actually the potential to become one of the biggest crises of modern times. So we believe um, it's not too late to make a difference. And I would like to say it in the words of um, Dr. Geber Dr. Gebreus, um, who is the World Health Organization Director. And he, he said, we are at a critical point in the global response to COVID-19. We need everyone to get involved in this massive effort to keep the world safe. Um, so we would like to see you getting involved uh, in one of the largest Tech for Good initiatives uh, that is actually taking place right now, the 2020 Call for Code Global Challenge. But Miriam, maybe you can give us a small idea on uh, what Call for Code is actually all about. Yeah. So, Maria, that's the big question. What is Call for Code? Uh, like you said, it's the largest tech for good challenge of its kind. So it's actually a five year program with an annual competition. And this year, the 2020 challenge is the third year. As you can see on our slides, we've got IBM's partnered with some really big names, the United Nations Human Rights Office, the David Clark cause, the Linux Foundation, as long as many other partners. All of us working together to make sure we bring as many ideas to life as possible. And so far, perhaps you saw in the video, there, were, uh, there have been over 
thousand problem solvers who have got involved. And in the previous competitions, there's been over 8,000 applications built. And it's not just for developers. There's also data scientists, designers, business analysts, subject matter experts, and all sorts of other talented individuals coming together to build solutions to mitigate the biggest crises, oops, the biggest challenges and crises um, that humanity is facing. So Marion, can you tell us a little bit more about the previous competitions from Call for Code? Yeah, so the last two years um, have actually been all around preparedness uh, for natural disasters, as there are so many of them affecting and changing millions of lives. So in 2018, the project O, which actually means organization, whereabouts and logistics created a groundbreaking solution um, where hardware and software actually went hand in hand uh, to automatically construct a mesh network. We have small Wi-Fi units. Those units are called ducts and those ducts are allowing uh, for, for sustained communications uh, in peak times of need. So, and especially where it is needed in, in times of a crisis. And in 2019, the Prometeo team, which actually consists of a firefighter, a nurse and three IT professionals um, developed a first of its kind hardware software solution as well. Um, they were, um, they were um, equipping firefighters with little sensors that are measuring toxicity levels. Um, the firefighters battling wildfires are uh, um, uh, uh, opposed to. So this is offering a transformative solution for first responders globally. And I would like you to see um, their, uh, their uh, I like, I would like you to see the video uh, of them. So let me share that with you. So those both teams are actually currently implementing their solutions and they were, uh, they were rewarded with $200,000 of, um, of cash because these teams answered the call for code. And next to that, last week I was sitting with my neighbors at the bonfire and I was learning that their 18 years old son, which is still going to school, actually knows about Prometeo and what they are doing. And I really find it remarkable what an impact those teams uh, actually did to society. Don't you think, Miriam? Yeah. And I'm sure many of you remember the flooding in Puerto Rico or the wildfires in Australia. The Call for Code challenge addresses the big issues which face us as a society. In the past couple of months, We've seen and participated in many local initiatives, like these regional hackathons. Lots of IBMers, some you can see here on the screen, got involved. We were technology sponsor or mentoring teams, really helping developers to get engaged with their ideas and develop them further. Perhaps you've heard of the Veer versus Virus hackathon that garnered the attention of over 42,000 problem solvers or the European wide hackathon. So that's a, that, that just shows how many people are coming together to work together and create solutions in this time. 
tell us, Marion, what's the goal of this year's Call for Code challenge? So this year's Call for Code is focusing on the two most pressing topics uh, our society is facing today, today. climate change and COVID-19. I mean, COVID-19 has just revealed the limits of our systems that we take for granted. It's compromising our health, it's uh, compromising our planet and our survival. So IBM uh, has actually um, expanded the 2020 Call for Code uh, challenge to take on COVID-19, but they are still committed uh, to also combating climate change with um, which which affects us all. Um, so did you know that 75% uh, of Earth's carbon emissions are caused by our cities and that one fourth of all people um, are likely to, to live in a chronic water shortage by 2050? This is only 30 years away from now and it's gonna affect us. So. 37 million people are severely affected by natural disasters every year. I would like to cite uh, Antonio Guterres, who is the Secretary General of the United Nations. The climate crisis is caused by us and the solutions must come from us. We have the tools and technologies on our side. So the big, the big question is Miriam, how can we get involved? So you can accept the challenge. You can answer the call for code. We're not asking you to create a cure for COVID-19 or even to create a vaccine or hospital equipment. We're asking you to answer the call in, in these ways as the two tracks, COVID-19 and the uh, the climate change two tracks, they are each broken down into three themes. So let's take a look at each one. Through crisis communication. So addressing communication is key in these sorts of situations. And communication systems are one of the first systems to become stressed and overwhelmed. In our recent hackathons, we've seen solutions to filter eight filter out fake news, and to find trusted sources of data and information, for example. If we look at remote education, Marion, you said it yourself, schools and kindergartens are closed. We've got social distancing guidelines. How can we ensure that our students can keep learning, that they can keep entertained and engaged in their academics? And community cooperation, that's easier said than done. But during these times of uncertainty, it's imperative we help one another. My neighbor actually created a digital shopping app uh, for the at-risk individuals in our neighborhood. And those who are more able to go shopping can just pick up some extra groceries for those, for those neighbors who are a little more at risk. Solutions like these are integral to dealing with a pandemic. If we take a look at the three topics that we've got for climate change, um, as Marion said, <laughs> it's the biggest issue facing us as a society. A recent global survey said that 77% of developers and first responders, it's their opinion that it's the biggest issue which faces as a society. Though I'm guessing that was before Corona because yeah, we've, all our lives have been turned upside down. What's key to remember is that climate change is not going away and that this is still as relevant as ever. So if we look at water sustainability, um, things like rising sea levels and other repercussions due to climate change, access to water and all sorts of topics are really critical. For energy sustainability, I'm sure I don't need to tell you for greenhouse gases and our sources of energy, we must recognize that other methodologies and innovations need to be used to, you, to, to choose other sources for, for energy. And disaster resiliency. 
how many more flooded cities and forest fires can we endure? This, this is what the previous call for co-competitions have focused on. And we believe that this is still a pressing topic and we are uniquely positioned to offer you opportunity to find answers to these issues through technology. So as Miriam said, and as you have seen, there are many, many reasons to get um, uh, uh, to participate uh, in a Tech for Good initiative like Code for Code. Um, but if that's not enough, um, there obviously is some more um, um, uh, to convince you to, to actually get uh, involved into this uh, initiative. So we can support you with our technology, with our data sets. We can help you build your idea quickly and scale it on a global level. And all winners will actually receive implementation support by the Linux Foundation and by IBM services. And if that, this is still not enough, um, the grand prize winner can actually receive 200,000 US dollars of cash and will receive, uh, as I said, implementation support. And also we get gain the opportunity for mentorship and additional investments in their solution. And even the runners up can win up to 25,000 US dollars. Um, so currently we are quite far with, uh, into the competition. Um, Call for Code started uh, on February 26th and then cor the corona, uh, corona pandemic started and we took on the COVID-19 track in March and we had a, um, a shortened deadline for submissions for that track because we wanted to support society as quickly as possible. And actually just a couple of weeks ago, um, the top three solutions got announced at the SYNC on May, uh, on May 5th. And I would just shortly like to tell you which are those three um, top solutions. The first one is Save It You, which is an app that enhances social distancing um, based on virtual lines. It's, it's a really fantastic app. And um, the second one is Are You Well COVID-19, which is actually designed for people um, which need comprehensive medical uh, assistance. And the last one, or the third one actually is COVID Impact, which is an application targeted for smaller business owners uh, who need to get uh, who need to get help to get back on their feet after the economic fall, uh, uh, economic fallout of COVID nineteen. But we have still plenty of time until the final submission is closing. Um, those are just three top solutions that are already getting implementation support. Support, but don't hesitate to submit your ideas uh, until July thirty first, as we cannot emphasize it enough. It's not too late to make a difference. And um, it's so easy to start. So if you're wondering how you can get started and how you can answer the call for code and participate, we've broken it down into four easy steps. Accepting the challenge. We've created a short link for a free IBM Cloud account, especially for we are developers. You can see it here. It says ibm.biz slash make a difference. We want to, you to make sure you make the most of the resources available. And talking of resources, filled with open tech. <laughs> Our partner APIs, the open source projects, open data, all these resources. We also have tons of, of blogs and videos and tutorials on the IBM developer website. There's also call for code starter kits. So we're, we've given you as much as we can to, to get started. We also realized that the top clock is ticking. There's just over two months left before the final submission deadline. So if you want to find a squad, if you want to join an existing team, if you want to contribute to an existing project, find your teammates on our call for code Slack. And of course, before the deadline, we hope that you'll share your project with us. Uh, so submitting your idea. Marion, can you share some more information about the submission process? Yeah, so the official rules um, 
Uh, within the participation agreement, you have to accept uh, when submitting your idea upon registration, uh, which you have to accept upon the registration. But there are some key rules I would like to share with you. So to be elig eligible for the grand prize, the $200,000 in cash, <coughs> you have to make sure, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you have to make sure your application is new and built for this competition which again goes from February 26 to July 31st. So you can, you can use open source and uh, also previous components that are, uh, that are out there that are publicly available, but they had to be publicly available um, before uh, February 26, as we want every participant to have the same, the same chance, right? So as said, the goal of Call for Code is to build sustainable open source projects which can be deployed quickly and scaled globally. In short, you can compete, you can compete alone or as part of a group of up to five people. You have to make sure everyone is um, over 18 years old. This is becoming uh, critical um, when you submit your idea. Um, and you have to, uh, you have to be aware that you can only um, be part of one team. Uh, you can only submit one solution and you can only submit your solution for one of the two tracks, COVID-19 and climate change. And the last rule um, is you need to use IBM, the IBM cloud services. I mean, IBM is providing you with cloud, with data and even AI technologies. Um, but to support you, uh, even further, you can, of, of course, make advantage of other sponsors' APIs, of uh, other data sources and um, open source libraries. Um, you know, there shouldn't be any reason to stop you. Um, Miriam, tell us a little bit more about how this is going to be evaluated. Sure. So there are four equally weighted criteria that the call for code judges will use to evaluate the submitted projects. Let's take a look at them. So design and usability. How does the design of your app or website focus on the user and their experience? Is it easy to use? And how quickly can your solution be put to use? For completeness and transferability, how fully has the idea been implemented can it achieve an impact in the field? And can it be transferred to, to other situations or even to other geographies? For creativity and innovation. So how are you addressing the problem? How unique is your idea? Are you taking a new perspective on an existing problem and how to solve it? And finally, effectiveness and efficiency. Does your solution address a problem? Does it address a high priority? And does it achieve its goal effectively? Now you've heard the judging criteria, we, we really want to share with you our top tips for the 2020 challenge. Don't reinvent the wheel. That's the first tip. <laughs> As we've mentioned, there's already been a plethora of regional hackathons, particularly addressing the COVID-19 crisis. So please don't forget to use the existing tools and data sets and APIs that already exist. You can also join an existing team and that who are already working on a Call for Code project, as we mentioned, and we're gonna make sure that we've got a list of resources at the end of our presentation, and we're gonna make sure that you get that and we can share it with you. Uh, we also here at IBM love open source and this isn't just to help you submit your project on time. Your solution will have the greatest impact if it addresses a long-standing problem that doesn't have an existing solution. So make sure you use all the information and resources that are available to you and relevant to your project. Our second top tip is document your source code repository. So when you submit your Call for Code project, you'll provide various different forms of information, including a 500 word description of your solution, a project roadmap, and a demo video. Here's a top tip from the Call for Code judges. 
create a great readme file. So one of the best ways to show how mature your project is and how the judges can explore it in a hands-on manner. Take a look at some best readme practices and ensure yours represents your team and your idea best. Yeah, and while we are um, talking about pre uh, presenting your team, um, the third tip is take time to create a powerful video. There is no more powerful way to actually um, tie your entire submission together and have a lasting impact on all those judges as there, as there will be technical judges, NGO judges, eminent judges, uh, subject, subject matter experts. So create a compelling video. Now leave all the deep dive material for your 500 word solution description, but the video should really uh, be short and, um, and address the following points. Like the first, 45 seconds should be about what exactly are you trying to solve and how are you solving it? And approximately one and a half hour um, should be a demo of your submission and what's the full user flow, um, what is your solution all about? Um, and the last tip is please check, double check your permissions. I mean, we all know you want to present your team with, uh, in the best manner and you want to make sure everything is complete. There are no typos in the description and everything. But from the past uh, years, our judges have seen that if, if, they, if they are missing sub, uh, permissions within your code, they are not able to fully evaluate your code. So make sure um, you know, you have the right permissions. Um, the best would be, you know, to just open source your whole, uh, your whole code repository and your video um, best after the deadline of July 31st. Um, and when publishing, the mo I think the most commonly uh, used um, license is the Apache license. Um, so, yeah, we can't stress it enough to make use of the resources available. And um, here's our link again that we've created for the We Are Developers Conference um, for a free IBM Cloud account. We There's no credit card required when you register. So yeah, take a look, ibm.biz slash make a difference. Yeah, and when talking about resources, also take a look at Call for Code on Demand. There are videos on there. There are how-tos on there. There is um, there are the starter uh, links to the starter kits on there. So there's a lot of material, you know, to get you started, to uh, give you a great entry point, and it couldn't be much easier. And, and as we said, oh yeah, just. <laughs> As we said at the start of our talk, our developer community was originally located here in Berlin. And since transforming our meetup group from face-to-face -face events to digital and online events, we now welcome developers from all around the world to our free talks and hands-on workshops. So our goal is really to make your lives as developers easier. And yeah, we'd love to see you there. The last question from us is what will you build? What will you build? Um, to close this session, we have pulled together a couple of what we think the most important links um, to re uh, and resources um, in order for you to get more information about C Call for Code and um, you know to get insights into the starter kit material and everything. So please take the time and look at those as well. And we are also going to treat our uh, slide deck. Yes. This, uh, with this uh, said, we are wrapping up our, our session. We thank you for taking the time to listen to us. <laughs> yes, thank you very much.
Thank you, girls. Actually, you're the one that we should thank for all the information <laughs> with all the ways that people can get involved and that actually there is so much that you can do and be active and uh, technology today allows us to do this from every part of the world, from every place, uh, like a co-working space, your home, wherever you are. And also the current situation actually is um, not that bad in a sense of like you can still do things. You don't need to be uh, out there to to participate or uh, participate in this kind of initiatives. Yeah. Let's look at the questions. Our Slido has been uh, active during uh, during your your session. There are some comments. Uh, there are some questions. So I'm gonna share my screen right now, uh, so you can uh, see the questions. And I meanwhile, I'm also gonna encourage everybody who hasn't shared their questions yet. Um, and wants to do so to go ahead um, and uh, yeah, uh, write in Slido. Oh, <laughs> I found one of the best virtual events I've ever attended. Thank you so much. We, ha I have been really nervous. I must admit it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's new to us all, and I have two kids that are running around in the back. So <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> um, I Our next ask. question is, do you also help in connecting with uh, other specialists and uh, small, medium enterprises? Yes, we do. The, the um, subject matter expert? I think are, this, uh, this can be bold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes, um, so the short answer is yes, we do. Um, and the longer answer is there are many ways we can do that. Uh, one is join our uh, our meetup community get in touch with us personally um we do know a lot of people also around for cold but also um people who know open source technologies um developer advocates who are talking about the newest technologies out there about kubernetes about ai so you know feel free to to reach out to us uh, join our community join the slack channel for call for code yes. there are so many people on there which are searching for people, you know, uh, that want to to support their team. So don't hesitate. There are many, many ways. Thank you. So uh, also, actually, as I have been saying on other uh, on other during other sessions, we do have our Slack channel. Uh, so we could any resources and also uh, your slides. Uh, we'll be very happy to share them there with the attendees. Right. Uh, so we'll make sure uh, we get this uh, for for everybody. Also, Thank anything you. that comes later to your mind as tips uh, or anything, yeah, that would be that would be great. Uh, from Tom, very active participant of ours in the whole. <laughs> Tom, I want to personally <laughs> thank you for being so active. I wish I had the time to do all of these awesome projects. Can anyone participate? Yes, anyone can. A question to the <laughs> There's, there's no limitation. Um, there's no limitation of being a developer or as you have seen the Prometeo team, they consisted of a firefighter and a nurse and they had, had three uh, IT professionals, which were actually, you know, supporting the subject matter experts with um, building a solution for it. So the only criteria is that you have to be above 18. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So literally anybody um and i guess also uh and we would love to see anybody right i mean uh, great ideas um come from 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 teams that are that are um diverse i guess i totally agree with you. and i guess also uh, a full technical background it's not needed uh to, to not at all from your examples from what i guess yeah, um, I see another question uh, from Anonymous. Uh, so climate change is open and COVID is closed. No, it isn't. Both tracks are open until July 31st. Um, yeah, we had an earlier deadline for some of the COVID so we could really implement things quickly so while they have the most impact. But actually both topics are now open until the final deadline. I mean, with the pan uh, pandemic starting, we saw the pressing need that the solutions must be uh, deployed quickly. That's why we had the earlier uh, submission to get uh, the three top, the first three top solutions mm -hmm. implemented and deployed quickly. But still, the full uh, competition with climate change and COVID-19 is open until July 31st. 
So everybody has about two months. Just to repeat, Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Can't say it often enough. Yes. It is true. With deadlines, it's always like this. You say it, you say it, it's like, oh, I missed the deadline. <laughs> Uh, another comment, awesome talk, so many ideas. I'm really interested in the environmental path. Thank you everybody for giving us those comments. Uh, it's really encouraging as I keep saying. How can I make sure that I do not work on the same thing like someone else? So here I'd recommend again joining the Slack channel because lots of teams are active there sharing what they're working on, especially if they're looking for more participants. Um, and with, with regards to the previous hackathons that have been do, done in regional um, areas, then a lot of these teams have also made their projects open source. So to make sure you don't start again for something someone's already built a couple of weeks ago then or, or months ago, then yeah, make sure that you take a look at all those resources from Yeah, so online. if you have an idea, you know, uh, go on uh, coffercode.org and uh, accept the challenge and join the Slack channel. And you will find out if there's already uh, someone working on it. Maybe you want to join their team or maybe you see that your solution is even address uh, addressing a completely different part, uh, even though it seems to look similar at the beginning. So, you know, if you have an idea, don't hesitate. Don't make that stop you. Go and join the Slack channel and um, um, find a team and start building. Yeah. Good. Uh, we'll make sure that we also communicate and uh, give to all the participants all these links and resources. So yes. uh, yeah, encourage them as well to, to go ahead and apply. <laughs> uh, a question for Mike, another very active uh, viewer from us. Do you know from the past year how big the investment in time from the team is? It's, this one is a really difficult question to answer. Um, as, as, as we said in our tips, don't reinvent the wheel, you know, take stuff that is already out there, which is open source to build um, um, up on a foundation um, that, is, that is strong and that is already there. So um, you obviously can't, you know, uh, well, maybe you can uh, uh, invent your or, or build your solution within a weekend. Uh, mm. We don't know. It's up to you, um, and up to the up to the judges, I guess, right? So, as Miriam said, there are four equally weighted um, uh, criteria. Um, it's really up to you. And I mean, it's still two months, uh, two months time left mm -hmm. to, to, to start doing something, and. Um, that leaves us uh, with enough time to build to build something, right? And um... yeah. yeah, so it really depends on everybody's availability and your team members. Absolutely, it's really a subjective uh, question. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish I could say yeah. Uh, all the teams just you know <laughs> worked no, one I month, and that, those were the best solutions. No, I mean. I guess the top solutions they were really um, into their solutions mm -hmm. and now they are deploying the solutions out there right it's it's going on right now it's, it didn't stop um they got the money they got uh, people investing in their solutions so this goes on yeah and and in previous years we've we've hosted both for our internal ibm call for code challenge and our and the external uh call for code challenge we've hosted like mini hackathons but mm -hmm. the call for code challenge is way more than a hackathon it goes on much further you've got a lot more time to develop and iterate on your project and really develop your idea so fully. So I think, yeah, it's it's really is a subjective question and the answer must be, it depends. And I mean, you can work on it up until you're happy with it and up until the deadline. So you've got quite a bit of flexibility still despite the uh, ticking clock. <laughs> Okay, so Mike, it depends on you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what happens to the winning project after this challenge? And what about the projects that didn't win? That's a really good question for... That's a really good question. So yeah. the um, after the submission closes and uh, the winning teams are announced on in October, 
the date isn't fixed yet so it's going to be somewhere around october and they're not just going to win and then left being left alone with their solution we have an interest in uh, seeing those winning projects actually being implemented so um, the linux foundation and ibm service corps are uh, or service um, um, teams are going to support you with mentoring and also with uh, implementation help to actually get it get it done mm -hmm. right and to, to get it implemented there's always space Nach oben. Upwards. Yeah, upwards. <laughs> so um, um, probably it can go beyond the um, the support of IB, uh, uh, of IBM and Call for Code. And um, but nevertheless, we do have an initiative called Code and Response, which actually supports the winning teams uh, to mm -hmm. implement their solutions. Um, what and about the project that didn't win? That's a great question. It's a great question. I, I don't know. I, I know that um, um, there is a university edition, an additional one. So um, if all team members are from university and you are not getting in the uh, uh, winning, uh, into the uh, winning teams, five winning teams, um, that is, you still have the chance to win uh, if your solution is still a great one. You still have the chance to win ten thousand uh, US dollar and also get implementation support. So, okay, I guess we are like we are really interested in in in, in seeing the great ideas being built and so. come to life. Yeah. It really depends on the solution. It's not that just you are not because uh, not that you're in the five winning teams. Um, you know, nobody is recognizing your your efforts. Yeah, and I also think if you didn't win, but you developed and worked on the idea, there is nothing to stop you to continue developing it. Uh, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, we have our developer uh, community the, um, um, publicly on Meetup, right? Uh, where we have great developer advocates that can give mentoring and everything. Um, um, yeah, so I think, great solution. Uh, there's no way. Exactly. I, I also doubt that anybody. If uh, also you d didn't don't win and you want to continue working and you need some mentorship, that exactly anybody from the team would uh, say no to to help and take a look and give their feedback or um, whatever. Good. Let's look at the next question. Uh, are you accepting prototypes or are you expecting finished products? So one of the four criteria that the judges used to evaluate the projects was completeness and transferability. So they're looking for how fully the idea has been developed and implemented and how quickly the solution can be put to use. So I think this one's another like it depends. I mean, you've got to really communicate to the judges your idea quite clearly. And of course, the further along you are, the, the better, but um, yeah. really strong ideas speak for themselves. Yeah. And um, the ideas you have seen in those videos, they haven't been fully finished um, when they were submitted. So, um, this is why IBM is, uh, is supporting you in the Slack channel. This is why we um, um, give implementation support afterwards. So um, it really depends on the solution, as Miriam said. Yeah. You have to make clear. The most important thing is that you have to make clear what your solution is all about, which problems are addressed, how can you solve those. And the rest is going to. You know, it's just going to to align. <laughs> to align, yeah. Yeah, I'm not native English, like <laughs> English speaker, like, <laughs> like my dear friend Miriam. Yeah. Um, Mike, again, in your opinion, is in your opinion, is call for code more attractive because of the money, of, or your baby see the light and change the world? Definitely the second. Yeah. Definitely the second. 
I am really inspired by um, by the solutions that have been built and what great ideas turned out of, of those comp of this competition in the last two years. And it's 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 not just one of those uh, hackathons where everyone is creating uh, tons of ideas and then it's just you know being dropped, but mm -hmm you see those ideas implemented. Um, I mean, the Prometeo team is implementing and, and, and deploying and testing their solution uh, uh, right now in uh, Barcelona for the, uh, for the uh, wildfires. Yeah. That is, you know, I, I, I find that really inspiring and um, it kind of gives me a chill when thinking about that, um, the stuff you can do with technology and with your knowledge, um, is actually changing um, society and helps us fighting those battles. I completely agree here. Um, Miriam, do you want to add something or should we move to the next question? Please, we've, we've, and I think Marion answered it perfectly. Okay. <laughs> and then some comments, awesome talk, cool t-shirts. Oh yeah, the t-shirts, they really need a shout out. IBM. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're they're all cut off with this yes, video calls. They even have those awesome socks. <laughs> we are very proud of our swag. Um, <laughs> you could be because uh, we are friends in the office uh, about t-shirts and hoodies and socks, especially also at our events. Uh, whoever has uh, socks on their boots, they go first. I don't know what it is about socks, but socks are really. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, uh, you know, um, when we did the live events within our uh, um, developer advocacy community, we actually gave out um, um, before or after our talks, we gave out some t-shirts. So because we um, treasure uh, developers as well, and we like to have <laughs> yeah. uh, like you to have cool t-shirts too. So maybe yeah. you join our community and uh, or you reach out to us, maybe. Maybe you can get the t-shirt. <laughs> there is actually a question uh, connecting to this of reaching out to you um, of how people, uh, yeah, where can we follow you on social media? So to be updated about other cool activities and then I guess also get, could get in touch with you. So on social media, you can follow the IBM developer channels. We're everywhere, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Medium and Twitch even. So IBM developers everywhere. Um, we've also got local channels like IBM Deutschland or Österreich, Schweiz. So like for each of the countries. Um, and for us, our team, we're all on social media with our own private accounts. So we're quite active sharing our activities there too. Um, and that's one of the best ways to get in touch with our um, with our developer advocates. They often stay in their meetups and workshops. Yeah, reach out to us. Here's our Twitter handles and and so on. Um, but yeah, so at the moment we're focusing on our meetup um, and social media. Yeah, we're shouting from the rooftops everywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and uh, um, as we are going to share the slides, um, um, our Twitter handles are in there and also yes. our, uh, the link to our um, meetup community. The best way to get uh, in, in touch with us is our meetup community. Okay. Um, as we have all interesting events for our developer community going on, uh, we, we're gonna post them there. I'll so, make sure I but please reach out uh, via Twitter, via Sing, via LinkedIn, uh, you know. There, there is one more place where the events are listed on the developer.ibm.com website and it's I think it's just forward slash events they're all listed there too. Cool so a lot of ways uh, whatever you are using they're there so you will not miss them for sure. <laughs> yeah. Coming from Tobias really well done thanks for presenting. Thank you Tobias. <laughs> Will there be, I think we have time for two or three more questions. Uh, will there be a public presentation of the best solutions? They will get announced um, in October. I do not know 
at which event currently and when this is going to be happening but there will they will be publicly announced and there will be blog posts about the best solutions at ibm developer i'm very sure they have been the last two years and i don't think they're going to stop that this year so and and you can take a look at the um early submission winners from the covid 19 track they are so, already on youtube yeah so yeah. they're they're already public and you can check them out Cool. Um, and then let's see if there is some other questions, their comments. Thank you for spreading the word. Great initiatives. Uh, here there was the comments. <laughs> uh, your presentation. Uh, well, there are actually a lot of services for free. And um, yeah. so at the beginning, you can uh, easily start with no credit card. Just Perfect. to comment on that. <laughs> And then look, as you were doubting your English, people actually support you and say that uh, there is a <laughs> with your English. Cool. Like, I think that's it when it comes to the questions. Uh, we can wait a couple of more seconds if, in case somebody is currently typing. Uh, but I just want to thank you for participating during the live week, for sharing us uh, with us your, your content, your initiatives. Uh, it was very nice to, to have you on board. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much for having us here. It was and a great opportunity. Else, right now we're going to also uh, show you the feedback that we're collecting for each session. So make sure you also give us uh, your input so we can also share it with Miriam and Marion. And then um, they can improve and <laughs> have, uh, yeah, have add things or uh, take out the presentation you can but get yes. it more rocking <laughs> so i think on that side you'll get the 10 for sure <laughs> and it is, uh, i see it already online so people are participating cool yeah uh, for everybody else again thank you thank you ladies for joining us for everybody else we'll be back at 3 p.m with the panel on innovating during the crisis so we're kind of staying in the topic with our next uh, session. Uh, make sure you set your reminders and we'll be back at 3 p.m.
Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. I hope you're feeling great because we are and we're very, very excited for this program that we have this afternoon. Uh, another format that's coming up right now, it's a panel discussion and the topic is innovating during the crisis. Here is actually the moment that I thank all of our sponsors and partners and particularly our media partners. And this very next panel actually is in cooperation with Forbes that, who has, that have been supporting us throughout this whole event and in the preparation of it. So please enjoy the panel. It will be moderated by Klaus Fiala, Editor-in-Chief of Forbes DAG. Welcome everyone to this discussion as part of the We Are Developers Live Week, which is happening from Monday to Friday this week. We have an exciting panel on the topic innovating during the crisis, and we will see how different organizations and different people within these organizations have managed to keep innovation up during this unprecedented times, um, how changes within their organizations, let's say work from home, have impacted how they innovate and what they think the future post-corona uh, or within this pandemic that we're still seeing um, will look like and what it means for the innovation power of their own houses. Um, we have an exciting panel. I will quickly go through this, uh, our, our lineup and then we will go dive right into the questions and hopefully have a lively discussion that adds value to whatever you do in your professional lives. Um, we have Martin Witzowski, who is the chief designer and futurist at SAP. <laughs> um, he's going to give us hopefully a bit of an outlook of what a huge, one of the biggest European companies um, is doing in terms of innovative power um, and what the future, as his title is Futurist, what, you, what, what the future might hold for us. Um, next is Nicolas Bührer, who's the CEO of Digital Switzerland. Digital Switzerland is one of the biggest digital initiatives um, in Europe, has been um, bringing together stakeholders from this digital leadership sphere to really transform the country and also the economy within the country. Um, Georg Hauer is also part of our discussion today. He is the general manager for the DACH region, the German-speaking region at N26. N26 is a mobile and digital bank based in Berlin, but active around the world um, and has also been faced with challenges within this crisis. But as we know, startups usually know how to dig themselves out of a hole and how to adapt to change circumstances. So excited to hear what Georg has to offer in terms of, of solutions. And last but not least, we have Caitlin Chang, who's the brand innovation lead at Accenture Interactive. Um, and then also, she's, she hasn't been in that position for too long. So I'm excited to hear, first of all, how she has adapted in this, in the, in, within these crazy times um, and to hear her perspective on what's going on at one of the biggest, biggest uh, consultancies uh, around the world. All right, guys, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for participating. Excited to hear what you have to offer. First question, I preparing for this, um, I wrote in different media and Harvard Business Review had an exciting article about, about exactly this topic that we're trying to discuss. And I would like to go around and give each and every one of you a few minutes to pick up on that statement that they, that they made is there's nothing like a crisis to ignite innovation. So is this crisis really a boost for innovation? We will see, we will, will we see new solutions, new businesses popping up um, as a result of, of the coronavirus crisis. Do you agree with this statement and what's your outlook on that? Um, maybe going, through the line that I see right now, Nicolas, maybe you can start and give, you, give us what your view uh, on this topic. Okay, um, I definitely agree. It's not a surprise. I even believe since this crisis is even more um, somewhere disrupting the world than the subprime crisis or even the 2000 crisis, I believe the innovation will be also more disruptive which we will see in the next five to 10 years. Uh, let's face it, no one was prepared two months ago. We were just going to the work. We were looking to Asia and believed it will never come to Europe. Let's see where we are two and a half months later. It's quite insane. Doing a Zoom conference would have been unthinkable even two months ago. And I believe 
since our mindset. And I think that through our members and many companies, uh, since the mindset are changing so radically within the next or the last two months, I believe innovation will be very disruptive. So for me, there is a dependency between the, let's say, the strength of a crisis and the potential innovation we will see in the future. So I believe, uh, let's stay tuned in the next decade, we will see many new disrupting innovations. Caitlin, do you agree with this statement? What's your view on innovation during the crisis? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think a lot of us have seen a lot of memes in the past few weeks. Um, and one of, the, one of my favorite memes, I think, has been um, the questionnaire one that a lot of us saw on Twitter, which was, um, who accelerated the digitalization in your company? A, CEO, B, CIO, three, CFO, D, Corona, and everybody Corona. Yeah. Um, and exactly like Nicholas just said, I think we are already doing things that was unthinkable just two months ago, right? Um, me also coming from, an, uh, from South Korea originally, um, I used to say up until a few months ago, the innovation that we're seeing in Asia is just something that we will, will probably never be able to do in Europe um, because of all of, you know, a lot of concerns about privacy and every single concerns and just, you know, the lack of, let's say, the very resistance to innovation and whatnot. But all of that has changed completely over the past two, two months. And I think that's, that's really actually amazing because if you think about it, when does when is it easiest to innovate right it's easiest to innovate or when you're when you're sort of like when you put on the innovator's hat or you want to be the person who's like einstein and who's like developing stuff you think hmm, i want to think of something new but never does it come really just so like that just because you want to think about something new it's usually when you think of a problem right and when you really feel that problem when you want to solve that problem usually the best ideas come most easily and that's why I think it's a matter of course that when the problem is so big that the entire world is feeling it right now, then the entire world is forced to think about solutions to solve this problem. And that is in itself innovation. So absolutely agree. Yeah, what's your take? Yeah, I 100% agree. Uh, a crisis truly changes our daily lives. And uh, everyone around the world faces now new challenges. And new challenges also mean new needs, new, new customer needs. And uh, companies around the world have joined forces in solving some of those problems and other challenges need to be solved individually for companies and also are opportunities for new companies to emerge. In fact, if we look back at the, the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, some of the most important unicorns of the last decade all were founded in the aftermath of that crisis. Like Uber, Airbnb, uh, and other big unicorns. And as a matter of fact, even N26 was the founding of N26 was triggered by the financial crisis because banks back then had completely lost the trust of customers and were preoccupied by themselves. And that just shows that crises are not just a disaster for the economy, which it absolutely is, but it also provides certain opportunities for young companies and existing companies to, to, uh, to deliver new features, new products, and solve new customer problems. And ultimately, that's how innovation generally works. A crisis just accelerates the need for adoption. And ultimately, we will probably see in a couple of years from now which impact Corona will have had on our economy and our innovation. But there will certainly be also some positive aspects to that. So I'm just realizing that we've lost Martin. We will just carry on. I don't know what's happening there. Maybe um, maybe he didn't want to discuss the future with us as a futurist. Um, maybe he will also join the, the conversation later. I've written him. Otherwise, we will just carry on um, in, this, in this lineup, which makes sense because then you can talk more, a bit, you get a bit more speaking time. Um, this was mentioned by, I think, all three of you that some things that you didn't think were possible before have now just happened. Um, and I would like to ask you to give a view of either from your organization or what you've seen in other organizations, what exactly was made possible in this crisis that you didn't think could happen before. 
Um, Caitlin, maybe you can give us a, an example of, of what that could be. Yeah, <clears throat> we're not traveling anymore, right? Um, before in our company, I think it was just a matter of fact. Um, you felt as if you were not being polite if you're not actually traveling to the client site um, and seeing the client in person, at least for a first Ken and Lennon meeting, so get to know meeting. Um, and also the colleagues that you don't know to meet them for the first time, it felt like you had to somehow do a kickoff all together in the same space. If you wanted to do a workshop, you wanted to do it physically in the same space with post-its so that it feels more tangible and haptic. All of that is not happening anymore. And people are really being surprised at how well it works still digitally. Um, we have, we've started doing a lot of digital workshops on platforms like Neuro and a lot of design thinking workshops as well. And you would be really surprised actually how well it works rather than how it doesn't work. Because yes, there are some instances where the people who are participating are not really, let's say, used to the platform. And that's why this, let's say, uh, introduction phase has to be in there and that does take up some time. But what we've realized while during these digital workshops is that actually it's even better for a lot of the participants to become very, very democratic, right? Because even in the traditional, very playful workshop settings, and especially design thinking workshops, you still see a sort of a hierarchy, right? If you're the senior and the senior says something on a post-it and then you can't really, you know, you try to, but you can't really, but somehow within the digital setting where all of this is completely removed, you're starting to see that all, a lot of, let's say the younger um, colleagues and junior um, colleagues are starting to be a bit, a lot more vocal. In, because you just can't see who's posting what where, right? And then afterwards you discuss that together. So I think in terms of working um, digitally, we're seeing a lot of, let's say, advantages that we never even really thought about, um, aside from the fact that, of course, everyone from all over, all, all over the world can um, join at the same time. Yeah, what, what was it for you that simply suddenly happened um, that you thought was impossible? Yeah. So. Uh, what's interesting in a tech company, typically you think about the, how you can solve customer problems with technology. But it, it's, you very rarely think of the other way around, that a crisis can change the customer behavior faster than any single technology by itself could ever do. And that really made me think uh, that in a certain way, uh, when you build a company, and when you prepare organizational structures, it's much more important to remain flexible and be able to react on changing customer needs rather than trying to change customer behavior with your technology. I think intrinsically, that's how successful companies have always built their products. But the Corona crisis really just showed how important it is, even for large corporates, to remain flexible. And I think what we're gonna see here in this crisis and what people are going to learn after this crisis is that organizational structures will be built in a much more flexible way in order to be ready for such, such exogen shocks or uh, influences that just suddenly change things and change the needs of what the company wants to achieve. But sticking with that for, for a moment, what, what are the changes you've seen um, in terms of customer behavior at M26 that were most accentuated, that were most um, you know, heavily changed through the crisis? Yeah, so what, what was interesting is um, very often for, for digital banks, uh, the travel aspect is very important because young people are very mobile they travel around the world they are travel around europe and uh, they use their their payment they, they just spend a lot while traveling uh, suddenly the travel aspect was completely gone uh, but on the other side it, a new generation of people needed uh, to still purchase their stuff their daily expenses but all that could only be done online so in fact suddenly a digital bank like Inc. 26 was the best option for not just the, the let's say, people in their mid-30s or 40s, but for anyone to purchase online. So what we did is we very quickly pivoted from certain products that we wanted to build in the travel segment to 
um, to a product that enabled to use their card within only minutes of opening an account rather than waiting uh, a week uh, that their physical card arrives in the, in the mail. And this was a product we basically had planned maybe in a couple of months, but we pulled it forward and accelerated their production uh, to make sure that people, while they're locked in their own apartments, could already open a digital bank account and spend, start spending right away. And, and this is something where we really reacted very fast. And in fact, we could win a lot of new customers in their 50s or 60s, which otherwise would maybe even prefer to go to a bank branch, but in that occasion needed a digital bank. So we're, I'm glad to announce that we're complete again. We've gotten Martin back. Um, good to have you. Uh, Martin, we are talking about things that you've learned that you thought were impossible, but through the crisis in the past eight weeks suddenly happened as if out of nowhere. What's, what's an example from your experience that the crisis suddenly made possible that you thought couldn't happen ever? Well, I believe that we can connect through digital uh, media channels like this one in a pretty decent way. And I think it cha challenges our biases towards uh, everything, including how we innovate. Um, we always thought that uh, innovation, had, and as your first question statement uh, here from the article uh, in HBR was, you know, there's nothing like a crisis uh, to ignite innovation. That's also true. However, I think what we learned very quickly here is that it's just an indicator. The crisis will force you to realize, to check your assumptions. If you weren't ready somehow for this, to be this agile and this prepared for this crisis before, you will not be ready during the crisis either. So it is a litmus test for your organization preparedness. And most of all, most of all, most of all, did you think long term? Or are you still a reactive player for the next three months? Do you have company, family values that drive you forward? Or do you only have shareholder value in mind for the next quarters to go forward? So, I mean, it really squeezes out the key, crucial, uncomfortable, and very important questions out of any system, any ecosystem and organization. And this is what I have experienced here, uh, which I'm super happy for because my job is obviously to look far ahead. Nicholas, when you talk to stakeholders from within the ecosystem in Switzerland that are taking part within this digital transformation that there's a lot of talk about, how do you see them adapting to this new, new normal that we're always talking about? Um, and what are you seeing there that, that's, that suddenly made possible that wasn't before? So we see, we see pretty much everything, unfortunately. What, what, I, what said Martin, and I really love it, is it's about sustainability in the future. It's about more than just your shareholders. It's about having a vision and a mission. And I believe that some companies, some organizations really did change their mindset and their way of working within a few weeks. Then understood they have to become agile and be ready to pilot. I see the same, by the way, sometimes in startups, which is quite surprising, which are not able to be agile. Somewhere they are stick to their to the strategy, they are not changing in, and it's obvious they won't survive. So it's interesting, both startups and corporate, we see with a really a broad range of, of ways of treating the, the crisis from some of them maybe having more liquidity, cash is king, definitely. It's the same for corporate and startup. I believe in the next couple of weeks, we will see, uh, unfortunately, some important uh, bankruptcy cases. It already started this week in the US uh, last week. Uh, but you have on one side the company's institution having enough cash and able to be agile and to really change the way they work in getting more digital. And you have the other side who are not able somewhere, they fear uh, what's happening and I believe they won't survive. So with the, pretty much everything, I believe some numbers within the, the startups community in DAH, some statistics says 20% to 25 person won't survive the crisis, which is a, a big amount, but this is as it is. Some others will be big winners. So we've seen that, that you all wholeheartedly agree with the statement that, that a crisis usually ignites innovation. 
But what we're also seeing and kind of challenging this assumption a bit is that companies are trying to survive now, as, as Nicholas said. And, and what we see in downturns, in economic downturns, always in recessions is that investments into innovation, into research and development are one of the first things to be cut. So how can a crisis ignite innovation when at the same time we are cutting spending in the areas most relevant to innovation and to innovating in the future, especially instead of surviving today? Um, Martin, maybe you have, you have an idea of a view of how we can combine those two trends. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a great topic. Uh, and I think it's one that's been a little bit sort of stigmatized by, let's call it the market. Hi guys, the market. Uh, I love the shareholders. Uh, th these folks are our family. They are our partners uh, uh, looking forward and so on. The ecosystem of us in this together is much larger. There are the startups. There are the real partners that actually work with us, the, the, the supply chain or whatever we have around us or, and our customers. It's the academia. It's everybody that comes into your ecosystem and has something to offer and builds a relationship through that and that you are also relevant back to. It's relationships first. Services, products and features come in that pyramid much later. So design your relationships, the rest will follow. That's what I'm saying. And we need to drop this idea that how can we manage the short term versus long term thinking? Like if there was a war going on, <laughs> it's not. Uh, we developed something we call the innovation curation map. Um, it's a little bit like curating food, you can curate ideas. And I propose that we look through our business activities and business incentives. We incentivize of, on great execution. We want answers and, and hard action. We are action biased and that bias is a psychological disaster sometimes because we are biased to do things right, to execute according to plan and resources and so on. Uh, sometimes this is called the scalable efficiency or repeatable results. All sounds good and if you do it well, you will get your bonus. Amazing. However, repeatable uh, results are the diagonal opposite to innovation by definition. <laughs> so if you're in the business of repeatable design, uh, the uh, results, doing things right, you might not be doing the right things. You might just be running very, very efficiently in very wrong direction. So I encourage everybody to see that this is the same play field to do things right, and do the right things, to explore curiously, to, to understand your point of view. Is the same business as then later put it into the ground, for example, during the crisis. This is why you coach your team before you put them into a match. It's the same team. It's not versus anything. It's the same uh, ideology. So going back to purpose, uh, what is the future you see? How, what are the narratives as the second step that you can build around the future where you play a significant and positive role? Now you start to reach your strategic point of view. Once you have that, and only then, you can have a strategy. And when you have a strategy, and this is a hard body of work, to do before you go to your validate, incubate, and scale. You need that strategy. Strategy builds on visions. Visions build on your purpose and your outlooks and your visions, long, long-term visions. And that's, that's for me a one, one and one family of games and business activities, including imagination and all that. So that was my, my big manifesto here <laughs> for, for uh, long-term thinking. And short-term thinking is the true pandemic. Sticking, think, sticking with I, you first, uh, yes, Katie. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the one thing that I, I keep seeing repeatedly um, happening actually within the past few weeks that we really should take care not to do is to confuse agility and quick wins. Yeah? Because what we're a lot of, uh, oftentimes what we're doing is, okay, so this whole corona crisis there and therefore we have to react. Of course we have to react. And therefore, we're doing a lot of these workshops with clients and discussing what can we do. And oftentimes, then a lot of times within these workshops, super ideas come out, right? And these super ideas are sometimes very innovative or very disruptive. But of course, of course, if an idea is disruptive, then by definition, it is harder to implement, right? It would take more time to develop it. It would be a lot more time intensive and whatnot. And then... Oftentimes you end up thinking, ah, okay, so that's a great idea. I really like it. But now we have to react very 
agile and react very fast to this corona crisis. Therefore, we set that somehow in, in a drawer aside and hopefully not forget about it. And we do, let's, what, what are the quick wins that we can get? Let's do the easier ones first, right? And I think that's very dangerous because yes, of course, we do have to think about the quick wins and how do we get out of this, let's say slump as fast as possible. But I think the mindset um, enforcement has to keep coming from top down. I think otherwise it is never going to be possible to have both parallel work streams, right? One is to work on the quick wins, but that does not define the entirety of your agile response to Corona. You also have to start thinking now about, okay, all these innovative ideas that came up is a great opportunity and we have to start working on it as well parallel because otherwise you're never going to do it and then you're going to forget about it again and then hopefully but maybe not in a few months another crisis will come and you'll have to react again and the same story will happen so okay picking up on that and and and, and asking for the view from a well slightly larger but still a startup i guess um how do you balance this this a supposed conflict of short-term versus long-term i mean startups are by definition short-term oriented, but they have these huge goals in the future. How is that happening at N26, especially within the crisis? So generally, I would say that a crisis gets the best and the worst out of people and of companies during a crisis. And very often, what you see during a crisis and the decisions you have to take during a crisis are actually based on what you've built before. So if, you, if companies had in, have invested a lot into research and development and innovation before the crisis, then a crisis is the time when you can harvest those ideas, potentially put those in this, in past innovations or past ideas into new context, new perspective. And so many companies, companies will realize that some products they had or have already developed uh, will suddenly be useful for new customer needs and a new context. But for those companies that have already in the past tried to cut costs in innovation, those companies will also likely take the decision to cut costs during the crisis or even further cut them. And that's going to, be, that's going to backfire very fast. So at N26, we generally, we, we changed our product roadmap because of the crisis. But in fact, we, are, we just raised recently money, $100 million, to accelerate our investments into innovation. Because as a matter of fact, if you look at the, the, the past crisis, the financial crisis and the dot-com bubble in the early 2000s, Google was not one of the major, was not the largest search engine before the dot-com bubble. But it was the one company that emerged out of the crisis as one of the largest tech companies in the world. And that's going to be similar with this crisis. Some companies are going to emerge larger, stronger and larger than ever before out of this crisis. And we want to make sure that we're one of them. And that's why we invest into innovation. What we're, what we're seeing now, um, and there is a lot of examples of this, so I've, I've highlighted two, is, is these, are these super fast, super efficient developments of new products, of new strategies. There was Dyson that designed a new ventilator in 10 days. And, there was a big story in, in, in Forbes on, on, on Pfizer's CEO that's sort of staking his entire career on developing a vaccine in a couple of months. The fastest vaccine so far developed, I think, was four years in the 1950s. Um, are these moonshots, these big bets that you know, make it or break it, that sort of stake maybe even the, a company's success? Um, is that what sustainable innovation looks like? Is that what, what companies should aim for? Nicholas, what, what's your view on, on, this, on, this, on this question? Well, let's face it. I think it's more a kind of bet on the short term. Uh, it's maybe more about visibility. It's about prestige to have, of course, the one who will make the race for the vaccine until half of the year. Um, here's, of course, the question of prestige. I'm not sure it's for the long term, but I believe it's important as a... As Georg said, all companies who were not able to innovate enough or quickly enough before the crisis, who, who had too high debt or not enough cash, will disappear. It's clear. They will be replaced. They will disappear and some other will emerge. So it's interesting and Dyson is a good example. Dyson was always an innovative company. So we see now within two weeks, they were able to develop something new. It's not out of nowhere. 
So it's and either it's in your DNA and you might survive and get much bigger or you will disappear, unfortunately. And I think for many of them, many of the companies, also for our small organization, was a big change to go all home office to change a lot in our processes and a lot in our projects. So within four weeks, two to four weeks, we changed half of the organization and the projects we did. We are small, startup-like, doable. For big companies who are not used to this kind of short-term change, it will be very complicated. So I think this year we'll, we'll see an emergence of, of like innovation which are needed right now, also about representation and visibility, I'll say it again, we should not forget, uh, it's not only about 2020. You have to be innovative and agile every year and always following a sustainable vision of your company. I think that's, you, I think that's the nodding. thing that's, um, that's very important. Um, sorry. So, you know, at the end of the day, then are the big companies, the dinosaurs, like all doomed? Are they all going to die? Like there's nothing we can do anymore. So we just like give up. No, right? So... For those um, big companies that are really worried and they do also a lot, oftentimes these companies also acknowledge and realize that they are dinosaurs. They are really big. They don't know where to begin, right? They do know that there has to be something done, but where do I begin? And I think that's where agility should come in, right? The lean, whole lean startup method of if we do have an innovative idea that we can start to work on, Let's not completely make a one-year plan or a five-year plan for the development of it. Rather, let's make a small prototype that could be workable, try that out, test it in the market, test it within the organization, see if it works. If it works, great, we have a success case, and based on that, we can expand. So I think that mindset is probably, hopefully, the only thing that will really help um, the bigger companies to be able to be really agile. And that's what I mean by agility is not something that you create some sort of a project that will be done within one week, right? That's not what agility means. Yeah. How, when you talk to, to, to clients, to companies you work with, how far are we saying we like European companies maybe, um, or German speaking companies, how far are we in this change of mindset at the moment and how much work is still needs to be done? I think it really depends. Um, um, I think mostly overall, all the companies that I talk to, I see that this need for change is there. Everybody realizes that there is a need. And I think that is a huge improvement to let's say two months ago, because compared to two months ago, there wasn't even a need or not too much of a need. And now the need is there, but now therefore the next step is, okay, now what? I want to do something. I know I need to do something, but I have no idea where to begin. Right. And there you see levels of varying differences of, let's say, readiness, readiness for that. And I think that's where, you know, where we have to work on with different companies um, together. Martin, is, is SAP making moonshot bets at the moment to, you know, save, save themselves? I mean, we always do moonshots, moonshot bets. We actually call it the slingshot because <laughs> uh, all moonshots, all good moonshots are building uh, something on uh, imagination. Uh, going to the moon for John F. Kennedy. Hey guys, we're going to the moon. We're bringing a guy with us and the same guy comes back alive. And by the way, you have 10 years to buy. That is a pure fantasy. Uh, we don't have the math, the technology. We have nothing. So what you do, the first thing you do, and uh, uh, back to Catholic, I mean, how do you build, and, and back to this values, uh, your family values, your ecosystemic values. If you say something that far out on a stage, and you say 10 of these things per year, how can you <laughs> make people not only believe in that, oh, he's not crazy, he's actually trying to do great business and improve people's lives, I should go with that person. And while I met, while I met my expertise and my heart into this business will help that person actually to look better in the end of the day, because this is imagination takes you to that, uh, we call it the third horizon of innovation, and you slingshot only with imagination to the second horizon, where Yerog said, this is where you actually build the space rocket for real. The first space rocket was just imaginary, it was a VR set. Now, when you woke everybody up and they're with you because they share the values, the ecosystem, now you go to the real work and you close it to your stakeholders today because you close it to the first horizon of innovation, which is incremental battery. Eh? Second horizon of innovation, 
take that to the with, to the your ecosystem if they are convinced. And then you go to the third horizon of innovation, which is the impossible stuff. But you convinced yourself and everybody else that, damn, we will do this. That goes back to these values, and this is how we operate all the time. I mean, we've been around for fifty years, and uh, you know, at, at least in my office, we talk about what will happen in the next 50 years to the future of work? What does it mean to work and what does it mean to be human 50 years from now? Oh man, these questions, if you haven't understand why you are relevant for anybody 10 years from now, you will not be relevant for anybody 10 years from now. So start thinking about that and just confirm what you guys are saying. It's an intellectual process. It's your ideology that comes in play first. The engineering, the technology, what you can do now, 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 that's the easy part compared to, to, to that big sphere of, of thoughts that you need to have in a play. Imagination is a business activity. I would like to slowly getting to the end of, of the discussion that, that could go on for evenings, I, I, I'm guessing. Um, if we look at the future, which might be five months, might be two years, whatever you think is, is, is a relevant time, time frame, what do you think will be different after we've experienced this never before seen change of circumstances maybe? Um, what do you think, looking at innovation, looking at business, maybe also society or technology, what do you think one or two changes might be that, are, that stick with us? Will we travel less? Will we work from home all the time? Will we run around with face masks? Will we be more innovative, less innovative? What's your, what's your stance on this? Maybe Caitlin, starting with you. Um, I think definitely things like elastic working um, will definitely stay. Um, it was very interesting, alone in our office as well, um, one of our um, uh, uh, bosses said, well, you know, I actually, to be completely honest with all of you, I really don't like this home office thing. I can't concentrate at home. I'm not used to this. I really don't want to. I really look forward to the day that I can come back to the office and have, you know, coffee chats with my colleagues and see you guys in, in person. But I also realized that was really great that he asked this. I also realized that that might be, you know, a very polarizing statement, right? And so I would just like to know how many of us would still like to stay in home office even after Corona is over. Let's raise our hands. And more than half raised their hands, right? And said, you know what? Actually, we didn't know that it would be so great, but we've tried it and it really works well. We're gonna stay doing this even if there's no virus anymore, right? And he was very pleasantly surprised as well, right? Because he said, that's a great, okay, it's really great to know that this, let's say, complete other minds, our mind and opinions are there. And I think things like that, so, that's not just with working. So like with working, elastic working, we call it, but it's, you know, not only with working, instead all, let's say, new digital habits that customers have started to form. Like people are buying a lot more online. People are doing a lot of things more online, Zoom weddings and whatnot, right? All of these are scary and seem weird before you do it. But then once you start doing it and people have been doing it for the past three months, now they're used to it and they see the advantages of it. A lot of that will stay even if Corona is not there anymore. And that's what, we're, what we mean by, therefore, customers will also change their habits and therefore companies have to be able to be prepared for that. Nicholas, what do you think will change uh, in this new, new normal that, that everyone is talking about? Two points. The first one, the world is getting hybrids. As uh, Kathleen said, it's not going back to what we were before. Hopefully, it's not going to be only digital and home office. It's a bit of boring uh, with time, but I think to have the mix of a video conference, of traveling, of home office, of uh, normal office time, of digital, of physical stuff, it's definitely going hybrid. And having in one or two years ahead a video conference, maybe instead of traveling for five hours will be normal, but every second time I believe we will still travel because we are still humans and we need to meet also each other. I believe big decisions will still be taken in face-to-face. -face. As that's the first one. And the second one, it's my hope. Right now it's the priority of only a few people. I believe soon it will go back. It's just everything about the environment, about sustainability. Uh, forget just about the profit. Uh, there is more than that on earth. We see now it's a bit uh, a clash on our heads. 
And I hope most of the people, if not everyone, let's say 2021 and ahead, when the crisis is, is gone, we will think and act more sustainable and more for our environment. Yeah, your stance yeah. on the change future. Yeah. So I have an expectation and a hope. I expect that companies from now on will think digital first when they're building any product. Uh, because people realized in, in the current world, uh, when people are getting used to these new work styles, also the things that they consume need to be digital as well. A product that's only, only in the analog offline world is likely not going to have a long-term future. My hope after this crisis is that we prove there's a humanity that we're able to solve massive problems together by joining forces. And I really hope that this will also translate towards the next big and potentially even bigger challenge we're facing, which is climate change. In fact, I think engineers uh, will play a massive role in addressing also that problem. And we, as a humanity, we just need to create a sense of urgency as we did with the, the, as we realized very fast with the current crisis that we need to act fast. Um, climate change is similarly urgent. It just didn't change our behavior yet. And if we're able to, to also understand the urgency, we will be also able to, uh, to solve that challenge. Martin, same question. Yeah, uh, good one. I think we will go back to uh, many normal things that we predict the world. We will travel, we will meet in bars and, and hug each other and so that will happen. Although with the different mindsets, I think the mindset will change. We are still apes, the best apes so far, nevertheless, and a monkey. So I'm going back to the bigger picture, which is my job. Love Schopenhauer's uh, quote that talent hits the targets no one can hit, which means that you win on a market, right? I, I got this customer, I made a win, you win, you hit the target, nobody could but genius hits targets nobody can see which should suppose a question to you what did you see what was your vision so guys back to vision and this crisis should learn us one thing to take on forward uh, you need the vision to have a strategy and you need this good strategy building on your vision and your values before you go to tactics which means react on a crisis for example that's tactics uh, and i think one thing that happens not so often. We could see the future. Uh, futurism is never about predicting. It, it's about understanding the spectrum of possibilities. China gave us the future three, four, five months before Europe, before US. How did we react on actually a future that will happen to us? Well, there were different answers to that question, uh, both, both politically and, and, and uh, action-wise then Italy, then Spain, and then so on. All this, that was the future on TV, on, in broad daylight, we could understand it. I think it should wake us up. You can actually see the future or create one that you want to live in if you take these steps, if you take futurism as something that you own, that you'll be the protagonist of the futures you want to live in rather than a consumer of it. Because if you are, and if you don't digitize like here and so say and so on, you consume a future you might not like, and then might you uh, kill you if, if you wish. So be futurist, do the things, uh, do the right things before you do them right, and and have a vision. Yeah, and I think the collective optimism, you know, because we all collectively experienced um, a a crisis, and we collectively have this had this angst but now we collectively survived it. And now we all know on a collective level that it can work even when we try different things. And I think that in itself is a huge step actually for humankind um, in terms of being more, more, let's say, open to innovation. And I think that's, that really would, I think that's a great way to sort of end this discussion on a very optimistic way, um, which I totally believe in. <laughs> I, I fully agree. Thank you for, for lifting the spirits um not just towards the end of the discussion, but actually uh, throughout the discussion. Thank you everyone who, who was watching this. I hope it was interesting to you and it added value. Usually I would say, I'm sure that the speakers are around for one-on-ones. This is obviously not possible, but I would suggest if you want to get in touch with them, find them on LinkedIn and add them. Add them. I'm sure 
they would love to, to interact and connect with you guys. Um, stay tuned. There's still one and a half days of, of exciting panels. Um, and thank you, Nicolas, Georg, Caitlin, and Martin for talking about innovating during a crisis. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. So I hope you enjoyed our panel innovating during the crisis and you took some notes, you took some great input from our speakers. It is a real pleasure to, to have Klaus moderating this, so thank you again. We are continuing straight with our next event, uh, with our next session, which is actually the first workshop that we have this week and uh, actually also the only workshop we have during the life week. We are testing this format to know how you like it. So also at the end of it, please make sure you tell us how do you like it, if we should do more of these long formats, just so we know what you like and what you want to see more from us. Um, this, uh, during this workshop, it's two hour workshop, so it's really important that you're very active on Slido because the speaker would need your input, you need to know that you're understanding what she says, if you are actually uh, doing everything together with her or she needs to slow down. So you really need your input constantly and she needs it for to know how to move on with the workshop. Meredith Hassett is the one who is going to do the workshop for us and the workshop is about building your portfolio with Corvid by Wix. She is a developer advocate uh, in Corvid uh, by Wix and she works in web development. Very passionate about what she does. Let's welcome Meredith. Hi, Meredith. Welcome to the Weird Developers Live Week. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, it is a little early for me, but still ready to go. That's what exactly I wanted to say. Thank you for the sacrifice of waking up so so early. Meredith is based in San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken. So that is correct. So you can do the math and uh, know how, how early it's there for her. So as I said already, um, Encourage Meredith with your comments on, on Slido so she knows uh, she's going too fast or too slow. If you understand what's happening, be active because this really, really gives the speaker uh, the impression and the feeling that uh, has an audience, like a live audience. Um, with this being said, I'm going to give you the stage so you can actually explain to everybody what's going to happen, give your instructions, and uh, yeah, everybody else enjoy the workshop. Thank you. All right, good. I guess it's afternoon for you guys. It's nice and early morning here for me, um, but I'm still really excited. My name is Meredith Hassett. I am from Wix and I am a developer advocate for Corvid. Um, so if you've heard of Wix before, then you know it's a really awesome tool to build websites super fast. But if you haven't, then don't worry, we'll get you all set up. It's super free to get started and super easy to use. Um, and then we'll turn on Corvid, which is our development platform on top of Wix and show you how easy it is to really enhance your website with Wix. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Awesome. Yeah, and please ask questions in Slido. This is a workshop where we will be building applications using Corvid and Wix. Um, so if you get stuck at any point, please make sure to use Slido to ask those questions so I can help answer them. There is a little bit of a delay, so I will be kind of pausing at moments when we're working on the code and then checking to see if there's any questions that pop up. Um, so it is gonna be kind of go at your own pace as well. So just please make sure you ask any questions if you get stuck. So today we're gonna to be building our digital portfolio with Corvid. So as I mentioned, Corvid is a development platform on top of Wix. It is completely JavaScript based. So if you already know some JavaScript, this is gonna be awesome for you. It's gonna be super easy to pick up. If you haven't, don't worry, we have lots of instructions for you and it'll be nice and easy to learn how to do it. And hopefully you'll, you'll wanna explore more afterwards. And we're just excited to present to you how you can build an online portfolio, which is going to be really helpful if you're looking for new opportunities for work 
Um, and then also I'll talk a little bit about the opportunities for you to get work from Wix and our uh, customers at the very end of this presentation. As I mentioned, my name is Meredith Hassett. I am a front end developer by trade. I am definitely more of a visual learner. So I like being able to see my UI changes as I make them. Um, so I definitely prefer working in the UI. That being said, I don't mind the backend stuff. I just prefer integrating with it instead. I prefer using what people have already built out there to get most of the functionality I need. So, um, but this week I've been working with Twilio a lot. In this presentation, we'll be working with SendGrid. And I just love talking about how you can actually use what's already out there to enhance your UI. I also love tweeting random things. Um, so whether it's talking about cat photography, uh, vacations, when we could do those, because we're still here in lockdown in the States. Um, so I just, if you want to follow me on Twitter and ask any questions even afterwards, please feel free to reach out to me there. Or if you just want to chat, um, I love tweeting about kind of everything. So just feel free to reach out. <laughs> And, and then last but not least, I am a developer advocate for Corvid by Wix. So if that's one of the things that you want to know more about, again, feel free to reach out. Uh, I love doing developer advocacy. I love being able to be here with developers like you guys and to talk about an awesome product that's actually really super helpful um, for building websites super fast. So um, without further ado, let's dig into what is Corvid. Oh. But first, let's actually talk about what we're going to be doing today. Um, so this is a portfolio building workshop. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating an online portfolio for you to showcase your uh, resume or CV, any projects that you worked on. Because a friend of mine works in recruiting in the technical space. And what she says the main issue they have is your prizes projects are all over the place. You have a lot of really awesome work, but it's hard for them to find it. So recruiters really love having a centralized place where all your projects and uh, relevant information are. So this portfolio will really help you stand out to recruiters and make it easier for them to evaluate you as a candidate. So this is going to be really actually helpful for you to take home at the end of the day. We do have a template we'll be using, but again, this is your portfolio. So please add your own flair to it as we're going through the, the workshop. Okay, so what is Corvid? Corvid is a web development platform on top of Wix. So if you haven't used Wix before, um, you may not be familiar with the drag and drop editor. Let me just make sure that no one's asking questions as we speak. Um, cool. So Wix is a, a drag and drop UI editor. So you can drag UI components like text boxes, titles, um, really beautiful images, add parallax effect to those images. All of that comes out of the box without having to write any code. But then there are some kind of boundaries of that product. And what comes after that is Corvid. Corvid enables you to open up those boundaries and actually start working with the components on, in Wix even more in depth. So you can add dynamic functions to a bunch of different components. You can do dynamic data binding to your UI. You get access to a database as well as backend code. We're going to also give you access to uh, a Node.js server. So you can bring along all of your favorite tools from NPM and utilize those in your website. Um, we open up Wix Fetch, which we'll talk about a little bit later today. So you can um, integrate with all your ex favorite external tools as well. And it, provides a lot more power behind your Wix site. So you can do pretty much everything that you may have needed with another third party or custom plugin or a lot of custom code, which is just going to add to your maintenance headaches. We provide a lot of that for you with Corvid in a production ready environment. So you can do your deployments on the spot or delay them. Um, no productive deployment downtime, which is awesome because I personally have been on deployment calls from like midnight to 4 a.m and everything gets rolled back because something goes wrong. And it's not fun to have those really long deployment times or your website is down for that time, which is really crucial, especially right now. You wanna make sure your digital presence is always online and always up and running. So you get access to a lot of tools to make sure that your site is healthy and running well by using Corvid and Wix. So as I mentioned, it is a professional UI builder. So this is our Wix portion of it. Um, we've got a little video here showing how easy it is to add really detailed dynamic functionality to your site. Um, and this is all without code. So this is where we're going to get started today. So if you haven't used Wix before, we're going to have a few minutes to play around with it, get the look and feel, and try adding things, changing text on screens, and getting a, a nice experience with how to get started with Wix.
Beyond that, we're also going to dive into dev mode, which is how you enable Corbett on top of Wix and get access to that development platform. We're going to talk about how you can utilize data and dynamic pages within Wix. This is going to be a game changer um, with website building because a lot of the times we're, what we're seeing with people using Wix is that they have lots of different pages that they want to show. Maybe they're running a store and so they have to build a page for every single object in that store and that is a maintenance headache that is tedious and time consuming and we want to help reduce that. So similar to a lot of other um, online stores, you're going to be able to dynamically create those pages where you create a template for a page and then bind data to it to have those pages dynamically generate as you go through. And we'll also look at how we can use Corvid to make even those dynamic pages unique for each item depending on information within that item. We're also going to build an integration with SendGrid um, so you can show we can incorporate sending emails on the spot from Wix as well. And then we're going to look at some of the more fun Wix, Wix APIs that we have available as well. Um, I'm going to be referencing our API reference throughout this presentation. So that's going to be a great place to get all of the documentation about the different APIs, because I'll talk about a few of them. But we have a lot of APIs that are available. And you'll get to see a little bit of that as we work through. So basic functionality. So this is just how we're going to get started with Wix. So if you haven't already signed up for an account, we're going to take a few minutes here to sign up for an account. It is completely free. Everything that you do is going to be completely owned by you. Nothing. You're going to copy a template and it's going to be on your Wix site. Um, it's not going to be mine at all. Um, so it's going to be completely free. So we're never going to ask you for credit card information to get started here. So please don't panic. Um, it's going to be really helpful to get started um, and follow along with this workshop if you do sign up for that free account. So when we want to sign up for account, we're going to go to Wix.com, and this is all we need to sign up. Um, you can also use Facebook or Google if you prefer. So at this point, I'm going to pause for a few seconds to enable you guys to do this. If you to sign up for a Wix account, um, again, it's going to just be Wix.com. So let me pull up um, a new window here. And show you guys how to do that. And then I'm going to pause for a few seconds just so you guys can uh, sign up for your account. So I'm already logged in on my browser here. So I'm just pulling up an incognito window. Hopefully, you guys can still see that. Um, and all you have to do on the Wix site when you go to Wix.com is go ahead to that sign in button. And if you don't already have an account, um, go ahead and create one here or use Facebook or Google. And I already have an account. So if I go to Wix on my site, I'm going to automatically be taken to my entire list of sites that I have already created. Um, so if you already have an account, you'll go, you'll end up here. If you don't, um, we'll take a few seconds to do that now. And then let's see if there's any questions. Okay, so there is one question about creating mobile applications. Well, we aren't gonna be talking about that exactly today. Um, I can point that out in the Wix editor. So do I have, if I pull up um, our site that we're gonna be working on today. So this is the editor, a little sneak preview. Um, you'll be able to access this in a second yourself too. Give it a second to load. I think my internet's also asleep just like I am. <laughs> um, so as you'll notice on the Wix editor, once it loads here, we have a desktop icon at the top of the screen and a mobile icon at the top of the screen as well. So in the Wix traditional editor, this is how you would actually create a mobile application. So it is mobile friendly out of the box, but if you prefer to customize the mobile experience, go ahead and switch to mobile. And then you can 
start moving things around. So maybe you don't like the layout, you don't want certain things to show up on mobile. Um, you're able to move this around and it doesn't actually impact. Like, so in this case, there's a huge amount of white space. So let me see if I can grab that. And I wanna like get rid of that. Um, it's not actually gonna impact my desktop application. We are storing them completely separately. Um, so you're actually able to modify the mobile application if you need to. But again, it is going to be mobilized and mobile friendly out of the box, but it is not a native app. It is still gonna be a web app. Any other questions? All right. So once we have our accounts here, I've got my coffee. Hmm. There we go. Thank you, Google Slides. Um, so once we have our account here, um, we are going to start by using a template to build our application. So this is gonna make it easier so you don't have to add all the components and all the pages together. Um, we're gonna just create a nice, we have a nice little template for you here to get started. So um, if you go, if you are watching this later or you get lost at any point, we are gonna be following along with my colleague Joshua's portfolio workshop that he built for some boot camps here in the US. Um, he was kind enough to let me borrow it. He is my counterpart. He's based in New York City and he did a bunch of other workshops this week. So I am taking on the portfolio workshop today. Um, so if you do get lost at any point, there are step-by-step -step instructions on this GitHub. There's a bunch of readme so you can follow along with the steps and we'll be using them throughout the workshop today. So feel free to use that at any point. If A, you are watching this later or B, um, you get lost as we're going through this because we are going to go, I'm going to pause after we work through each step so you guys can um, build the components that we we're talking about in that step. Um, so if you are taking maybe a little bit of a bio break or need to grab a water and come back, um, you'll be able to follow along pretty nicely with the GitHub steps as well. For the template, I have a link here. Um, oops. It is also in the GitHub too. So if you are not able to access it, um, the link is in the GitHub. So if I click the template, what it's gonna do is it's gonna open the Wix editor and create a copy of that template in my Wix web or my Wix account. So it's just creating a copy there. Again, if you don't, um, if you aren't able to click that link, I'll go back to it in two seconds. It is going to be available um, in this portfolio workshop GitHub. So if you're looking at it from the GitHub, go to the step-by-step -step instructions area and go to this template. So this is that link oopsies, for the template. Make sure you guys can get access to that. <laughs> I can just pour coffee in my Wi-Fi router and that'll make it faster. Is that how I get faster internet? All right, I'm going to ask, um, did everyone, is everyone able to access the template? If someone could respond in Slido, that would be super helpful. I want to make sure you guys aren't stuck. Awesome. Okay, so I'm getting a yes, a couple of yeses. Awesome. Sweet. 
So if you have access to that template, you'll see it looks exactly kind of um, like maybe this one, but this one is a little bit more personalized to me because I built my portfolio. You'll be able to see this is our Wix editor. So you can see you have access to menus and pages. So this is where you can control what, like what Google is seeing for their SEO search engine optimization. You can add additional pages here, reorganize them, um, show hide what's in the menu. So maybe I'm not really ready to showcase my blog just yet. So I can actually go to settings and hide this from my menu and it'll disappear up here in that corner. I don't know if you saw that. So it's show hide in that menu. Um, so if there's anything that you don't want publicly accessed without someone knowing the direct URL, you can change that. You can also set up member pages. So in this case, member, we have a members area. So do we want people who have accounts on my site to be able to access all of the pages? You can control those settings here as well. Uh, we've got background. So maybe you're not into this white background and you want to add something more exciting, like you want bananas, um, you're building a snowboarding site, uh, some out like a plant site, you can change the page backgrounds and apply it to all other pages here. And let me actually go back to the home page as well. So I can navigate between my different pages here as well. So using that site menu. And then if I want to add new UI components, I um, go to this third plus, and there's a whole bunch of designs that we can already add to our page right away. Um, so it's super easy if you want to add a contact form. We've got pre-built contact forms here. You need to add your social icons. So add your GitHub links, add your Twitter account, add um, your external blogs that maybe you're working on. You're able to add those social bars really easily, um, different boxes. So if you want to break up your page and have the elements be visually different, interactive components. So do you need one of those moving sliders on your page that kind of has a couple different slides that showcase different features? Uh, just some pictures or icons. So maybe I need to add my um, personal icon. So let's see, let's say this is my logo. I can just drag and drop it on the page. And now I have that UI element on my screen and I can move it around. So maybe I actually want it here or maybe I just actually would just want it on the page here. And then we're also starting to see some of these grid lines come up too. So you can attach it to different centering or left or right aligned components on the screen too. So this is really helpful for making sure that things are not all over the place on your page. Um, so maybe I want this since it's the logo with this text to center a line with this text here. So I'll look for that for that's the column. So let me find the one for the text. Had it two seconds ago. There's a lot of elements on the page. There it is. Um, so then that way it's always going to be center aligned. So even as a user who's coming to your page maybe has a smaller screen or larger screen, as that page responds to screen size, the images will make sure and the images and text will make sure that they stay aligned. Cool. All right. Awesome. You guys are getting to the template, great. So we're actually just gonna take a few minutes here to customize this page. So right, as I mentioned, this is a template so you can customize it as much as you want. So before we get to the coding, let's take a few minutes just to make this our own as well. So this is gonna be your resume. So the way we do this is we go ahead and click on the items and what it's gonna enable us to do is um, access, like edit the text, Maybe over here, this is a background image. So I want to change the back column background to be my screenshot. So let me do that. So I want this to be an image. This will bring up the Wix Media Manager. So this is a great to store images that you maybe need across your site. And um, we also have a lot of awesome out of the box images here too as well. Looks like paintball is really popular right now and golf. I guess people are excited to start doing activities again. Um, or you can upload your own media from diff different external sites or your, just your computer. So I have my headshot stored on my computer. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my headshot. There it is. And I'm going to upload it. While this is uploading, let's see any questions.
All right. So now that it's uploaded, um, I can also adjust it at this point too. So maybe I want to crop it a little bit more. Maybe I want to cut out the background. So let me do that. So it creates a really cool effect on the page. Um, so the background's gone. Um, if you want to add any text or overlays, or maybe I want to add a new custom background. They've got like a cool space one. Nah. Okay. But yeah, or filter it. So maybe it's like, oh, hmm. A little cleaner. That one looks nice. So let's go ahead and then we can save that and then it'll actually create a copy for us of that new enhanced image. Cool. So you always have access to the original and the copy that we just created. So I'm going to go ahead and change background. And now that's me. You can also add cool effects here, here. So if you go to settings, it's gonna actually open up some more um, deep advanced settings for the image. So maybe I want it to be a little see-through. I can change the opacity. I can um, add different scroll effects. So without any coding, you can add a parallax effect to an image, which is awesome. That's super awesome. Um, I can have it zoom in, fade out. I can have it tile. So maybe I just want a lot of knees showing up. Oh, oh, this image is really big, so that doesn't work as well. Okay, <laughs> let's just stick with that. Um, but yeah, so maybe if you want to create a tile effect, you can do that here as well. So you, there's a lot of ways to customize the components on the page too. Um, one of the other big ones to not forget is this up here at the top. Don't forget to add your name because this is now your portfolio. So this is a group. So we have a couple different text elements in here. So we're able to group and ungroup elements. Um, so this is nice because now that they're grouped, if I move them around, they'll go together versus if they're ungrouped, if I start, well, I have them both selected. If I start moving one, they will no longer move together. So I want to keep these groups. So I'm going to shift select both group elements and that creates that nice little intro. I'm going to edit my name. that one. So we're going to edit text here. Add my name. There she is. Keyboard is asleep too. Awesome. And then you also see this whole text settings. Oops, I also can't spell my name. <laughs> um, so if you want to change the heading, so this is going to be again helpful for SEO friendly, like you want to make sure that the right things are marked heading one. So you're getting those H1 tags that um, Google is looking for. You can change the font as well. So we're using the Poppins font on this site, but if that's not for you, there's a whole slew of other options of text. And you can also add languages as well. So I'm an English speaker, so I'm gonna stick with English, but maybe if you're not an English speaker, you can add additional languages too. Um, bold, italicized, kind of all those standard uh, colors, effects as well. So maybe I wanna create a cool, oops, I actually need to select. I want to create like a cool effect. So there's a lot of ways to customize different components on the screen too, just by using the standard editor here. Cool. So yeah, make sure you change your name, maybe upload a new image. Um, you can add some technologies that are interesting to you. So there's a lot of opportunity to customize this and make this your own. I'm not going to spend too much time here updating it. Um, cause again, this is yours. And so you'll have access to it even after this workshop to make sure that it's all of your information on this screen. But just, if you want to take a few minutes to add a few things that are yours, cause, uh, maybe we can share with each other at the end of this workshop and show the awesome things that each other did. And then I'm also going to check for questions. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to make some updates here. Um, awesome. Do you have a question about reusing elements or blocks? Do you want to save them as a template and inserting them to other pages? Yes. So um, you can save your designs. So maybe I really like the way that this text looked. So I can actually um, create, like, save designs. 
so I can save to my designs. So then that element is going to be a reusable design component. Um, again, this is also a template. So right, like we built this application already before, saved it as a template and then shared it with all of you. So you can also create entire websites that are templates and users can fill in too. So there's a couple of different ways to make it more reusable um, if you do need to create a more templated design or custom components like this. So yeah, so you just save to my designs and then you're actually able to access in that plus at the very bottom, my designs. And now it's there and I can add a new one to the page. Um, I mean, I guess on this page, I could just also have copy pasted, but if you want it for other um, sites beyond this one, then if you save it to my designs, you have access to that repository. Can you place an image on top of another image? Um, so there is layering, right? So this image is, um, I said the background. So I can actually, let me see. There is layering available. Is there, let me, is there a better example to show this? Um, so I guess like it, the images work the same way as a lot of the other components on the screen too. So you are able to, as I mentioned, like change the opacity of images. So if you do need to layer them, you can do that. Um, there is also some design options here. So these interactive components, we also have hover boxes. So if you need to have a non-hover state and a hover state to show hide maybe two different images that does come out of the box functionality here. Um, if we look at like this container box, this container box has text in it and a button. And so those are all kind of layered on top of each other. And if we right click, we can actually arrange that. So we can bring it to front, send it to back. Um, so using the properties as well as the opacity settings of an image, you can layer them on top of each other and create a more dynamic image or like a more layered image if that's what you're after. Um, in this case, I'm not 100% sure what's going to happen if I do layer something on top of it because it is a background as opposed to a um, image. So let's say if I drop this on here, can I? So I can see all the overlapping things as well. So we're sitting on top of a column, strip, and page. So you're able to kind of see the stack that is there. We're able to. Uh, but no, I can't send back because it is, it is the top and that is a background. So all of those are going to always sit underneath it. Uh, but then if we add another one and then maybe in the settings oops, or the design, so I changed the opacity. So we are able to have those directly on top of each other like that. Um, so you can play around with the opacity there to also use different images. Feels easier to code using a UI library kit than drag and drop in a line items. Is it a UI component? There is not currently an external UI library for components for Wix. Um, one of the things that we see a lot in with this is um, that a lot of agencies actually have designers in-house and developers in-house and so designers will actually build out these designs on the page so they'll create that template and then the developers can add in that custom logic and cu custom functionality um, one of the nice things that we like the reason we kind of black box it off a little bit is because it does provide a lot of functionality it is mobile friendly out of the box so you don't have to actually worry about developing your components for mobile and testing it on mobile it'll look really nice um, out of the box but as i showed you can move things around um, and then also we don't want to break your css on your page and make sure everything kind of styles nicely still 
so the the components are on the black boxier side um, so we don't currently have an external library to get to those components but we do have internal proprietary apis to interact with those components um, and they are looking at opening up apis as well but right now everything is proprietary All right, so if you've had some time to make some UI changes onto your page, um, we're gonna move on to customizing some features, which actually we've already done. So again, if you haven't already maybe played around with some of those advanced settings within the different elements, um, there is a lot of opportunity to add additional complexity without actually, actually ever coding. Um, another thing that maybe is kind of confusing is that, like this is pretty, designed uh, and so maybe you don't need something this aggressive um, there is a lot of functionality out of the box that you don't need to like redesign so if this is feeling like really a lot of components on the screen there are ways to make sites significantly simpler as well and i mean i have another resume that um, i'm building for another boot camp that took five minutes to design. So just that is that level of layers on your page is just dependent on what you kind of want your screen to look like. And maybe if you have an in-house designer or not. Um, so now we actually are ready to start adding some code to our page. So we want to turn dev mode on. Back in the Wix editor, you may have noticed that there's this top menu bar. So if you ever accidentally maybe like this pane here for the tools for the items. If you accidentally close that, you can actually go back to the tools and add that toolbar back in. If you want to see some rulers or grid lines, um, you can show hide those as well. The other one right next to that is dev mode, and this is how we get to Corbin. So if I turn on dev mode, all of a sudden I'm going to get a couple new panes on my screen. Um, on the left side here, you're going to see the site structure. So I'm actually able to see all of the pages that are actually um, within my page site as well. So I can update those now. So this is how I can navigate to different pages. So if I want to add or update any pages, I can do that and then add additional pages here as well. I am also able to access the back end of my site now. So I can start adding some web modules here, which we'll do a little bit later. So if you need to access add any, uh, if you need to access your back end of your website, it is right here. It's in one place. There is no setup or routing between the two that you need to worry about. You have access to all of that right here out of the box. We also have our node modules so we can install new packages really nice and easily. Um, so later on we'll be using SendGrid. So we can find the SendGrid package and install. And now I have access to the SendGrid NPM module. We also have access to databases. So we don't have to do any um, external hosting of our databases. We don't have to do any maintenance of our databases. We can actually just create or an, any tunneling to our site. We can just create a database here and be able to utilize it on the page pretty seamlessly, which is actually where we're about to head. So let's talk about data and dynamic pages and how to create a database collection so the database you're getting it's going to look very relational and very like mysql -y, but it's actually a mongodb so if you've used mongo before it's just a different presentation of mongo and it's also going to be helpful too so if you are working with different people to provide your cms um, this is actually going to make your website a little bit more on the headless side too so you can do your cms management and maybe you can export it to excel and have your content person manage the content elsewhere, or just for you as a developer, if you need to reuse it on different pages, using that those database collections are gonna make it simpler for data management for you as well. So back into the site editor. Um, so at this point in the, in the workshop, if you are following along in the GitHub, we are in the first module here, creating a database collection for projects. So we have dev mode on, we're looking at the database area and we're gonna actually create a new collection. So let's go ahead and create a new collection. And let's go ahead and call it projects. 
So this is going to be a lot of the projects, that, like our work projects that we've worked on that are maybe in GitHub or elsewhere. Um, this is exactly where you can actually start setting view level permissions for the database as well. So in this case, if it's anyone who just wants to be able to see the content, you can make it site content. If it's you want anyone to be able to submit content, you can make it a form submission. So maybe you want people to sign up for your newsletter um, or send you some feedback. You can control whether it's read only or write only right at the get go of creating the database collection. Um, maybe it's internal only, so only you as an admin can use it. So you don't want to expose that to your users. You want it to be member content, so only people who have actually signed up for accounts can get access to it. Um, so there is a lot of control already at this level, but once you actually create the collection, your control gets even more granular. And then when you start utilizing the data on the page, again, you have another le level of granularity of control on who can do the reads and writes. So I'm going to also, I'm going to leave it as um, site content because it is going to be for display. And we're going to get taken to a very kind of Excel-y experience here where we have um, all of our titles, of our columns and then all of our rows, which are going to be our data elements. Uh, we have a pre built here as well, but if you want to edit any fields or if you're missing any ones, so you want to make sure that you have enough fields to cover the different parts of the project that you want to showcase. So we get a title field by default in our collection, and that is going to be your primary key. So if I look at manage fields, I can see my primary key for my database. Um, if you want to change it to something else, you cannot change it to system ones and you cannot change it to images. It has to be a string. So I can make that my primary as well, but I'm just going to leave it as the title of my project. So we're going to add a couple fields here. So if you don't already have it, uh, make sure you add a description field, an image field. So this can be like a screenshot of your application, um, a tags field. So that is one of the data types that we have. Oh. Yeah, so we have a whole bunch of data types here as well. So we've got image fields, address fields. So this is also going to help provide data integrity out of the box as well. You can have audio, you can have date times, URLs. Um, and another one of those oopsies that we're going to use is tags. And that tags is going to enable us if I added a new one. So I'm working on a sustainability site. It is a uh, website for aggregating sustainable retailers and home goods. Um, this it uses Corvid. I'm able to select tags that I've already used, and it uses JavaScript. And it also maybe I want to incorporate um, that it uses third-party integration, so I can add a new tag right out of the box like that. Integrations. And then I can also add the, those same tags to a different ones as well. So you can auto-create tags as you're working through it and then reuse them in other rows in your database. So go ahead and make sure that you have at least these one, two, three, four, five, six um, elements, your columns in your database. So that is going to be step number five here. And then once you've created those, you can also go ahead and add your own elements to that collection too. So go ahead and maybe add one or two to your collection just so we have something we can work with. And make sure you add tags too, because that'll be crucial for a little bit later. And while you guys are doing that, I'm going to take a look at your questions.
right, so hopefully you've been able to create at least one row in that database and have all your fields in your database. Um, make sure again that you have some tags incorporated into your one at least one of the rows in your database because we are going to be using them to do some filtering a little bit later on. Um, but if you haven't done that already, again, we're going to be pausing throughout this so you can add it as you are going through. The next thing I want to talk about is dynamic pages and presenting the data on the screen. So we just created a database collection and now we can actually drive page creation without rebuilding the wheel every single time using dynamic pages with these data collections that we just created. So you're able to connect data to UI elements on the screen. If I look at, um, I close this, and if I look at my UI elements, if you click on one, um, let's see, let's see. Oh, they changed the icon on me. <laughs> so yesterday it looked like a database. Now it looks like this little squiggly line. Um, so you're actually able to connect to data to any UI element on the page. Um, so we're able to create a database connection on the fly just like that um, using no code. And what this does is it's going to create a data set where a data set is a object on the page that's hosting um, your data page. So you can choose how many items you want to display on the screen. So and if that data collection is really large, you want to make sure for your page performance that you're not bringing the entire database with you, right? Like you only want to bring a subset of elements. So you can page it to 10 items, 12 items. Um, the default for Wix data sets is 12. And so you can control the actual data on the page without lugging along your entire database with you because we know that doesn't help performance. So adding a data, connecting to data on your page creates a data set that is the data on your page that you can utilize. It's again, not the whole database collection. With that, um, it's going to be either read only, write only, or read write. So again, this is that an additional level of granularity that we can add to our data on our page where maybe we have a read write database, but we only want users to be able to read on this page and maybe write on another page. It's also helpful for working with the data because um, maybe you have a read only section and a write only section and you don't want people manipulating the two. So you can utilize read data sets and write data sets to make sure that you're not accidentally overwriting data and you're updating and refreshing data and displaying it properly. Um, so you're able to actually control the level of granular granularity of data access even at the data set level, which is a subset of your data collection. So we can go ahead and add dynamic pages on our screen by if we go to our projects database and we're going to click this gear icon here, we can add a dynamic page. And this will automatically create those pages for us. Awesome. So over here, you'll see we have the uh, projects page, which I'll have our dynamic pages for us. And um, it'll, it creates this object called a dynamic data set. And what a dynamic data set is, it's an automatically filtered object for the page. So as you can see up here, I'm seeing like a little bit of a, a slider. And this is how I can actually iterate through the different items in my database. So I can see what, what that different dynamic database or data set looks like at that level. Um, you should also have an all one as well, which I don't. So what I can actually do really simply is if I remove these, so I can really easily remove those dynamic pages and go back here, redo that step. Um, so what it, it should be creating out of the box, if you don't see all in title, you can just go ahead and delete those and recreate that dynamic data set. And what this will do is it actually um, creates a, a landing page for all of the objects in the database. 
So this isn't going to, this is going to be a, oops. Yeah, so on the title one, it's going to be a pre-filtered based off of the title in the URL. So this is that key to determine which item we're looking at in the database. The all one is going to be the complete list of objects that you have in your database. And so again, we have a dynamic data set that is pointing to, oops. So if we look at the settings, it's pointing to that project, it's going to be read only, and we're limiting the number of items to display on the screen. So if you haven't already created your dynamic page, go ahead and make sure those are set up. I'm going to check for any questions while we're making sure everyone has their dynamic pages. And again, if you are lost in what we're doing here, um, we are now on module number two, dynamic pages. So just go ahead and click that link and you're able to uh, um, see the instructions on how to create a dynamic page. And I'm going to pause here for any questions on that. All right, so uh, this has all been drag and drop so far. Um, so we actually wanna start getting to some coding. So what we're gonna do, if I go back over here, is we're gonna start adding some filtering to our page. And this is where we're gonna introduce the $W selector. And so this is how you select different elements on the page for Wix. So this is a UI API. Um, it's only available on the front end of Wix sites. And what it does is it enables you to get access to different elements on your page using the um, pound ID of the element on the page. And then it opens up the properties as well as any events that are available for that element. So it, this makes it really easy to get and set values on pages. So maybe with a text input, we can grab the value of that text value input and um, also update it using the getters and setters kind of out of the box with the Wix selector API. And so if you wanna dig more into the available selectors, we I do have the Wix, um, oopsies, the API reference, oopsies, the API, the little zoom bar keeps getting in my way. Go back up. <laughs> Um, so we do have an API overview and reference. You can look at the Wix editor elements selector and see all of the different Wix elements and how you can interact with them. Um, their different properties, the different functions available on top of them. Um, and just like dive into and get some more additional code snippets on how to interact with those elements too. So this is a really great resource for learning more about the Wix selector API if you're curious about what you can do with all the UI elements on the page. That does also open up events. So this is buttons. So buttons out of the box, this is especially helpful on buttons. Um, so buttons out of the box do have a set of available events with Wix, but if those list of events is not sufficient. You do have access to the on-click event for buttons and for many other UI elements on the page. So you can actually create your own unique experience for what those elements do when they are clicked, which we're actually gonna look at today. Um, so the, the main one we're gonna look at is on-click um, and then we're not gonna be doing it with a button, we're actually gonna be doing it with a selection tag. And again, this is the link for the um, Corvid reference if you do ever need to reference kind of what we're looking at today. So if I go, I'm gonna go back to the GitHub so you guys know what step we're on now. Um, we're going to 
add a selection tag element to the page. And this is gonna be what we're gonna utilize for filtering on our page. So make as I mentioned, we may wanna make sure that we have tags in our database. And it's gonna be important for setting up uh, this filtering with the tags list. So I'm gonna go back to the editor. I'm gonna make sure I'm on my projects all page. And I'm going to add in a input which is also a new area. So if you may notice, um, when we didn't have dev mode on, input was not an option here. It is now an option, <coughs> which enables us to create custom forms as well. So I'm gonna go input. I am going to go selection tags, selection tags. And I'm gonna select, I like this one, so I'm gonna go and grab that one. You can grab whichever one because again this is your page um i'm going to center align it on my page or maybe yeah there it is and i'm able to actually manage the choices here for time's sake we're just going to manually add them but you can also um use wix data which we'll talk about in a, a minute to query your database and get the distinct values of tags to automatic automatically populate this list as well but for simplicity purposes, we're just going to um, manage this right now. So I'm going to add in my some of the tags that I know exist already in my database. So one of the, what we're doing right now is we are going to our we're going to add or update the tag values to match what we have here in our tags um, column in our database. So I'm going to add like Corvid JavaScript SQL to this list. So I can go ahead and edit label and then JavaScript. And then I want to also edit my value to say JavaScript. So that's what the value that's going to be passed when we're doing the actual filtering. And then this one can be Corvid. If I can spell, and I'm gonna make this one something that's not in my list, just so we can see it. Um, I'm gonna name it coffee because it's all that's on my mind right now. <laughs> Other than teaching you guys Corbett. So cool. So go ahead and make sure you update that list of choices here. Um, as I mentioned, you can also dynamically create it. So I'm gonna switch over to the reference for a second. And if we go to this, the reference and find that selection element, selection tags, we do have access to the options. So as you can see here, we do have access to the getters and setters for the options. So you can actually dynamically also create that list in code too, if you don't wanna, um, have to do the, the tag maintenance on the page itself. Again, this is also helpful for re, reuse. So if you add anything new and you want that tag list to be updated and correct, right? So if I misspell anything right now, um, it's not gonna filter properly. So if you do it actually in code, you can make sure that you're getting the proper list with everything spelled correctly so your filtering will work. And it'll also, automatically update based if anything new does come available in the list as well. So it's really simple to do it in code too, um, but just for time purposes, we're gonna use the in-page editor. So that is, if you are following along in the GitHub, we are on step number two here. And I'm going to pause to get a sip of water because I'm losing my voice and answer, see if you guys have any questions. Yes, now we're getting into the, the fun stuff. It's only gonna get more technical from here. All right. So if you've added some um, tags, you don't have to fill them all in and you can delete those items as I did and make a really nice short list. 
Um, Cause again, all of this will be available to you even afterwards. If you want to add more complicated functionality or additional tags, you can get access to all of it, but we're going to keep moving along. So we want to actually create a um, new text item called no results. Text, so this will happen if you filter and nothing comes back. So users know. Oops, and one other thing I want to talk about before we move on, actually, I forgot to do this. Um, so one of the new things that you may have noticed that pops up is this new properties pane where you can actually have these hidden or collapsed on default um, and then and the different events that are available for that UI element. Um, another thing you'll see here is that ID. And as I mentioned with the $W, you are going to be using that to select different elements on the screen with this ID that you now have access to. One of the key things you want to do here to, for code maintenance and for your own sanity is to make sure you give these meaningful names. Um, so this one is a little bit more obvious, but as you work with different pages, if you have a bunch of different text elements on that page and you can't actually find anything, it's going to be really hard for you to know if you're trying to update text one or text 101. Um, so it's going to be important to give these elements meaningful names so it's simpler for you to interact with them. So make sure you have that updated to a name that you're going to remember. We're also going to add in a text element here. So let's go ahead and add, um, this is going to be our C, text 30. Like, what does that mean? That's not helpful for me when I'm actually doing my coding. So this is going to be our no results text. And it's going to say no results. And the other thing we're going to do here is we're actually going to have it hidden on load. We only want to show this if there is actually no data to show, which we're going to be doing with code. So once you create your no results text, so again, remember, or sorry, no results found is the ID we're going to use here. Now we can start working with the API. So we're going to be talking about the Wix data API. So the Wix data API, this is how we import APIs from Wix. Um, Cause again, we want our sites to be light. So if we had every single API available, that's gonna be a lot of stuff to carry around with us. So to utilize Wix data, we're just gonna import Wix data from Wix data. Um, and this gives us access to working with the collection. And then we can start doing different events on it. So we're gonna add an asynchronous query to our uh, database where we're gonna query on that collection name, which is gonna be projects. So we're going to go back over to the GitHub. We have the code snippets all written for you here. So it's really nice and simple. So the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we're getting that Wix data API. So um, we're going to now go into this text editor. So if you don't already have the text editor open, if you click on that bottom bar, that'll pop open your IDE. Let me try to find the edge. And then I can make it a little bit bigger too, so you guys can see this. Um, so I'm just going to start by importing my data. If you want to see everything else that you can import, if you just start typing import, there is a lot of autocomplete here. And you can see the whole list of APIs that are available for you to work with as well. We're going to work with some more later. But for now, we're just going to start with Wix data. The other thing we want to do is define some constants. So we're going to define a constant for our database collection. I'm going to actually make sure I get this right. And um, a constant for our field to filter by. So this is going to be important to pay attention to what you've actually named your database and your field in your database. So your collection name is going to actually be that database name. So if you do not name it projects, make sure you update projects to be whatever your database name actually is. Additionally, the field to filter by is going to come from your database as well. So if you did not name the tags field in your database tags, if you go to that database, so if I click on that, Go to that field where you have those tags and look at the properties for that field and grab that field key because this is the field that we're going to use to do the filtering on. So that is the value that we want here in the field to filter in collection value. So make sure that value matches that property of that field in your database as well.
So when the page is ready, it's going to trigger the $w.onReady function, and we're going to be able to load data to our repeater. So if you don't already have a repeater on your screen, we're just going to stub it out here. Um, we're going to make sure that we have a repeater on the page. Um, so mine is a little funky. It's here somewhere. There it is. Um, but it doesn't actually have any elements in it. So I'm actually going to replace this with a different repeater, but I still want to make sure it's called list repeater. Um, so if yours is a little funky like mine, don't worry. It's super easy to add a new one. So go ahead to your add button. We're going to go to lists and grids, and this is our repeaters. So these are these elements that respond really nicely to data in your database. You can pick whichever one suits your fancy. I like this one, um, or actually I like this one today. This is my mood. I'm going to add it to the page, and then I can also, again, align it up on the screen. I do want to send it back because I want that no results text to show over it when um, if there are no results found. So I'm actually going to send it to back. Yeah, cool. And that no results text, make sure it's, it's on top, which it is because I can't actually move it any form or forward. And then I'm, I'm going to, oops, I lost my properties panel. Um, I need to rename my repeater to, from repeater one. So if you lose your properties panel, don't worry. It's really easy to get it back. There's two ways. Um, if you right click, view properties, that'll bring it up. The other way to do it is also go to tools. You now have your developer tools and go to that properties panel and make sure that is named list repeater and make sure it is connected to data. So this is going to be connected to that project's data set on our page. Um, and we want them and we can connect different text elements to different um, we do the labels connected to title. So you can connect the different elements. It's really easy to connect data elements to that page. That image is going to come from our image. Um, and that should be good. Yeah, that's enough. Cool. So now we have actually a repeater on our page that we can interact with. So we're going to start. Um, and then the next thing we need to do is to enable filtering is we actually need to um, enable an on change event for the tags. So in this, we're going to add this on change event. And what this does is again, so this tags is coming from the ID of that selection tag. So if you did not name it tags, make sure you update it here. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to get the value of what is already selected in that. So as you select items in your selection tags list, it's going to update the uh, property value. And we want to grab that array and pass it to our load data to repeater. So what we're going to, what this means it's going to do is when the page is ready, we're going to load all of our projects to our page. And then as a as we click on our selection tag list to start doing our filter, we are going to utilize that to actually get the value of tags and pass that to our load data to repeater. So it's going to refresh the data on our page. Cool. So once you have those code stubs added to your page, we're ready to actually build out that load data to repeater function. So we're going to move on to the find your projects module. I'm going to pause here for a second just to see if there are any questions and if you need to catch up. Can you also save JavaScript snippets as templates? Um, in this case, no, you cannot. One of the things that you can do is um, we have a, a app builder, which enables you to create um, different apps for pages. So that is one way if you have like really complex functionality that you want to expose and reuse on different pages, um, you can create an app that you can reuse on different projects that you have within Wix, but you cannot currently save JavaScript snippets as uh, templates. I just opened my old projects and steal the code snippets from them. 
that's how I used <laughs> I create my templates. All right, moving right along. We are going to start adding data to our project. So we actually need to create that load data to repeater function. So we've got our code stub here. And we're going to place that outside of the on ready function. Um, there's also a question about importing other libraries as I want. So there, the limit on libraries is what we have available from our own NPM store. We have a certain number of them currently whitelisted because we know that they, they work nicely, but that list changes every single day and is constantly expanding. And if something in the node modules is not currently available, you can request it and then you can import and work with those. Um, as far as things that you can import and uh, work with on the front end or libraries you can import and work with on the front end, it is going to be limited to only Wix modules. Um, you cannot just import any library. Um, okay, so back to our load data to repeater function. So this is where we actually are going to start querying for data from our database. So we're going to use that Wix data dot query. So the way that works is when, yeah. So we want data query. So we're going to define a variable here and then we are going to use that Wix data API. One of the nice things is because we only let you use Wix APIs, um, we have autocomplete for all of them as well. So I can see everything that I can do with a Wix data API and there's a lot of functions here. So we're actually going to use the query function. Um, so we've got some nice autocomplete. So if I would start typing that also filters down and then collection name, which is actually what we've already named our variable here. So we can just say, yep, um, collection name is what I want to do. So that is how we start a query. We have not run the query yet, but this is how we start building a query. We can also add here additional things. So there's, um, you can add, start doing some filtering, start searching for um, distinct properties, make sure that a field name equals. So there's a lot of different opportunities to build your query out here. And you can make really complex queries actually with all of, with, with the Wix data queries. In this case, what we wanna do is we wanna use that selected category to determine um, if we need to filter. So I'm gonna grab this because it's already pre-written for me and I like being lazy. Uh, and so we're gonna build off that Wix query and we're gonna see how many tags match or how many of the tags match. So when we say has all, we can have multiple selections within this tag. And so if I select both JavaScript and Corvid, I want to show only the projects that have both JavaScript and the Corvid tag associated to them. So if it only has one of those tags, I don't want to see it. I want to see all of them that have both. So we're going to um, pass in also the field that we want to filter on. So that's what this field to filter on constant is going to give us. So that's why it's important to make sure it matches the actual field in your database. And then we're going to use that selected categories array that we're passing in or um, auto assigning to an empty array if nothing is passed in. Cool. So that is step number two. If you're following along in the GitHub, step number three is where we're actually going to execute, execute the query and assign the data to the repeater. So if I grab this fun code snippet, what we're going to do here is we're going to just pop it in. And so once that query is built out with any additional filters or functionality we want to run on top of it, we can then go ahead and call dot find and this will actually run our query. Dot find, um, or sorry, dot find, not find, <laughs> uh, is a promise. So when it returns, we want to get those results and bind them to our repeater. So we can get the items from the results and set the data value for the list repeater. So again, rip, oops. When we go to dollar w, if we look at that, oops, list repeater, we can get all of the properties that we can get and set or just evaluate, um, and as well as the different events too. 
So in this case, we're just setting that data value. So it updates to that query, that new query list. And then the last thing we want to do here is based off of how many items are actually returned, we want to show hide the um, no results text that we created earlier. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a, a new function to determine if the repeater is empty. If it is empty, we want to show that no results found. Otherwise, we want to hide it. Um, so in certain cases, in this case, we have it overlaid. So we're just going to, we can just do show hide. If you have it, um, a section that you want to show hide that is actually going to change the page structure. So if this was actually, if the repeater was underneath this and the text was kind of creating this blank white space, if it's not being shown, you can actually use the collapse and expand functionality instead. So what we could do here is um, if I open up my properties panel again, so tools properties panel, I can do collapsed instead. And so then it'll fold it. And um, this would then be instead of show hide. Instead, we would want to do expand and collapse. So it depends on your UI need on the page. Um, if it's an element kind of blocking off white space and when it's not being shown, then you would want to use expand and collapse. Otherwise, show hide if it's overlaid. And this is how we're going to see data on our page. So at this point, we can actually, if we go to preview, this is actually going to take us to our QA environment, for lack of better terms. And we'll be able to see all of our projects on the page. So these are my different projects that I have in my database. Cool. And then if I start filtering, so if I want my coffee, no results. If I want my JavaScript ones, JavaScript's not good because I think we have that in everyone. So let's say Corbin. Um, so Corbin, there's only two, right? So if I add JavaScript, it's still two because they both have that tag. But if I got rid of Corbin, um, our list is going to update and we have all four back in that database. So now we've added a filtered list to our project. And that took us like 10 minutes. Cool, huh? So I'm going to pause here for questions and to help you catch up. Um, again, if you're following along this in the GitHub, we are on the find your projects module. And if you are really lost and really confused what's going on, the uh, whole function for loading data to the repeater is at that bottom of that module. And then I can easily switch back to my editor if I want to make any changes to my code. But I'm going to go um, pause and look to see if there's any questions and we'll kind of leave this guy up for you guys if you guys are a little confused on what's going on. Um, so there are no questions coming in, which is awesome. Hopefully that means you guys are getting it or maybe you're still working. Um, so if anyone has finished this part and is ready to move on to working with SendGrid, um, go ahead and post that you are ready to go in Slido. Um, otherwise, I'll give you guys a few more minutes here.
Yeah, I'm a fan of this experience because it is all in one. And it's really nice that I don't have to worry about having all my code in different places. I don't have to worry about tunneling um, from my database. I don't have to worry about setting up my own hosting. We do a lot of that for you right out of the box, which is really awesome. Um, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of this. It's really simple. I have been working with my mom on creating a sustainability site, as you saw, where we're trying to collect a bunch of different sustainable um, goods across the world. So things that are reduced carbon emissions, reduced water production, um, don't use plastic packaging, um, are just things that are better for the environment. So they're sustainable alternatives to kind of the conventional goods. And it's really easy to, to build a, such a complex e-commerce site. And she's able to help me too, because it, the UI is drag and drop. So she's able to do that. And then I can add the more complex functionality to it. Um, so it does actually make it a really nice experience for the whole picture. And depending on everyone who's working on it, I've talked to um, a couple of users who they were building a site and they were using all these third-party integrations. It was slowing everything down. Um, and they realized that a lot of the out of the box stuff with Corvid um, actually helped them remove a lot of third party integrations and custom code that they had to glom on and they're seeing performance improvements. They feel really proud of themselves because they learned how to do JavaScript development too. Um, so it's a really awesome platform that I feel like is really supportive also for anyone in their developer journey to build a site because it can be as simple as manipulating the UI as we're doing here. Um, or it can be even more complicated as we're about to see when we do our send grid where we can add some complex backend functionality to integrate with third parties um, and utilize like their functions on our page. Um, so it's really friendly to developers at all skill levels, which I think is awesome. And it's completely free too, which is always a bonus. Um, it is not possible to export pages with all the code. The code that you do write is yours. So you are able to access that. We are in the alpha phase of creating an offline editor. So that is coming soon. And that enables you to get access to all of your code um, that you've written, but you cannot get access to the proprietary code on the site. Because um, again, since we're working with the $W selectors, these elements are black foxy because we don't want you to accidentally ruin what's going on in the page and cause it to not be responsive, cause it to not be um, language friendly, right? So Wix is actually an Israeli company, if you didn't know. So in English, we, or in a lot of languages, we write left to right, but in Israeli, um, or in Hebrew, I should say, they actually write right to left, right? And that is something that we need to be able to handle. And that is something that when you and open up the CSS and the components a little bit too much can be really easily destroyed. Um, so the, the reason a lot of these components are black boxy is, it, is so it can handle text translations like that. It can handle responsive screen size. So I'm looking at this on my monitor right now. That's what you guys are seeing. But when I look at it on my desktop, it needs to be the same exact experience. When I look at it on a tablet, it needs to be a, a still a good experience. And that's kind of why we do lock down the UI components and you don't get access to that code. Okay. Um, I'm gonna start moving along if if there are, if anyone is stuck on this, again, those instructions are available and hopefully this recording will be available afterwards. If you wanna review this and review what I did, um, you can take a look. But because of time, we wanna keep moving along to make sure that we can add the send grid part. So the next thing that we, we want to do is we actually want to start building an integration with SendGrid. So we're going to be, this is just to kind of give you guys an introduction on how easy it is to add external tools that are already out there into your site. So in this case, um, we are going to need to set up a SendGrid account. So if you don't already have one, we're going to take a few minutes here to actually do that because there's a couple different steps that we need to set up. Uh, SendGrid is completely free to use as well. So don't worry about that. Um, and this is actually going to be a really helpful tool for if you wanna do any sort of email um, automated marketing campaigns and stuff like that. Um, 
So we are going to spend a few minutes here getting started with SendGrid and getting our API keys and verifying our sender emails. So I've already done this on mine, but if you haven't done this, you will need to sign up for an account, create an API key, and create a verified sender. So if I go to sendgrid.com, Um, you, if you don't already have an account, go ahead and try for free. If you do already have an account, go ahead and sign in. I'm going to go ahead and sign in. Looks like my credentials are there. Password keychains have been a lifesaver. So um, in order to set up your API key and your verified sender, you're going to find both of those living in the settings area. So on this left side of the screen here, go ahead and go to settings. And um, the fastest one is going to be our API key. So you can create API keys. Um, once you create the key, though, you cannot get access to it again. So when you create the API key, make sure you copy that value and store it in a place that you can access it again, because you cannot view these ever again. So you just have to create a new key. So I'm going to create an API key. I'm going to give it a name. So we are developers live. I'm going to create and view. I'm going to delete this one afterwards. So you guys can't get access to it. Um, so I'm going to copy that and now we're done, but that is gone. Um, so I can never see that again. So if you do ever need access to that API key again, you're going to have to create a new one. Um, I like to store things maybe in my notes app. So you can't see that right now because it's secret and I have some other secrets in there too, like my other API keys. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and store that one there because we will need it a little bit later. So make sure you store that. The other thing that you need to do is create a verified sender. So this is someone who is real that you're sending. E this is going to be like that from. So it's going to be like Meredith from Wix um, is going to be your sender. So we're going to go to sender authentication. And if you don't have a single sender verified, so I have one verified already, um, you want, you're going to want to verify a sender. So this is going to be your name. Um, the email address that you're sending it from, where those replies are going to. So maybe you have like customer service at Wix.com, but like I don't want people emailing me personally. Um, I can put use that for the reply to. Um, and then some company details. So you can use your home address or your work address, uh, whatever you need to fill in there. And then create. That'll send an email to that email address that you're trying to um, create as the verified sender. So make sure you do have access to it right now. And you will need to verify that you are a verified sender for SendGrid. So I'm going to pause here while you guys create those API keys and those verified senders um, and check to see if there's any questions. So it is actually pretty easy to localize the pages in mo multiple languages. I see that questions in the chat here. Um, we have another workshop that we actually run that enables you to use a translation service on top of your site as well. So it'll translate your text for you automatically. Um, localization is one of the things that is important to, to Wix because we are a global site. Um, if you don't know, we have over 180 million websites that are built on top of Wix. And um, they are all across the globe. I think we are in like at least 250 countries. So it is really important that localization is really simple because we do support so many different countries. Um, it also is pretty knowledgeable about where you are. So uh, when I first started at Wix, they sent me to Tel Aviv to do some training. And when I was there, we were building a Wix store and the default 
currency in Israel is a shekel. Um, so my Wix store was automatically set up in shekels. And, but I don't actually do any business in, in Israel. So I was like, I need this to be dollars. So I was able to easily add US dollars to that as well. Um, so we do like having the ability to support multiple countries, multiple um, currencies, multiple languages is something that is really crucial to Wix. Um, so localization is one of those things that they have put a lot of time and effort into to really make it simplified. Yeah, and one of the things that we aren't looking at today is actually the whole like admin behind the scenes stuff for Wix sites. Um, so while you guys are working on creating those verified senders, if you have one ready, please post in Slido so I know that we're ready to move forward. Otherwise, I'm just going to show you some of the other features while I'm, I'm waiting. Uh, <laughs> so if you go to my dashboard for your site, this is actually going to open up a whole new world of um, functionality on like the administrative side of your site. So this is where you can connect it to a domain. So if you want to connect this to like meredithresume.com, you could do that. Uh, you can set up a mailbox too. So if you don't want to be sending your personal email and you want to create a business email, you can create that as well. Um, we have marketing materials like Ascend to help do some automated marketing here as well. You can dive deeper into your SEO and we have SEO. SEO tools here to help you be found by Google because that is one of the most important things, right, with a, a website is being findable. Um, at my old job, I was a product manager for our digital, our digital developer experience, and um, that was a problem we had. We built these new sites on top of uh, another framework um, that is very popular out there, and it is not SEO friendly out of the box. And that was something that in my I was a developer advocate. I switched to product because I wanted to learn more about um, how to build a developer experience on, in a digital platform. And one of the things that we learned really quickly is that we have to make sure that we are found on Google and we our pages were not getting indexed, our pages were not getting crawled because the, page, the content was headless. So it was dynamically rendering and we didn't have a static um, page for Google to crawl. And so that was one of the first projects that I did when I came on was help set up static pay, uh, like a, a static site renderer um, for our pages to make sure that we were found on Google. And it took months, months to do that. Um, and that is really damaging to a site uh, reputation. So it is important to be SEO friendly. And that is something that we want to make sure that we help you out with here. So you are always SEO friendly. You are fr SEO friendly out of the gate when you publish your site and um, you are going to be able to get found because that is crucial. Another thing to look at is um, we also have site monitoring. So this is how you're also going to make sure that your site is doing okay. So you're actually able to open some real-time logs if you prefer to use Google Stackdriver. We also have a really simple integration with Stackdriver. Um, so it's really easy to do site monitoring to do out of the box here. Um, you can set up payments. So if this is an e-commerce site, you can enable the different payment types that are, um, so like credit cards, Alipay, manual point of sales. What else are the fun things in here? You can also set up your basic business information and your fave icon. So get access to kind of all of, again, that admin stuff, physical addresses, um, regional settings, and here is where you can also add languages to your page too. So again, it's, good. it's super important for us at Wix to enable um, global business because we are a global business. So we want to make it really simple for you to also add support for additional languages.
our branch. So I'm, if you're following along in the GitHub, we are currently on the Wix fetch plus send grid component. We are right here at this exclamation point, making sure that we have a send grid API key and verified email. So let me see what's going on on Slido. I am going to start moving forward. Again, all of the directions are here on the GitHub if you are falling a little bit behind um, or if kind of, um, if you're stuck at any point, please use Slido to let me know kind of what you're at and if you, if we're moving way, way, way too fast. But we are running low on time and I wanna actually be able to get to the point where we send emails and then I can leave you guys with the fun stuff to do at home too. So once we've created our send grid e uh, verified email and API key, and we've stored that API key somewhere where we can find it, we want to go back to our Wix site, and we want to go and add a new database collection to con collect those forms. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go back to databases. We're going to add a new collection called contact form, and this is what people are going to fill out when they want to send us an email. So we also have a running list of everyone who's asked for that. So in that contact form database, we want a title, an email, and a message. Oops, let me close that. So in here, that is going to be that um, step number one, where we want to create that contact form. Oh, and actually, we want to create, make it a form submission. So I did not do that. So let me go ahead and manage that. Um, so if I go back to content manager, go to my contact form. So if you also didn't do that, um, you can go to manage permissions and we can actually change this from private data to form submission because we actually want it to be form submission. So that is how you change permission levels. And as you saw here, there's also a way to get way more granular, right? Like I can actually control who can read and write to the database and update and delete as well. Um, so we also have that extra layer of granularity at this point too. But so yeah, if you did not make it a form submission collection, go back to your content manager, three dots, manage permissions, collection type, form submission. Cool. Um, and make sure we have our three fields, so our title, our email, and our message. We then wanna create a contact me page. So we're going to go ahead and add a page to the pages site structure and add three input fields. So we'll add two text boxes and, or sorry, two input text inputs and one text box and then a button as well. And we also wanna make sure that we give these meaningful names like name input, email input, message input and submit button. So I'm gonna be doing steps number two, three and four. So I'm going to go create a new page called contact. On this page, I'm going to add some new elements. So I'm going to go to the inputs area. I'm going to go to text input. I'm going to grab add two of these. Um, so if you also don't want to redo that and we're just going to reuse the same one, you can, I'm going to command C because I'm on a Mac um, and then command V. So control and com hmm. ah, there it is. or you could also use that right click as well to do that. And so now we've added two, uh, um, two additional elements on input elements on the page. I need a text box. So I'm going to scroll down and grab this one, drag it, drop it on the page. Maybe make this a little bit better or bigger. I read better in the text, it said better instead of bigger. <laughs> um, and then last but not least, we need a button. So button isn't gonna be under input. We actually just go back up to that button section, grab one of these, I like this guy. And I'm gonna add that there as well. 
And remember, we want to change the IDs on these. So you see right now it's input four. That's not helpful for me. So I'm going to bring up the properties panel. And this is going to be name input. This is going to be email input. This is going to be message input. And this is going to be my submit button. Submit button. Be nice if I could spell, isn't it? Um, I may also want to change the button text here. So this can actually say instead of button, um, send email. So that is our UI for our contact form to send emails. So that was if you're following along in the GitHub steps number two, three, and four, where I added UI, I created a new contact page, I added UI elements to the page, and I updated their IDs. So name, email, message, and submit button. Now we can do some backend coding. Um, so we're going to create a new SendGrid JavaScript file. So I'm going to go back over into my editor and create a new file. So we want a new JS file. We're not going to create a web module just yet. So we want a new JS file called send grid. Cool. So we have our send grid account set up. We're actually going to start adding some backend code. And what this backend code enables us to do is we can also create JavaScript web modules. This is where we can also install and access NPM modules. And another thing that we can do here is Wix fetch, which is what we're about to do. Um, and Wix fetch enables us to reach external REST APIs to get data into our page. So um, if we look at Wix fetch, we provide a URL and any request options to access that external data, which is how we're going to access SendGrid. So we're going to go the REST route actually here for SendGrid. You can also go the NPM module route if you prefer that. Um, so in this point, it's personal preference, but we're going to go the fetch route to show you how easy it is to use Wix fetch on your page too. So in order to use Wix fetch, you're going to um, have to import it similar to how we imported Wix data, but Wix fetch is going to be a function um, in the Wix fetch module. So we only want to import that. So we're going to go ahead and wait, import the Wix fetch API. If you want to learn more about the Wix fetch API, the API reference is linked right here in that GitHub on step number six. So I'm going to go ahead and import Wix fetch. Once we've imported Wix fetch, we're going to actually stub out a function that we're exporting here, meaning that we'll be able to um, access it in other files. And that function is going to take in a couple of different parameters, a key, a sender, recipient, subject, and body. So the key is going to be that API key. The sender is going to be our verified sender. Recipient is going to be um, the person who is providing their email address. And then subject and body is going to be for our email. So once we have the function stubbed out, um, we're actually going to add in that API call for a send grid. We have that written for you here as well. So we're going to stub out the fetch. And so we're going to use the URL for the send grid API. So we're using the REST API here in this case. Um, we're going to put in a headers JSON object here because when we are calling these APIs, we do need to authenticate ourselves and say that we do have access to this. Um, so we're going to avoid some like DNS attacks here. Um, or sorry, DOS, not DNS, oh, I guess attacks on your DNS, um, but DOS. Um, so our denials of service attacks. So we're going to provide our authorization um, and then we're also going to tell it that it's going to be a form encoded in this. And then the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to set up our data, which is going to be, because this is going to be a post, we are going to have a body which needs to incorporate the information that we are sending the, uh, about who we're sending the email to, who it's coming from, and what the email contains. So we're going to use that JavaScript templating to bind our different variables to our data string. 
So once we have all of our parameters actually set up to do our Wix fetch, we can actually do the, or create the fetch. As I mentioned, this is going to be a post. So we're going to grab the last part of that. So the last thing that we want to do is set up the request options object, which is going to be passed here. Um, so it's going to define the method. So in this case, we're going to do a post. Um, you could also do a get. We are going to pass in that headers array that we just created, which is going to contain our authorization information. And since this is a post, we are required to pass data. Um, so we're going to pass in our data to the body of the post request. We are then going to return the fetch, which is a, again, a promised um, function. So we're going to wait for it to return and get returned the JSON object from the successful fetch response. So this is how we set up. So we have our URL headers, which include that important authorization information, our data for our body of our post, and then our um, setter for our, UR, our, our fetch method. And that is how you create a fetch object. Pausing here for questions and help you guys catch up. Um, if you are falling behind the entire function stub is at the step number nine. Um, so you can just grab all of that if you're a little bit confused and um, watch the recording again to kind of go through the breakdown of what each component is. So once we have our um, fetch set up, we're going to actually move on to creating a web module. So we're going to move on to send grid part two. So in this case, we're going to create a new web module um, that is going to utilize the fetch function that we just wrote and actually create that send email function where we're going to collect the UI parameters um, sorry, the form field, uh, form filled values and pass them to that fetch function that we just wrote. So we are going to need to use that function that we just created from SendGrid. Um, but first we need to create a new file called email. So we're going to go new. In this case, we are going to create a web module. So let's go ahead and create a new module called email. And this enables us to actually get access to the um, functions that we're about to create here in our UI. So on our front end of our page. So we are going to grab, um, we are able to also access our other backend functions. So we have some functionality just to kind of show you how to utilize this. Um, so right, like we have an exported function for multiplication and then on our UI, we could, um, we would plug in this code here to actually see that functionality work on the page. So just kind of showing you how it works if you get confused. Um, otherwise, we could just remove that. And I'm just going to replace it with this import. So we're actually going to import that function that we just created so we can call it here in this JavaScript module. And um, this is going to export a function called send email. So we're going to grab that code snippet and plop it in here. And this is where it's going to be important to uh, provide those credentials that you did set up with in SendGrid. So your API key, your verified sender, and your recipient email. So maybe this is sending a carbon copy of that email to yourself as well. And then we're going to call that send with service. So that's that Java or that SendGrid fetch function that we just created uh, and pass in these variable 
that we are getting here, um, and then that carbon copy of what we're retrieving from the UI. So um, I'm going to go ahead and plop these um, my variables in here. So I'm going to replace with my API key. Um, this API key will not work. I'm going to delete it after this event. <laughs> I'm also going to pass in my verified email address. So I verified my Wix email address and then my recipient. So I'm going to also send a carbon copy of this to my Wix email. Cool. And so this is how we're going to be able to send an email to, um, in this case, a static person. So maybe a carbon copy for yourself. If we want to be able to send it to that recipient who is the person putting their name in the email address or in the, our contact form, we also are going to create an, a second function that is going to send an email with recipient information provided. So I'm going to grab that. I'm going to add that function here so we can export both so we have access to both functions on our UI. Um, again, I need to put in my API key. and then my verified sender email. And then in this case, I don't need to provide a recipient email because we're going to be retrieving that from our UI and passing it in as a parameter to our function. And that is our backend code. That is how we're going to send emails. Um, it's important that we have these, this information like key and sender on the backend because if we expose this information on the front end, um, anyone with malicious intent can get access to this information and um, try to maliciously send emails on your behalf, maybe get access to your email address and you don't want them to have access to that. Um, so it is a little bit dangerous to, or not a little bit, it's dangerous to expose this information on your UI. So it's important to put it into this backend code because no one will have, except for you, the developer will have access to this information. We also do have a secrets manager too. Um, so if you don't even want to put it in plain text like he, we are doing here um, because this is a workshop and we are running low on time, um, we do have a secrets manager you can use as well. All right. And because we are running low on time, I'm going to keep going. Um, please post any questions you have in Slido and I will keep an eye on them too. We then need to switch over to our front end to actually collect the um, information to the database. So what we can do here is if I go back to my contact form page, um, I want to add a data set to this page, which will enable me to write to my contact form database. So I am going to go to content manager. I'm going to connect a collection. And this is going to create a new data set for me. Um, it's, it's not configured yet, so I have to configure that. So I want to connect it to contact form. It is going to actually be write only in this case because we're going to be writing to the database. And then if you need to do any filtering or sorting, so in this case, if you were doing a read, you can also do that at this level too. Um, so we have it as write only. And now we can start collect, connecting those fields to that write. So I'm going to go to my name input, connect to data, and this is going to connect to my title. My email input is going to connect to my email. And my uh, message input is going to connect to my message. So super easy to create a form fill object. And then our button here is going to connect to an action where we actually submit. And then you can also add success and failure messages at this point too, or and navigate. Um, so it's really easy to create a form experience that's like really thorough without actually writing any code. So again, if you're following along in um, the GitHub, we just did steps number five, six, seven, and eight. And now we're actually ready to get to, to the sending email part, which is really exciting. Um, and we only have four minutes left. Ah, this went by so fast, guys. So I'm going to keep going. Um, hopefully, I'm not going too fast. 
but I want to make sure we get to sending an email before the end of this, because um, I think that's a really fun part of this, and then also show you guys what you can do afterwards. So we do have the send email functions that we created in our back end, so we actually are going to need to import them on our front end. So on that contact form, I'm going to pop up the code editor. In this case, I'm going to import those backend functions. So we're not importing from an API, we're importing actually from that backend code that we just wrote. We then have um, the functions nice and stubbed out here. So we can actually send form data. Oops, I missed a curly brace. I did my copy. Um, where we can actually collect the different values from those input fields. So in this case, we're going to grab the subject, we're going to template it out where we're going to say it's a new submission from the value that is in the name input field. The body is going to be um, first name, their email address, and their message that they sent. And then the recipient is going to be that value from that email input. So this is how we're actually going to collect that form data. I'm gonna make this pretty, so it's a little bit easier to read. Cool. Oops. Also, I don't want that to live in here. My bad. Let me move that. There we go. Cool. Um, and then on the send form data, because we actually, I don't want it to be called right away. So that was. Um, my bad on my part. We want it to be called when that um, submit actually happens. So at the very end, we also want to call those backend functions that we have. So now we have that form data and we can pass it along to our backend functions that we just created. Um, so we're going to add that in that send form data function where these are pulling from that backend that we just sent. Awesome. And then the last thing that we need to do is we want to use the on after save event. So when this is written to the database, we can actually um, create a data hook where we can get access to that save event that it was successful and completed. And we can utilize that to actually call that send form data so we can collect that information and use it to send the emails. Um, in the same token, we're also going to update the placeholder text instead of the um, like enter a name here or enter a message there, we're going to update it to actually be those values. And now we're actually ready to send an email. So with my last breath, I'm going to do that. We do have some console logs in there, so we'll be able to see that as well. So as you see, that placeholder text is updated. I'm going to pass in my information. And uh, maybe I'll send this to my personal one. So it's a different email address. I forgot we are developers. So I'm going to send my email. I'm getting two responses, two successes. So my emails have been sent. If I checked my inbox, I will see that I have a new email. And that is how easy it is to add email to um, your site. So we are pretty much out of time at this point, which I'm bummed about. Um, but we do have some bonus material here too, where we have a timeline API. Um, the last two modules are our timeline API and our QR code. We, and then you can also end some publishing too. And um, yeah, so I don't know, do they have access to these slides afterwards? But yeah, so we have access to the, like the Wix um, animation API, adding a QR code and you are ready to go. Um, so again, I apologize that we didn't get through all of this, but you have access to that GitHub link and you also have access to my information. So I am Meredith Hassett. You can ping me on Twitter at ML Hassett. Um, and this was great. I'm sorry we didn't get through everything. There was so much material um, that it just happens sometimes. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much for, for the workshop. Um, for everybody who didn't manage to watch it all, this is recorded. So you we'll have and you have uh, all the links and everything after we finish with the event. Uh, also, if there are any resources that you want to share, we can also post them in our Slack channel. So you can um, actually send it to Vesi and uh, we will make sure that uh, everything is, uh, is communicated from our side. Uh, would awesome, you yeah. yeah, I want to thank you again for, for waking up so early for us, <laughs> for, for delivering this, this workshop.
I did uh, try to do some of the functions myself. I tried to follow oh. along. So very interesting. Um, and we do have um, some comment right now that I see on, on Slido. Uh, Ignacio just wants to say that the amount of code and effort behind Wix is mind blowing. Thanks. So uh, this is very, very positive. <laughs> we don't be going to break because at 6 p.m. we have our next uh, workshop and uh, our next session coming up. So again, thank you very much. Everybody who is still um, uh, watching us, make sure you set your reminders for uh, 6 p.m. because we're gonna tune in with our next panel discussion. Until then, enjoy your break.
afternoon everybody i hope you're doing very good because we are so excited to welcome our next panel we have invited three key figures driving the digitalization in the german-speaking region and this panel will answer and discuss some questions like what is the outlook for europe's digital future does europe have a chance in the race for digital innovation versus the usa and china the panel will be moderated by my dear colleague and managing director of your developers ben rushin so let's give a wall welcome a virtual applause to all of our panelists Hello, everybody, and welcome to We Are Developers Live Week. My name is Ben Rushin. I'm the co-founder and managing director of We Are Developers. And I'm really excited about this panel because we've managed to get three of the main drivers and leaders of digitalization in the German-speaking region to join us at a single point of time. Um, the topic of this panel is what is the outlook for Europe's digital future? So um, I want to talk um, to the three leaders about where are we currently at? What does digitalization mean on a national or regional context? And what is the outlook for Europe in terms of becoming competitive as an economy, as a digital economy, and where are we headed to in the future? So I'm very excited um, to quickly introduce our, our three guests of honor. Um, first and foremost, I would like to welcome uh, Margarete Schramböck. She's the Federal Minister of Digital and Economic Affairs in Austria. Hello, hi. Welcome, Margarete. Welcome, thank, Margarete. You for thank you for Secondly, I would like to welcome Dorothee Beer. Dorothee is the Minister of State at the Federal Chancellery and Federal Government Commissioner for Digital Affairs in Germany. Hi, Ben. Great to welcome, see you. Dorothee. Great to have you with us. And thirdly, I would like to welcome Mark Walder. Um, he's the founder of Digital Switzerland and also the CEO of the Ringe Media Group, um, joining us from Switzerland. Hi, Mark. Hi, Ben. Hi, everybody. It's good to have you here. So um, thanks for being here. Um, before we start, I would like to just uh, talk a little bit about what we're planning for today. Um, first of all, um, we're going to talk about what does digitalization actually mean? How do we define it? What are the key performance indicators? How do we measure digitalization on a national level? Secondly, I would like to talk about the status quo. So how digital is Switzerland? How digital is Austria? How digital is Germany? Um, where are we currently at? And then what are each of you three doing and what are you doing on a national federal level in order to accelerate the rate of digitalization in your respective countries? So I'm going to kick off this conversation um, with uh, Margarete Schramböck um, and then also ask Dorothee and, and Mark to join in. And the question to you three is, how do you define digitalization and how do you measure it? What are the key performance indicators that define how digital a country is? Well, I think uh, I'm happy that I can join this discussion. So I'm happy to be with you all. Um, digitalization is, uh, yeah, is uh, in different areas uh, um, important, not only in the field of uh, government, which is one uh, or public uh, um, uh, field is, is one of the most important topics, but of course in society also and, in, uh, and for businesses. So we have these three pillars. So looking at digitalization in the different angles, for me as a person, as an individual, as well as for companies, how competitive they are, and then where does uh, the government stand? Uh, for Austria, when, when we look at uh, um, e-government especially, and I am talking about mobile government. Uh, mobile government has given us really a step ahead. We have uh, put this as one of our principles because I'm convinced that only by putting it on mobile devices, uh, you can uh, work on uh, um, making processes and applications or what else you, you need uh, much easier. So if you do this, then you rethink the whole process and then you arrive at a real e-government, uh, which has to be possible anywhere, anytime, whenever our customers, and these are all citizens of Austria, want uh, to do it. So therefore, we have uh, created a new platform, which is called Österreich GVAT, uh, and an app uh, where, we, where, where Austrian citizens can do their, uh, their public uh, 
um, applications uh, in a way on even the mobile devices. They can move from one a location to another and can do this or even when they expect a baby we do have uh, um, uh, an, a special corner for this where I can even name the baby and more than a few thousand Austrians have used this for their babies but they can also have all the different um, uh, other topics they need like uh, um, a card for elections and I want this to be uh, the same for whole Austria. All these single solutions are great and they're best practices and we can incorporate them. But in finally, we want to have one information platform and one platform at least for, um, the, um, for, for our government. And then of course, we also talk to cities and to the smaller villages so that they can also put their services on this platform. So this is for government part. And this has brought us from number six or five in e-government index up to number three in Europe, only outperformed by Malta, by Malta and uh, uh, by uh, Estonia uh, or Estonia and Malta. Second is uh, people in their daily lives. We need to take care that they have the capacity and the capabilities of using all these services because it doesn't make sense to offer the services and they cannot use it. So we have formed uh, a special platform fit for internet for all people, especially the elder uh, generation, where we do courses all across Austria. And when uh, the coronavirus crisis is, is over, we will, of course, restart this again. We have done it in a digital way, and uh, um, it, a lot of people have uh, used it, even the elder generation. And then um, the third topic is, of course, for businesses. Here I'm most of all um, uh, worried about small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, we have seen now in the crisis that e-commerce is not enough spread. We have talked a lot about it, but uh, um, a lot of companies have missed out the opportunity before. They have now realized that it's so important, so we have started special programs to e-commercialize them uh, very quickly and to help them to get into this, uh, into this field, not to substitute the um, traditional business, but to be in addition. And all about this and all around this is, of course, education, digital education, not only for um, elderly people, but also in the schools, and we do have this plan. All together, we have a digital action plan for Austria, which of now in the corona crisis is a little bit adapted, but where all the actions uh, of all ministries are included in the health sector, in, just, in, in uh, the uh, justice area, as well as all the other sectors. And uh, there we try to move ahead as quickly as possible and hopefully get back to normal. And digitalization has helped us um, in the crisis a lot. Um, because it has uh, offered a lot of opportunities like homeschooling, like uh, um, home office, and a lot of people have used it. And before, I have always heard it's not possible, we cannot do this, we cannot do that. And suddenly everybody is using it, um, and it has beamed us a little bit into the future. And if you want to have a, a small positive uh, effect, of course, of what is uh, is, is never positive, but it has helped us in this way to apply things uh, which are there for a long time. Thank you, Margarete. Um, passing on to Dorothee, um, how do you define digitalization on a national level? Well, first of all, uh, Margarete is right with everything she said. So, um, and congratulations for speeding up, especially in e-government. But um, as Margarete pointed it out um, in different ways, I think I can um, put it in one word. So for me, um, truly digitization or digitalization um, means it's a life relief. So that is the main goal that people should know that technology makes their life better. Um, we can live longer, um, technology can save lives, as we saw during the last week. So for me, the main goal is really not only the life relief that we have it, but that everyone is convinced about it. Thank you, Dorothee. Mark, what about you? What does digitalization mean for you? 
looking at the Swiss economy? I, um, I don't want to be repetitive. So maybe I, I go into a couple of numbers. There is a lot of indexes, global indexes, global digital competitiveness indexes uh, existing. So I picked one which we believe very much in. It's the so-called IMD uh, competitiveness uh, index in terms of digitization. And let me start with a couple of rankings here. Again, you might think of indexes, whatever, whatever you want, but uh, I was going for the three countries here being present. So Switzerland is ranked uh, number five on the global level. Austria is ranked uh, 20th and uh, Germany uh, 17. Um, by the way, the first four countries in this IMD digital competitiveness uh, index is uh, US, uh, number one, uh, Singapore, number two, Sweden three and Denmark four, meaning meaning that uh, this is there's two um, out of Europe uh, in here. Now, it's probably um, a bit more interesting if I go just a bit deeper and look at uh, I think two crucial ones. And I was going for weaknesses, especially for these three countries. And one weakness is uh, e-participation. Um, Switzerland 37, Germany 23, Austria 40. And I was going for a second criteria, which is extremely important to myself, uh, starting a business. So how difficult or how easy is it to start a business? Because at the end of the day, um, all the big companies were startups a couple of uh, years ago. So in starting a business, uh, Switzerland is 38, uh, Germany 23 and Austria 40. So what does that tell us? Um, I think we're in the midfield somewhere and there's a lot of improvement, especially in terms of e-participation, starting a business, and of course, and we come to that later, funding startups. There is, I think, the biggest difference. Um, what is your vision and what is your personal goal for the future of Europe, um, again, starting with, with Margarete. Well, um, the, the vision on, and the, the goal uh, for us all uh, needs to be that we are leaving this area of being um, a middle performers, because there we are, if we take all indicators together, uh, and to be in the top league. This is uh, where we all want to be and uh, where we need to have the frame conditions in each of our countries, but not only in the countries, but also together. So as from the European Commission, for example, we need a framework which is enabling us this and, uh, uh, and offers us also opportunities. So it's both in countries and it's on the European side. There has been done a lot so far. However, when I joined, because I was in business before, 22 years in IT uh, industry, uh, a CEO and in different other functions, um, I found out that there are a lot of papers and there's a lot of good stuff written um, and developed, but execution is, is the main topic. We can um, uh, talk about broadband and about, uh, and about fiber and about 5G, which is important and it's an important layer as infrastructure. But also we can talk about uh, the knowledge base. And I think this is what Dorothy was uh, um, also uh, mentioning and uh, what she, she was addressing. It. It, it is a change in life uh, and we need to enable and take with us everybody, not only the younger generation. And therefore, uh, we need uh, to focus also especially on, on, on this part. And my dream is that we take everybody with us in this, uh, on this journey uh, with different speeds uh, and with different history. It is, of course, clear that countries come from different angles in, uh, in Europe and have not the same conditions, uh, all of the countries, but that we take care and that it is an opportunity for people uh, to get a job and it, it helps them to get an even better job and helps them to, um, uh, to be more successful. Instead of what we often see in different studies, that we say, oh, digitalization is destroying jobs and is, uh, is not creating new jobs. I'm convinced that it's creating new jobs, but uh, what is important is that we take a lot of uh, young people, but also people who are working in companies and also people outside with us. 
from my experience previously in companies, we have a lot of people working in companies, um, which we think can use the full potential of digitalization, and we never think um, of the fact that they, they could miss something or they could need something. Um, but uh, indeed, it is that a lot are left behind uh, if we do not take care, this cannot be done alone by a state, but it's a shoulder and shoulder on shoulder. It's a teamwork with the companies, which we need uh, to do, uh, which we need uh, really um, do together. Dorothee? Well, um, I believe that our European approach, the approach we have to promote digitization, that our approach creates way more confidence than, for example, the Chinese approach. Public acceptance um, is important to move ahead. And let me bring one example, um, maybe. So our European ethical standards in AI can make us the big winners in the field, in the medium to long term. Maybe not in a short term, but I really believe in a long term. And it's important that we go our own way when using AI. So if you're asking for a dream, my dream is an AI made in Europe, an AI that's focused on the people, not on the, not on the government or on single different companies, big companies, but focused on the people. And it should be safe and trustworthy. It should prevent manipulation, maintain competition and diversity, of course. So our goal is a high performance AI made in Europe that's in line with our economic, our values and our social structure. So that's my big dream. And um, to be a little bit more concrete too is that we have decided to invest in the development of a sovereign data infrastructure called Gaia-X. And I talked to Margarete this week, um, Austria is doing the same. So we are striving for an efficient and competitive, secure and trustworthy data infrastructure for Europe. But on the one side for Europe, but on the other side, it's an European project open to users and providers worldwide. So that's very important for me to say that it's not a one way street. So everyone can come to us. And if I compare it, for example, um, for our data protection, the laws we have, um, it's very interesting that a lot of other countries, um, at first they looked at Europeans. Um, when I was at a big, um, at the CES two years ago, and uh, they, they had a big discussion, IBM and the CES itself, and they were only talking about America and China, America and China. And then all of a sudden, the host asked the, um, the former IBM chef and, um, and the chef of the CES um, about Europe. And all of a sudden the word Europe was on stage. And then the CES um, CEO said, Europe, Europe, I don't want to talk about Europe because all they care about those Europeans is data privacy and data protection. So let's not take them seriously. And when you see how it changed, when you see, for example, that California adopted our laws, I'm really convinced that we can achieve the same when we are talking a trustworthy AI um, or a trustworthy data infrastructure. Okay. Mark, what is, what is your vision and your personal goal for Europe's digital future? Well, we, maybe I tell you a bit about my story because it's quite concrete. So um, I had I had the honor to found this the initiative, which is called Digital Switzerland, which would be uh, repl replicable in, in Austria as Digital Austria or Digital Germany. And we started basically with 10 big companies. And the question was, do you think it's important that the area where you are having your company um, is being digitally fit. They all said yes. And so we started. The surprise was today we are close to 200 members um, who support the idea of making Switzerland a leading digital country uh, globally. So it's the biggest companies out of basically all the sectors, uh, the banking industry, the insurance industry, telecommunications, airlines, uh, retailers, uh, pharma, etc. But also the big institutions, like all the big, uh, the big uh, universities, etc., are part of this. 
Um, what did we achieve so far? So we focus very much on concrete projects. So we take care of, of startup enablement. We do take care of regulatory framework, of course, which we heard now from uh, Margaret and Dorothee already, which is of course important regulatory framework. We take care that the big companies don't get lost because they have to drive innovation. Think about the, the, the big car companies in Germany. It's, it's absolutely crucial. They have 10,000s of employees that they keep up with the speed. Um, we take care of, uh, Dorothee mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the normal people um, and the questions around trust. So we take care of the public dialogue. And therefore, and this is extremely interesting, we implemented a digital day. It was the first digital day um, ever in Europe. And we're doing now this for the fourth time, meaning that we have one day in Switzerland, which is completely dedicated to um, experience digitization. To see, um, to see a drone, to see a 3D printer, which is printing Christmas cookies, uh, to understand um, how voice recognition um, works, et cetera, et cetera. And we have hundreds of thousands of people who are during that day getting in touch with digitization in a, in a very normal way. So for once, it's not about the political leaders. It's not about the CEOs and, 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 and CTOs. It's about the parents and the children and the grandfathers and the, and the granddaughters. And, and we are copying you now. Which you is know. great, Dorothea. I know we <laughs> have been in contact and it's great. And, and again, this has become almost a movement um, in Switzerland. Now, the vision is, I think we cannot turn, let's be honest, we cannot turn back the past 10, 15 years. And let's not bash Europe too much because... I always hear where are our Facebooks and Airbnbs and Amazons and uh, Instagrams and whatsoever. And my answer, and, and all we have is Spotify. I always say, look, if, if Mark Zuckerberg would have had to start Facebook um, in Austria, it would have probably not made it because it's more complicated to scale a business as a platform business uh, in Europe uh, than it is in the US. Twitter probably wouldn't have been as big today if it would have been um, 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 funded or, or started in Switzerland. But where is the chance, Ben, and then I'm finished going forward. Europe doesn't have to be a digital leader in everything. Uh, the US and China, do know how to do platforms and a couple of other things. But the chances I see is um, that we can become very well uh, placed in, in really smart manufacturing. Um, blockchain is one thing. We do see that, that uh, Switzerland is having a leading role in terms of blockchain. So advanced manufacturing, blockchain, robotics, deep techs, um, drones, etc. So let's not be good in everything, but let's try to be smart in a couple of things. And maybe one last uh, sentence. When I talk to investors, the funding of the US companies is on a broader base. And this is now an important thing, I think, uh, I'm, that I'm touching. So in the US, you don't only have the rich people, the big family office, and uh, the personalities who put a lot of money into, into venturing. You do have pension funds, you do have insurances, you have closely linked to the government um, funds. And this is what we need to achieve also in Europe. We need to have a broader base of who actually is investing and not only rich and, and um, already um, very smart people. We have to get a broader base. I think that is a, a very uh, important point. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. So I can add, add something to this, if, if you allow. Ben, it's okay? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so what you have mentioned, I could, uh, I'm agreeing, um, especially if we look at what has been successful in the US, is mainly B2C. And I know that a lot of people who are watching us might be in the developing area and what uh, our strength is in Europe is B2B. And uh, here we, we need to put also 
an additional focus. And this is what you mentioned by smart manufacturing, robotics, and all these topics. But it can also be in the software area. Uh, in B2C, of course, the US has started earlier and uh, has done it in a different way. I'm, I'm not so convinced that it could have not been successful in Europe, only that this B2C bubble and area where it, the development was around this university um, uh, campus was much better organized, was much better. It was, it was happening and there were a lot of conditions there which were not there in Europe at that time. But in between, a lot of time has passed, and I think that um, what uh, Dorothée mentioned is that we do have um, competitive advantages over other areas. We also do have a big consumer area, but we do also have a, um, a good manufacturing and manufacturing in this area. I've been to Korea, and I've been also to China, and they have asked me, how can we learn from you this smart factoring that you mentioned? Um, because especially in the SME era, I'm not talking about the large giants uh, and the manufacturing like Samsung and so on, but I'm talking about the smart factoring in uh, SME areas. And what we need there is, of course, data. And here, Europe needs to move um, one next step. How can we provide the data? We are good in data protection, but how can we add data? Um, and um, data as one of our biggest um, treasuries that we have and offer this in a way to um, startups and other in the community that they can use it to develop things. This is true for the healthcare sector and it's also true for manufacturing because I have talked to a lot of industries and I've said, you need to provide your data in a data pool to different startups. And it was hard to convince the different uh, industrial um, companies that they are prepared to do so. Now technology has arrived to a state where this is possible with digital twins and where you really do not uh, give your identity and your data um, and we need to have this framework and we need to have it on a European basis because case by case uh, in Austria um, alone will not be enough, in Germany alone will not be enough and I'm counting a lot on Dorothee. Uh, and also on the whole team in Germany, because they have the presidency of the European uh, Union. And we here, we contribute a lot of countries in, in Europe, and we need to form these markets. And then, of course, countries like Switzerland and others outside the European are welcome to join and to also um, um, join this team and this group, because it does not end on the borders of the European Union. But we need to form, to strengthen um, our, uh, our, yeah, our effort in this uh, to provide data and in, in, a, in, in an anonymous way to the community so that they can work. Um, thank, thank you, Margarete, for, for these inputs. Um, I would like to switch back to Mark because you've actually started answering the, the next question we have for today. So um, the question is, what initiatives are you working on to accelerate the rate of digitalization uh, in your country? And um, before you answer the question, I would like to just uh, point out the Digital Readiness Index of Cisco, um, speaking of indexes, um, which defines several categories of digitalization. So for, uh, for this index, they measured technical infrastructure. They measured the usage of technology. They measured the development of human capital, the standard of living, the degree of research and development, foreign direct investment, the economic environment, and also the, the startup environment. So taking these, um, these aspects into account, what are the initiatives you are working on in, to, in order to really accelerate digitalization as far as possible? I can, I can only summarize what has been said in, in, in a very straightforward way. I don't want to be too long. First of all, let's start with education. So my daughter is 11 years old. If I look at the weekly schedule she has in fifth grade, it is pretty much exactly the same I had I'm 54 years old, so that must be 45 years ago or 44 years ago. She is learning what I learned 40 years ago. Um, I was being provocative a couple of uh, years ago and I said, every kid in Switzerland needs to learn how to code. Let's start there. 
there was a big debate going on then in this country. And actually, I just wanted to, you know, start pushing kind of a snowball because I was saying um, coding is the new writing and reading. So we have to start somewhere. We cannot, we cannot um, import all uh, the coders um, from somewhere else. I'm not sure if it's still true that every kid has to learn how to code. I don't know, um, but we have to learn uh, in school again. Second point is um, let's touch the normal people. We have to transport digitization to the normal people because let's be honest, a lot of those people are afraid. Uh, I think Dorothee mentioned that, uh, or Margaret, I, I am not sure, maybe they lose their job. Maybe the learning curve is too steep. Maybe they are scared because the refrigerator starts to talk to them and so on. So that's the second point. The third point, again, is startup enablement. Regulatory framework uh, frameworks around startups, um, but also, as I said before, the funding. In Switzerland, I checked the number, we have 44,500 new companies that have been founded uh, last year, which was a, a, a big record, uh, 2 billion um, uh, Swiss francs were invested into startups. It's not enough. It needs to be more because the failure rate is extremely high. We see this now during COVID-19. Next point is uh, the big universities. They are stepping into a learning curve as well because it's those professors and teachers who have to teach the next generation what actually digitization uh, means. And then at the end of the day, and we're talking to, uh, to, to the two ministers here of two very important countries in, in, uh, in, in Europe, is of course leaders like you are, Dorothe and Margrethe, uh, who need to set the right framework around um, all these things that I mentioned, so it's around schools, it's about startup ecosystems, it's about the big companies who have the right conditions or need the right conditions to, 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 to further work. I think that's roughly the framework we need to have in place. And then again, a focus on the strengths of Europe. And to finish with one quote or one number here, I checked the IP rights of the three countries being present here because IP rights is kind of the, the foundation of where actually intelligence comes from. And look at this, how good these three, these three countries are. IP rights on the uh, IMD competitiveness index again, uh, Switzerland second place globally, IP rights, Germany, uh, Dorothee, third place globally. So these, these, these two countries are global leaders in IP rights uh, in terms of digitization and Austria number 10. So we are all globally and there's a hundred and I think 98 countries. So there is a wonderful basis of knowledge here. Mark, to just touch up on um, your, your focus on digital Switzerland, what you mentioned earlier. Um, my impression when you invited me to the digital day last year, was that there's an extremely strong commitment from the leaders of private companies in Switzerland to really drive forward the digitalization of the country. When you invited me, um, obviously I wanted to promote We Are Developers in Switzerland. So I, I, I contacted some people to set up some meetings. And on one day I met your country manager of IBM, of Microsoft, of Accenture, of EY, of Apple. And um, it was really easy to get these meetings and they were so open and um, I, I felt such a strong commitment from their side to collaborating, to pushing forward digital Switzerland and to really bringing forward the whole nation's national competitiveness. Why do you think that is? I think because it has become sexy to do so. You know, managers do things when, when they realize um, this might be a good, a good path to go forward. And I think the whole group, you know, these close to 200 members, um, realized we are a cool group and it's cool to go forward and it's it, it's good employment uh, branding to do so. Um, it's, it, it's just, I would say, a domino effect that is in place here now in Switzerland. But uh, again, it needs to be Euro Europe uh, that is pushing forward. Switzerland, if Switzerland is, is top on these rankings, that's okay, but we need to be strong um, all over Europe. And maybe, maybe one anecdote around the coding and how much speed sometimes can change things. So 
Um, I told Alexander Vucic um, uh, about a year ago during a dinner, he's, he's the president of Serbia, um, and Serbia is kind of a hub uh, within the Balkan area uh, for digitization and entrepreneurs. I told him about the, the story that I wanted the kids in Switzerland to learn how to code. He thought it was a good idea and told Anna Brnabic about it, who is the prime minister there. And they actually started the program. And by now, 45,000 uh, people in Serbia started actually to code. So within one year, you can change a lot. Okay, thank you. Um, Dorothy, what are the initiatives that you are focused, uh, focused on with regards to digitalizing Germany? So first of all, I agree with Mark that we are not um, putting in the middle all the time our weakness where we are weak. So um, other countries do it differently. So let's put our strength in the middle of it and not only for Germany or for Austria. I see really great opportunities as a business location all over in Europe because um, we are all leading global economies. IP rights is a great example for um, uh, but we have outstandingly positioned SMEs all over the world. And we do a second mistake. Um, our discussion is in English now. And the first time I figured out why we are always talking about our weaknesses was when I was in a discussion of the World Economic Forum in China. I was talking to my French colleague and I talked over our hidden champions. And of course, we always quote it hidden champions in Germany too. And I'm like, okay, but why again are we hiding them? So let's put them in the front um, and be proud of them. So um, we still call them hidden champions. So I don't do it for two years now anymore, but still, I think that's typical for Europe as itself. So we have, uh, we are outstanding in the development and in the production of embedded systems. We are very good in complex machinery, like Margarete said, B2B solutions and much more. And we are great in sensor technology, in robotics, in photonics, in autonomous driving, of course. Um, so more than 50% of, of, of all the IP rights are uh, German IP rights on autonomous driving. So we had one of the first test beds in autonomous driving tour. So let's put that in the front. I totally believe what Mark said um, concerning how do our children learn, what's important for us. And I don't even think not only our ministers or, or, or the teachers are scared, but parents are scared. So when, when I put um, like, like Scratch in primary school, um, the first one who is writing in a newspaper is a father who says that uh, Wi-Fi is the new asbest and uh, it's not allowed to put it in school. So we really have to get the parents to it. That's why, Mark, I said before that we are copying for copying the digital day. So the German digital day will take the first time place at the 19th of June this year. Of course, it's going to be a real digital digital day, <laughs> unfortunately, because of COVID-19. But I think the idea is great. We really have to uh, take away all the fears, all the concerns. We are very, very good in fears and concerns. And Margarete, I always quote, um, a professor from a uh, university in Vienna um, who had a study a few years ago where he said that Germany is the number world champion um, in um, <laughs> not wanting to change. So, but when we are forced that we have to change, then we are number one too. So um, I call it resilience that we are very good in that too. So believe in our strength and of course, because of Corona, because of COVID-19, we changed a lot now in digitization in the schools. Um, we were very fast and what really um, still makes me happy, we had the big hackathon worldwide. So um, at the beginning of March, the idea was born to set up a hackathon to bring up ideas. Um, and the idea was born on a Monday and two days later, on Wednesday, it passed our cabinet two days later in a democracy, and not only in a democracy, but in Germany, that was really nuts. 
And then um, we had 43,000 people who signed in for the hackathon. And then from Friday to Sunday, in three days, we had still 27, 28,000 people who worked on so many ideas. And now two months later, we have a funding, we have ministries, we have people in the ministries um, who are um, godmothers and godfathers and helping our teams. And this is something which really shows me we can if we want to, but way better or unfortunate, not if we want to, but we are forced when we are forced to do it. And so, um, I don't know, some people say it's from Churchill, some people say it's from someone else, but what really helped me go to the crisis, go through the crisis is never waste a crisis. And I think that we are really good in that, not wasting it, taking the best out of it. And so if you are, if you ask what are the main topics working on, it's really um, the health system, a digital health system, digital education, and of course, transport is always um, on the top three tour. And then we not only can survive it, but really can thrive to be on top. And not like Mark said, um, with copying, but maybe we can go a step ahead. And maybe one last thing, talking about transport, at the moment, we are talking a lot of, um, as, as, as one example, I know everyone is laughing about it, but one example, um, um, new air mobility, yeah, if you call it flight taxes or whatever, but our EASA at the moment is faster than the FAA. So I think really we have different fields where we can be on leading top of the world as Europe together. Thank you, Dorothee. Margarete, I would like to pass on the word to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we have uh, heard a lot of topics and it shows us that this digital um, digitalization is in all areas of our lives. It's not only in uh, just one area, but if you want to be successful uh, and it, if you want to, to achieve that it really helps us and makes our lives easier, then we need to have a lot of different projects and it's like this uh, swarm intelligence. It's not about somebody sitting there. Uh, a ministry, of course, can help to accelerate things and to, to push things and to put like the digital day with Digital Austria Day is also in plan, uh, but has been a little bit postponed uh, due to the Corona crisis. Um, but uh, it, can really, it can really be a trigger and it could really help um, and I've seen countries that have this, and uh, this is helping, of course, to put always the focus on this, that this is something uh, who can promote us. At the moment, um, my biggest topic is, of course, the corona crisis, and um, how can we help startups in these difficult days, because they have really worries. They cannot pay the salaries of, uh, of their employees. They cannot pay the, uh, pay the fix, so how can we help them? And here I can see that Austria and Germany, also Switzerland, have different, um, of course, programs uh, to help them to get fixed cost pays, to get the salaries of employees paid. But I think uh, they also need uh, additional help in this time uh, to have this core investment, which we have put as some audio problems on your side we're having some difficulty hearing, okay. hearing you ah okay sorry for, sorry for that we we'll check it okay i think um thank you margarita we, we can continue maybe we managed to the, the audio problem um the fact that you have a ministry of digitalization or ministry of digital and economic affairs in austria is a is a very clear commitment and a very clear statement on a federal level so touching upon this, um, my question to both Dorothee and Mark, um, in Austria, in, in, sorry, in Switzerland and in Germany, um, we don't have a federal ministry of digital or digitalization. Um, do you think there should be one? Is it, is it something that's necessary? 
Who is going first? You. What? Ladies okay. first. <laughs> Whoever is asking, of course. Um, you are asking, do we need one? I will tell you, I'm sure there will be a digital ministry um, someday, I think um, more sooner than later, simply because it's very easy to communicate to citizens that if you have a digital ministry, it will solve all your problems. So, But I'm firmly convinced that the success of such a ministry depends totally how it's designed. So according to the principle, so I, I don't know if it's... Um, the correct word in Germany, we would say resort principle. Maybe we can translate it like departmentalization. So what does it mean? It means that the cabinet ministers are really free to carry out um, all their duties. So, um, and that's why I really believe that um, they can carry out their duties independently within the boundaries set by the chancellor's uh, political directives, of course because of this principle and due to the fact that digitization uh, is always with cross-cutting issues, so it's horizontally and not vertically, um, we would need to change laws in order to ensure success of such a ministry. So I really can't recommend that you put there a 14th ministry, put a sign on it, Ministry for Digitization, and then leave the man or the woman um, who is in charge then alone, because then it won't work. Um, a digital ministry would have to be involved in a similar way to the Ministry of Finance, which is involved in a legislative projects and measures of all ministries that touch on financial issues. Um, and they have a right of a, a veto right. That's very important. Um, at the moment, I don't see that we change a lot of competences and I know politics. So in an ideal world, you would design a ministry, you would take out topics of different ministries before you know which party and which person is going to sit there. So that would be my ideal world. If you ask me, um, is one necessary? I think it can be worthy to build one. Um, if you put it the same way, like we're doing politics for 70 years now, is that helpful? I don't think so. So a clear yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, what do you think? I, I agree with the yes, no. <laughs> uh, Switzerland has, and we, I had a lot of discussions with our government around that, uh, uh, launched uh, now or, or, or communicated that uh, we will have a delegate for digital transformation in Switzerland. Um, he will be communicated or she will be communicated in a couple of weeks. I think the ministers have to drive digitization within the ministry. That's the key. Digitization is teamwork. We see this in every company. Digitization, the need to transform a company has completely um, redefined the way companies are structured, the way teams work. So jump out of the silos and have different um, um, uh, possibilities of marketing, product, tech, data, design, etc. It's a teamwork, and I think this goes for governments as well. Margarete, would you like to add something? Yes. Uh, do you hear me now? It's possible. We hear you, but the quality is not particularly good. But let's try it. Okay, then I leave it, leave it out, leave it out, or maybe very slowly, I don't know, does it, does it work now better? Can you hear me better, better now? now? Better now. Better now, yeah, okay, try, I try this one. Um, so I think um, it has truly been said, it's about teamwork, but it's also uh, about leadership. And uh, what you need is a, like a matrix structure, even if I did not like them too much in my countries, uh, in my companies, when I was in the companies. But uh, you need a team um, that is around somebody like Dorote or myself, who is specialized in the topic and who can also give guidance, advice, and also help during these processes. Um, because the processes will not just happen, and also the projects will not just happen. But 
I do it in practice in a way that I cooperate, and then and I know that Dorothe is also doing it like this, um, that, that we cooperate with the respective minister who is then responsible in their area. For business, it's easier because I'm also responsible uh, for business and economics, but uh, also in the health sector or especially in schooling, where the um, Minister of Education and myself work together and to form the master plan, or the Minister of Infrastructure and myself. And it is all about these projects and you need to monitor them. Uh, you need to roll them out like in companies, even if uh, um, in politics we sometimes uh, do not like this comparison, but it needs the principles of, uh, um, of large uh, companies because there is not so much difference, a little bit more because, but you have a lot of stakeholders, like you have as a startup, you have different stakeholders. You also have the stakeholders when you are in politics or in Businesses. And I think this is it's a combination of both, of all being prepared, but also for somebody driving the whole process and keeping it alive, because sometimes it will just not happen um, by itself. Okay. And maybe, uh, may I add one sentence? Um, and along the way, when you build up or put up uh, such a ministry, you would need to pass a law right by the way that um, forbids sensitivity. I think that would help too. Okay, thank you, Dorothee. I just got the message that you're, you have to leave the conversation or your, your time is up. Well, as we said, if it's fine with, with the seven o'clock, I just have a call after seven, so that's fine. I can do one more question if it's okay. okay. Um, then I'll, I'll start with you on, on the next uh, topic and that is the topic of human capital. So um, I think a common theme that, that the three of you have been touching upon is the fact that we need the right people. We need the specialists um, who work in the companies, whether it's startups or large corporates, in order to manage digitalization, in order to implement digitalization, speaking of software developers. And my question to, to, to all three of you is, um, how do you plan to staff the thousands of open IT jobs um, that have not been filled so far. So just to take some figures in Germany, we have, according to Bitkom, more than 120,000 open IT positions. In Austria, we're talking about something between 10 to 15,000. And uh, in Switzerland, we're talking about five to 10,000 open IT positions. What measures are you taking and, and what are your plans for this? I think Mark already said a lot about it today. Um, it already begins at school, and for me, it begins in primary school. We need to get students excited about IT at school. We need them to be excited about technology. So um, I was happy that my kids were excited um, with um, SpaceX um, the other night. Um, of course, now it's on Saturday, maybe, due to the German weather conditions. <laughs> um, but um, programming must be a compulsory subject. Um, we must also convince the girls. And that's why I say we have to start very early that it's cool and there's no big difference. When you are six years old, it's a big difference when you are 13 or 14 and then try to start. So this topic has unfortunately been neglected. And I don't know how it's in Switzerland or Austria, but in Germany, it's still okay if you're a grown up woman and you are giggling and saying, ah, in math, I wasn't very good in math. Ah. No one would ever say that they were really bad in German in school because everyone would think they are stupid. Yeah. But in math or um, physics, that's still fine or chemistry. And that's not okay. Or we had um, the other retailer a few years ago, they sold shirts where they said, yeah, I was only. Um, I was only there in math, but uh, I didn't play a role and that's fine. And, and everyone bought those shirts. Um, I think this is way important. And then the other way, not only take your own human capital, but make everyone move to Europe or to Germany or to Switzerland and Austria is that to show them that we have um, a different surrounding that you are really free when you are coming to our country. So politics, of course, is important. Now you see it in the COVID crisis, how important it is, how you deal with it, and what, what, what kind of, 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 of medicine there is, and how the hospitals are. So I'm sure that not only each German, but each Austrian, each 
um, um, women or men coming from Switzerland, when we are somewhere abroad and we are on vacation and we are getting sick, the first thought is, I want to go back. I want to be in my own hospital, in my own country. And I think this is something which is really important too. So we have, um, of course, our landscape. We have, have, of course, our democracy, our political system, our healthcare system is really, really important. But the freedom in our universities, the freedom when you had the discussion right today on Twitter, yeah. Um, in, Mark said Twitter wouldn't have been invented in Germany, yes. But now, if they want to move to one of our countries, it would be maybe better for those platforms. So just to put it that way. So we have a lot of advantages con compared to other countries. And I co I'm coming back to my first answer when I talked about um, AI. It's all about our values too. And I truly and strongly believe in our values. And I think those are with the best in the world. And so everyone can come to us too. Thank you. Margarete. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, Dodi. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, Margarete, also touching upon the topic of human capital. Um, you have started initiatives such as Fit for Internet, which aim to increase the competence level of digital literacy in Austria. Um, what are some of the initiatives that, that you are driving forward in order to really upskill the Austrian population and provide the staff that we need uh, in the area of IT? Can you send me well, Ben? Is it okay? It's fine. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. So I am. Um, I also have to leave soon. Uh, unfortunately, we've talked now. It was very interesting. Um, we have uh, um, done this uh, platform, especially Fit for Internet. It's so called My Baby um, a platform. Fit for Internet is uh, something where we are joining together with companies. Um, and to have different projects to increase the level of digitalization so that everybody is, uh, is um, starting at the level where he, she or he is. And uh, one example is which I mentioned before is that the European Union has developed a very good uh, a scala or schedule uh, about the uh, digital uh, skills uh, and this on uh, which level you are. But I have not found one country inside the European uh, Union or, or outside in Europe as a whole who has implemented this. Therefore, we have taken this and now each Austrian can do this online, can uh, see where my or his, her or his digital skills are on which level in the, in the daily area. And now we're developing the skills more in, in the expert area. And from there on, uh, we are uh, um, starting a platform where according to where I am, I can have the digital courses uh, online learning courses. And here, coming from the IT sector, I've discussed with SAP, with IBM, with Cisco, and others to provide their courses, which they online e learning courses, which they normally give only to their employees, publicly to all people. And this is an idea which I'm very much fond about. Then you're responsible yourself, but you have access to it and you can know where you start from. And this is one of my um, most important projects. And it's uh, all about learning outside school. The school master plan uh, for digitalization is different. This digital master plan for schools, but uh, in, uh, outside, it's uh, something we need to learn in our daily, in our daily lives and uh, it needs to be accessible uh, for everybody. So I want to say thank you. Um, ben, uh, by the way, I very much like your figure, which is uh, uh, in the corner of my TV screen and behind your shoulder. So take care and uh, thank you very much that I could join you. Thanks, Margarete. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So, Mark, I think it's it's just you and me left in this in this conversation. Let um, me let me Ben let me let me give you just uh, I think everybody needs to leave now. But let me give you one last answer to that, which has not been touched. Maybe it's not about education, 
um, it's not about the universities, but it's about lifelong learning. My father learned a job. He was an architect and he kept his skills basically for four decades. That was okay. And I think for all our parents, it was the same. Today, you have to relearn and relearn and relearn and this lifelong learning kind of mentality, but also to have the offers to do so is absolutely crucial uh, to, to what you just mentioned, to fill up um, the empty spaces that are definitely uh, looking for talents. Mm -hmm. one, one last question. Um, I, I, I had a look at the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Index. Um, Switzerland ranks number five. And what really struck me is that from all the countries uh, participating or that have been analyzed um, in this index, Switzerland was number one when it comes to the topic of skills. Um, so obviously it seems that you have an excellent education and a, and a, a culture that really fosters learning and, and, and skilling also in the area of IT um, research uh, and education. Um, but one thing struck me when I talked to one of the C-level executives I met at your digital day last year. And um, with We Are Developers, we're one of the largest platforms for software developers in Europe. So we reach hundreds of thousands of developers and uh, connect them with companies. And when I talked to this executive, I told him, you know, he, he told me about how many developers he's missing and, and that he has a huge need for, for a new staff. And I said, well, we can provide this. We can provide developers from all across Europe um, to join your company. He said, um, I would love to do that. But unfortunately, in Switzerland, we have a quota and we've reached the, you know, the, the limit of this quota. And we're literally by law not able to take up new uh, IT talents from abroad. Very good point to finish this up. You, so you see at the end of the day, I think this has been a good discussion. Um, interesting discussion, how complex it is. Um, and the framework is so important. Immigration laws uh, in Switzerland are actually hindering talents to come to Switzerland. And I checked also, again, you see I'm, I'm a ranking guy because I think it's, it's the aggregation of actually what, how strong we are. In immigration laws, uh, Switzerland is um, on rank 26. By the way, Germany only 25. And now listen to this, to all Austrian friends here. Austria 51, um, but you are right. Um, quotas and immigration laws are crucial, you know, to bring in the people, to bring in the talents. Last point, yes, Switzerland is extremely well skilled, still, surprisingly to me. That uh, is the reason why Google has its largest um, out of America base uh, in Zurich with roughly 4,000 people working out of, I think, 95 different nations. Um, but let's not uh, relax on, on that uh, good and, and, and strong point. Uh, I think we need to keep on running. And I would like to thank you for making this possible. This is a wonderful platform. And uh, what you have achieved with We Are Developers is Thanks. extremely remarkable, Ben, really. High respect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Um, I know you're on a tight schedule. so. Um, thanks for your contribution also in the name of the developers joining us today. And I look forward thank to you. staying in touch. Have a bye, good day. everybody. Thank you, Ben. Bye. Was you. fun. Bye bye. bye. Take care. I hope you really enjoyed this panel discussion. As you see, very complex topics, really interesting input. We'll be back at 7.15 Central European time with our last speaker for the day, Jimmy Song. So make sure you set your alarm and be back at 7.15.
Hello everybody, we made it to the last session of the day 4 of the Weird Developers Life Week and it's a particularly important session because we have such an amazing speaker coming up ahead interesting topic and a really relevant one, a really current one let's give it up for Jimmy Song uh, but just before I tell you who is he I want to remind you about Slido I haven't mentioned for the last two sessions so it's really important that you actually go there on slido.com, use the code LIFE2020 or if you're in the Weird Developers website, right next to this video you should see where you can type your questions, your comments, your feedback. It's really good for the speaker to know you're listening, so please be active throughout the whole session and at the end as well. So who's Jimmy Song? Well, I'm sure if you're watching this session you actually already know who he is, but for the ones who have are, who are just tuning in and don't know Jimmy's work, he's a Bitcoin developer, educator and entrepreneur and he has, he's an author of two books for Bitcoin, Programming Bitcoin with O'Reilly and The Little Bitcoin Book. I'm sure he has a lot to, to tell us about Bitcoin today, so let's give it up for Jimmy. Hi Jimmy, welcome to have happy to have you here. Welcome to the Weird Developers Life Week, day number four. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is very exciting. I how I like how we have a matching setting of your palm tree and uh, this plant that I have. Uh, I'm not sure about the name <laughs> actually, <laughs> but I, I I like the the, the style here. So I already briefed everybody about the questions and that they should keep it active. So, and we'll be looking at this at the end. Um, yeah, you're our last session for day four. Uh, very excited to, to hear what you have to say about Bitcoin. So the stage is now fully yours and you can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, howdy, everybody. My name is Jimmy Song. And, uh, and uh, as you might have heard, I, I've been a developer for the past 22 years, uh, working in various industries and, and so on. I've been in Bitcoin uh, for the last eight years, um, it, it, mostly as a developer. I, I actually got in back in 2011, but as a developer uh, since about 2013. Anyway. Um, about a year ago, I was at the Oslo Freedom Forum uh, in, in Oslo, Norway, and this is uh, a conference put on by the uh, Human Rights Foundation where they bring a lot of people uh, from around the world that are fighting for human rights. Um, you know, it could be, you know, women's rights in some Middle Eastern country. It could be human rights in some Latin American country or, uh, you know, uh, maybe even uh, people from North Korea or something, uh, you know, refugees from North Korea and so on. Um, and it was, it was kind of a surreal moment for me because I've been a developer for 20 years. And though I care about human rights, I was kind of like, what am I doing here? Why, why, why are... Why is some Bitcoin guy at the Human Rights Forum? Um, and that's, uh, that was something that I was kind of asking, but uh, it turned out that there was a very good answer. Um, Alex Gladstein, who's the Chief Strategy Officer for the uh, Human Rights Foundation, uh, uh, had recognized uh, uh, about uh, you know, a few years ago that Bitcoin was becoming more and more of a thing in the human rights realm. Um, and this is ostensibly because of, uh, of the things that uh, Bitcoin allows. Uh, the reason why he invited me to be at the Oslo Freedom Forum and to speak at the various uh, panels there was because money is a huge problem in the human rights world. Um, it turns out uh, that there's a lot of um, organizations that have plenty of funding, uh, for example, to you know, help uh, Afghan women um, you know, get more uh, rights, for example. Um, but it's very hard to actually send the money to those people. So uh, one of the things that I got to do while I was at the Oslo Freedom Forum was to teach a bunch of, uh, you know, human rights activists how to use Bitcoin so that they can get money to their quote unquote boots on the ground, the people that are actually, um, you know, uh, 
doing these programs and uh, trying to, uh, you know, fight for more rights in, in those various uh, distressed places. Uh, so that is all to say that my talk today is all about how Bitcoin changes incentives, how Bitcoin um, changes a lot of the monetary equation that that's happening all around the world. Um, and, you know, I, I speak as a developer mostly, but also as somebody that's studied a lot of the monetary things that are going on today. Um, if you get anything out of this talk, uh, I want you to understand that Bitcoin changes a lot of things and it fixes a lot of the inherent problems that are in today's system, what I would call the fiat system, the fiat money system. And um, I, I can't think of a better time to be talking about that as a lot of people are asking, well, if we're printing a lot of this money to fix this stuff, why, do, why are we paying taxes at all? And questions like that. That and more coming up. So let's uh, let's first. Uh, so I've organized this talk in sort of four different uh, at four different levels. Um, if you think about incentives in general, there are uh, various levels at which the incentives work. Uh, so the first level that we're going to talk about is at the individual level. So at the personal level, um, uh, that that is, uh, you know, what how do incentives change at the individual level? Uh, the second level that we're going to talk about is at the company level, and this is, uh, like it or not, how most peop uh, most civilizations now are organized is uh, you're you don't belong to a tribe or a group anymore. It's really whatever company you happen to work for. Um, the, the level above that would be nations, and this would be, you know, the typical nations that are all around the globe and, um, you know, how they operate with respect uh, to things and how Bitcoin changes incentives there. And finally, at the global level, how things are changed at the global level as a result of, uh, of Bitcoin existing. So uh, let's, uh, let's get started and talk about the individual level. And uh, the first thing to recognize here is that Right now, there is no good way, no easy way to store value. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that there's no easy way to make sure that you can save your labor, save your money, save your wealth, so save value. Um, and that, that's what, uh, in economics, what you would call the store of value function. Um, there, there really isn't one. Uh, and you might think, well, you know, I could keep it in cash and that, that works pretty well. Well, not, not quite. Um, and especially if you come from a hyperinflating country, you know how bad that could be. Um, this is the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar has been inflating probably at the slowest rate uh, relative to everything else in the past uh, 60 years or so. Um, and the, uh, this, is, uh, this is the M2 money supply. If you don't know what that is, there, there's an economic uh, definition based on uh, near money and so on. But you can sort of think of it as all of the money that exists uh, in U.S. dollars. Um, in 1959, this number was $286.6 billion. That's how much M2 money existed in 1959. Um, as of a few weeks ago, uh, it's... 17.7 trillion dollars. So it's increased 61x in the last 61 years. Um, and if you annualize that, that ends up being roughly about 7%. This is what we would call in economics a monetary expansion of the US dollar. Now, this is very different than what you would call the, the inflation rate, which is uh, a synonym for the CPI or the consumer price index, which is you know, what, what basket of goods, how, how quickly those things are going up. Uh, but, the, but, you know, if you, if you keep, uh, if you kept a dollar in 1959, it would be, as a fraction of the whole, it would be 160, uh, 1 over 61 fraction of, uh, of uh, you know, what, what, um, uh, what it would be today. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a tremendous... Um, you know, expansion of money. And that means that your dollar is worth much, much less. And this is pretty much the best currency. Uh, every other currency has done much, much worse. Um, 
So as a result, uh, you know, people look for ways to go store value. Um, and uh, typically the ways in which people store value are these three things up here at the bottom. Uh, a lot of people um, use real estate as a way to store value. A lot of people use uh, the stock exchange as a way to store value. And a lot of people use gold as a way to store value. And the thing to notice about all of them is that they have high transaction costs. So anyone that's bought or sold a home knows how much the uh, real estate agents take uh, you know, anyone that's, uh, you know, bought or sold stocks, you know that they take commission with every trade. Anyone that's taken physical delivery of gold, there's a delivery fee and everything like that. Um, these are not very accessible to most people around the world. And, uh, and you know, they, they have some utility, but they, they are more used now as a store of value. Now, that leads to another consequence, and it's that there's a lot more effort spent on storing rather than creating. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if, uh, if you're going to store value in real estate uh, or stocks especially, you're going to have to do a lot of research. This is a lot of time spent figuring out which property to invest in or which stock to invest in. And anyone, uh, if you know anyone rich, you know this is true. They, they spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out where to put their money or else they pay somebody else to take care of that for them. And it's, a, it's an additional cost. And th this is a lot more effort that's, uh, that's spent on storing value rather than creating value. These are oftentimes the people that are best positioned to create new businesses, uh, to be entrepreneurs. Instead, um, they're spending all of this time and effort into uh, trying to store value. That is, they're, they're kind of like running in order running on a treadmill, like uh, they're, they're running in order to stay in the same place, essentially. And that means that uh, for a lot of other people, instead of uh, spending all of this time and energy into research, what they end up doing is just not bothering to store value at all. You don't need a store of value if there's no value. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, that is the attitude of a lot of people is that they, in, in, instead of trying to save for the future, what they end up doing is they just spend everything and just uh, you know do, do whatever. And that in turn leads to a lot of this stuff, uh, asset inflation, materialism, and consumption. And uh, you might not know what all of these things uh, on the slide are, but I'll explain them. So the first one is a taxi cab medallion issued by the city of New York. Um, and essentially, these uh, are, there, there's a limited number of them. And back in the 80s, they used to cost about $50,000. It, it gives you the right to drive a cab in the city of New York. Um, at a certain point, though, hedge funds and others uh, saw this as a good investment because there were always a limited number of cabs. So uh, based on that scarcity, they would buy them up. At, at a certain point, they were worth $2 million uh, until Uber came along and destroyed the value of these. Uh, you know, it, that, that's what, uh, you know, it has utility, but it, it started taking on a store of value premium as a result. Uh, the second one is a Michael Jordan rookie card, PSA 10. This is the highest grade of a rookie card that you can get. It's worth a lot of money. Again, it has utility for Michael Jordan fans, but because of their rarity, they take it on a store of value premium. Uh, the last one is a Rothko painting. Again, um, you know, they, they, they have a utility. They can go decorate someplace or you can appreciate it as like a work of genius or whatever. Uh, but Again, there, uh, there's a store of value premium on top of the, uh, of the utility value that it might have. Um, the, the next two, uh, two items are the Chanel handbag and a Bugatti car. Um, the first one is a $100,000 Chanel handbag, and that's because the chain is made out of diamonds. And the second one is a $10 million Bugatti car. Um, now... Uh, when when you're when you don't want to store value, you might as well live it up, and that 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 becomes sort of like this rampant materialism that happens at the individual level. Um, and this last uh, last photo is a rapper that's eating a gold uh, gold foil covered donut, um, and if, uh, and the donut costs a thousand dollars. You know, th this is what people tend to do as sort of living it up when uh, when there's no easy way to store value, and unfortunately, this this has happened. And, and the big thing to recognize here is that when there's a store of value premium on something that has utility, what tends to happen is that people um, 
uh, people that need to use it don't get access to it because the uh, because of the store of value premium. This is why a lot of people can't afford real estate. Real estate has a tremendous store of value premium, uh, and real estate all around the world over the past uh, 12, 13 years has uh, gone insanely high. Um, and you know, it, there's been small corrections here and there, uh, but it's uh, it's completely unaffordable for most people because of the store of value premium that it has. Uh, so instead of it going towards the people that that would actually use it, it's going towards people that um, that want to actually just store value and keep their saving. Um, in fact, there, there are entire cities in China, they call them ghost cities, uh, that, that are built uh, exclusively so that people have a place to invest. Uh, there, there are more second homes that are being sold than first homes in China at this point because they a lot of these people want to store value. Uh, they know that real estate um, is is somewhat limited. So by having these empty ghost cities, they're able to buy uh, condos in them and store their value that way instead of keeping it in their local currency. And all that is to say that uh, it, at the individual level currently under the fiat system that we're under, uh, there's an emphasis on survival and not entrepreneurship. And there's uh, and you guys all know this from the past uh, past few months that there's been a lot of money printing. And this is an amusing meme uh, that's come out of that. This is the money printer go burr meme, which is essentially that every government around the world seems to be printing money uh, nonstop. And, uh, and that means that as a result, uh, all of that uh, money printing is, is causing uh, everyone else to have to run faster on their treadmill to, uh, to keep storing value. And instead of uh, focusing on new goods, services, uh, new businesses that they can create, they are trying to uh, store whatever little wealth they have. And this, this is the sad reality of the world today. Um, so how does Bitcoin change things at the individual level? Well, first of all, there is an easy way to store value with Bitcoin, and that is the main value proposition. Um, so uh, you, you don't have to be a Silicon Valley insider with uh, intricate knowledge of PE ratios and possible competitors that might be buying out a stock or whatever in order to, uh, to store value effectively. Um, it's, it, it doesn't matter if you're a Silicon Valley insider or a farmer in Indonesia. You both get the same Bitcoin, and if you if you get that Bitcoin, you get the same upside uh, a, a, as anybody else. That fungibility ends up being very very useful for fairness. Um, there's a lot more effort uh, spent on creating new goods and services rather than on research. Uh, a lot of the things that you would uh, that have a store of value premium now go down to the utility value and uh, you know, people that would actually use it for new goods and services and so on uh, will, will acquire these items rather than the people that are looking to store value because they don't have a, place to, a good place to put their money. And uh, in, instead of an emphasis on survival, you don't have to run on the treadmill in order to stand still uh, in a financial sense. Instead, you can focus on new, um, you know, new, businesses, new goods, products, services that you can create in order to make even more money and thus adding to civilization. So that's at the individual level. Uh, the incentives change greatly and you can see why, uh, you know, for somebody that, uh, you know, that as Bitcoin comes more into prominence, they, they would, uh, you know, create more businesses and services and things like that. Um, the next level up, at least right now, are companies. Uh, and, and sadly, this is how most people identify themselves is who they work for or what they do uh, for work. And, uh, and th this is sort of like the, what, what in ancient times would be like kind of like a tribe. Um, the, but th this is how we're organized. The, the first thing to know about uh, companies uh, is the Cantillon effect. And this is uh, if you don't know what this is, uh, this is named after an uh, Irish uh, French economist uh, from the 18th century, Richard Cantillon. And he uh, observed uh, with the Bank of England, which is the first central bank uh, you know, in, in the world, um, that the first spenders of newly printed money got all of the benefits and everybody down the line um, does not. Uh, so, for example, uh, the government is usually the first to um, 
to be able to spend the money. Um, in the modern central banking world, it turns out that a lot of big companies are the first ones to spend the money. Why? Because they have access to really cheap loans as a result of uh, central banking policy. Um, not a lot of people know this, but the biggest lenders of money are commercial banks. Uh, these are not banks where you you have like a branch in the corner with ATMs and so on. They, they almost operate exclusively in the corporate realm where they, uh, you know, they're, they're able to issue loans to uh, large businesses and so on in the hundreds of millions to billions of dollars um, very, very, very quickly. And they're the ones that uh, that have uh, the benefit of the Cantillon effect uh, as a result of being gigantic and as a result of having these relationships with these um, uh, these uh, you know large commercial banks. And if you think about it, it's rational from the uh, commercial bank's perspective because if you have like uh, you know a billion dollars to lend, uh, you could give two loans to two large businesses or you could give out a hundred loans to you know uh, yeah. You know, a uh, uh, hundred different businesses. What what would you rather do, right? Like it, it, the the overhead of just doing two businesses is way better, and you would probably uh, give a lower interest rate so that you can just uh, you know get it done with a lot faster. Now, as a result of these cheap loans that large companies get all around the world, um, we, we get what's called debt fueled growth, and there's a lot of ways in which you can leverage money in order to uh, you know grow as a company. So uh, the first one there is, uh, you know, the everyday low price. This is the Walmart motto. Uh, but this is a strategy that Walmart and Amazon have done, now, which is to underprice everybody else, um, you know, uh, get them kicked off out of the market and then, you know, uh, have a monopoly and be able to charge uh, more money later. Um, and this, is, this, this has worked very well for Walmart and Amazon. Um, and they've made many, many billions of dollars as a, as a result. The second one here is uh, it, it, it represents just uh, being able to hire the very best people. And this is what I would call the Facebook or Google strategy. Um, and that's to hire the absolute best people, uh, even if you're not necessarily using them for doing the uh, doing work that they're fitted to do. So um, I know for many of you that are uh, that are listening to this, if you're a developer uh, at Google or Facebook, you know a lot of people that aren't necessarily doing the most challenging things. They're they're being asked to do kind of mundane tasks, and uh, and the talent that they have and the tasks that they have uh, don't necessarily match up. Well, there's a reason why Google and Facebook do this. It's because they don't want as much competition. They would rather hire all of these people um, at insanely high rates in order to keep them off the market so that they don't have as much competition. And this is a, a, an excellent way that they found in order to keep, um, keep a, uh, by keeping a lot of the talent off, uh, they're able to have more of a natural monopoly. Uh, the the third one here is lobbying, um, and this doesn't make sense if you're a small company. There's just not enough of a budget in order to lobby uh, governments in order to uh, create regulations for you. But after uh, after a certain size, it makes total sense to go lobby government. Um, there there's a famous story of um, you know organic produce in the United States. Um, you know uh, they. Uh, uh, Somebody at Walmart wanted to create, uh, you know, an organic line of products for their grocery store. They found out what, uh, how hard it was, and that it would cost way more, and that their customers probably wouldn't pay for them. Uh, so uh, they they had a budget of about five million dollars to uh, implement this program. They were like, "This isn't going to get us anywhere." So they decided, "Okay, well, actually, we can. Uh, we're going to go lobby Congress." So. They lobby Congress. They managed to change the definition of organic so that it would be something that they could afford. Uh, of course, downgrading uh, actually what what the uh, name organic meant, and they were able to enter that market as a result of that. Now, th this is um, you know th this sort of like regulatory arbitrage is is totally common in large companies, and this is a way in which you can use uh, you know that. Uh, in order to gain a competitive advantage over your peers. 
and last but not least, uh, if, if, if none of these other things work, what you can do is just buy out your competitors. And this has happened a lot in different industries is you have a small startup that's doing uh, something that you, you're not very good at. You can just buy them up because you can do what's called the leverage buyout. You can, um, you can use the cash on hand, but it's easier if you just borrow the money, buy them out, issue the stock, and, and, and then you're done. Um, and if even that doesn't work, what you can do is take the money uh, from your loans and buy back stock. And this is what a lot of airlines have done, uh, at least in the United States, is to buy back their own stock as a way uh, to uh, prop, uh, prop up your stock price so that the executives can get compensated. So a lot of really bad incentives as a result of this bad debt fuel growth. And what that means is that uh, we get a winner-take-all economy. Um, there's a tendency towards centralization. Giant companies that uh, you know that are "quote unquote" too big to fail. Um, and I put a picture of the uni uh, of a unicorn up there because um, you know that's at least in Silicon Valley parlance uh, what a company needs to be before they matter. The, uh, a, a unicorn is a billion-dollar company, um, and. I, I put that up there because VCs are not stupid. They they know all this. They they know that in order to matter at all in any way, shape, or form, you need to be of, of a certain size. And a billion is uh, currently the mark that they they put on there. But after you're a certain size, you have all of these other advantages that I talked about on the previous slide. You you can you can uh, recruit the best people. You can underprice everybody. You can uh, you know, uh, you know do buyouts of other companies and so on. And that means that ultimately uh, there's an emphasis on size and not on innovation. And this is uh, a cartoon that I found, I think, that is very, very appropriate. So, you know, the guy is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, getting dragged by a bunch of slaves and then he comes up with this idea of a wheel. And then instead of uh, using the wheel to help these guys, he's using the wheel to whip them to go faster. Now, uh, it's a hilarious cartoon, but it, it gives you sort of insight into what is going on. Because, um, you know, in order to manage these giant companies, you need a lot of management. Um, the, if you think about it, small companies actually have a lot of advantages over big companies. Uh, namely, that you can know everybody in a small company. Um, uh, there, there's a, a number from uh, psychology called Dunbar's number, and we think that's around 100, to, somewhere between 100 and 200. Uh, beyond Dunbar's number, beyond a certain number, it's, it's very hard to keep track of everybody. So once a company gets uh, past uh, the size of a Dunbar number, it's very, you, you have to have top-down management uh, that keeps track of what everyone else is doing. Um, and uh, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, these giant companies, which are way bigger than Dunbar's number, this is what they end up op optimizing on, is making sure that everyone is doing something, uh, uh, doing what they're supposed to do, instead of actually innovating on new products and companies. Um, and this is why a lot of big companies, they're, they're, they're kind of zombie companies. They don't they're not really creating or uh, creating new goods or services. Um, I read earlier this week about how GE, uh, General Electric, uh, which was uh, the company founded by Thomas Edison, is no longer manufacturing light bulbs. Uh, you know, th this is one of the you know inventions of Thomas Edison that he founded the company on. Uh, and, and and this is because GE at this point is a zombie company. They're way way big, uh, and they're they're sort of living this. Uh, existence that's uh, that's living off of government generosity than any innovation or anything that they're creating in the world. So how does Bitcoin change things at the co company level? Well, first of all, there's no Cantillon effect. And if there's no Cantillon effect, that means that there's no debt fuel growth that's unfair that, that exists only for big companies. And instead of a winner-take-all economy, what you have are a lot smaller companies that are able to compete uh, with the inherent advantages that they have. And instead of companies growing at all costs, you have an emphasis on goods and services, on innovation, on products. And that, uh, that, that creates a lot more goods and services for civilization. This is what makes civilization grow. So that's at the individual and company level. Now let's move up another level to the nation level. And this is what happened, uh, what, what the incentives currently are at the nation level. Well, first of all, 
the, most of the apparatus of the nation level is a system to support companies. And uh, we've already talked about how the banking system is made so that companies can get funneled all this money and so on. Uh, but think about something like the education system. It takes a very creative human being and, uh, and spits out uh, somebody that is fit for a particular task, whether it be a software engineer or an accountant or a lawyer or something else. Um, all of these, uh, uh, you know, it, it takes a very creative human being and essentially spits out a cog for a machine. Um, and these large companies are machines. Uh, and you, you have to have very defined roles in large companies because you need to be able to replace them because the apparatus is so large. When, when you fi uh, fire someone or someone leaves, you need to fit them and you have very specific roles for people. And that's uh, that, that's sort of the system that, uh, that the rest of, uh, you know, that these nations are churning out because of, uh, of the large companies that are, uh, that exist in, in, in the world today. Um, if you think about regulation, they're mostly there to support large companies. It's to make sure that they don't go down, that they're not, that, that they don't fail, that, uh, you know, the incumbents essentially stay and that new competitors uh, have a hard time getting in. Um, and th this is part of most res uh, regulation is essentially they're supported by the big companies uh, as a way to keep out smaller competitors. Um, now, healthcare in other countries is, uh, is a little different, but at least in the United States for a long time, healthcare was a reason to work at a big company. Even now, it's very difficult to get a very good affordable healthcare plan unless you work for a big company. Um, and the reason why that is, uh, is because the you know these nations, uh, these governments want you to work for big companies. They, they, they want you to be in these companies so that these companies can keep going because they're, they're more controllable than tiny companies that, that, that would be much harder to control. The other thing at the nation state level is that they have the control of money and every single government uh, in existence currently um, you know, has a central bank. Um, and, uh, and that means that uh, the central bank has the power to print money and they, that is a giant moral hazard. And, uh, and as a result of this moral hazard, uh, and by moral hazard, I mean uh, incentives such that you can benefit yourself, um, you get what, what I call a lot of rent seekers. And rent seeking, um, if you don't know what that is, is basically the act of taxing some sort of transaction without adding any value in it. And this is a particularly hilarious example, assistant to the aid of the deputy vice chairman to the community of the committee to reduce Pentagon bureaucracy. Um, uh, the, a lot of these bureaucracies tend to uh, tend to add a lot more rent seekers, uh, people that aren't really doing anything, uh, but uh, but, you know, still get paid that, that are sort of extracting rent from everybody else. Um, and if you ask any management consultant, this isn't just endemic in government institutions. This is also endemic in a lot of companies. And you can think of them sort of as extensions of government in many ways, because a lot of HR departments, for example, are sort of like apparatuses of government. They, they have to be there in order to comply with all of the rules and regulations that a government creates. And that means that because of this moral hazard, this ability to print money, that uh, most governments are completely disconnected from price. Uh, and this is an example from the United States. Uh, but in the U.S., we, we had this program called Obamacare. Um, uh, it's a uh, health care for all that was instituted uh, under President Obama. And they created this website. Uh, they, they made it so that everyone had to go get um, uh, health insurance from the private market. Um, and in order to do that, they decided that there was going to be a website, healthcare.gov, that would be specific for um, everyone to go on and be able to buy health insurance. Um, and if you've heard of this fiasco, you know that when the website went live, it went down almost immediately. Um, turned out that it couldn't handle even 50 concurrent users and that it was a complete disaster from that perspective. Now, what, what happened with this? How did, how did it come to this? Well, turned out that the original Obamacare bill um, allocated $700 million uh, for the creation of this website. And if you're thinking $700 million sounds like a lot for a website, it, it kind of was. Um, the contract went to a small company in Chicago who took 18 months to build the website. And of course, it didn't work. It didn't work at all. It couldn't even handle 50 concurrent users. 
Um, so Todd Park, who was CTO of the United States at the time, um, uh, was, was sent in to see what he can do to fix this problem. Uh, he saw that it was a disaster. He, uh, he, need, he needed more help. So he flew out to Silicon Valley, talked to a couple of engineers at Google, and uh, basically told them, hey, your country needs you. Can you come help us out? Uh, he hired them. They, he brought them back to D.C., they in turn hired an, uh, a bunch more people and they managed to fix the website so that it at least ran. Uh, but then they, uh, they, they told uh, all the officials, hey, you know what, like this website is a piece of crap and we're going to have to rebuild this thing from scratch if you want it to last. Um, and they said, sure, go for it. How much is it gonna cost? How long is it gonna take? And they said, well, you know, I, I think this estimate is high, but it's, you know, it's going to cost $10 million and it's going to cost nine weeks uh, and, and it's going to take nine weeks. And of course, they managed to do it in uh, nine weeks and $10 million. Uh, but think about how much the original website cost, $700 million, 18 months. Uh, so it was like 80 times shorter and 70 times cheaper in order to build this website. What caused... <laughs> this complete disconnect from price. It's because governments with their ability to print money have no incentive to, uh, you know, to economize in any way, shape or form because they can always print their own money. And that is, uh, that is the lesson behind healthcare.gov. Uh, what I found out later was that uh, Congress was willing to spend another $200 million on the website if, it, if they could fix it, because this was a complete PR disaster for everyone involved. So um, kind of hilarious, kind of sad, but this is, these are the hazards of a moral, uh, uh, of being able to print your own money. So what does this mean? Well, um, ultimately, this means that uh, governments or nations uh, in a fiat system have a much larger purview and a moral imperative. And what I mean by that is, you know, people say, okay, I have this problem and you have the ability to print money. Therefore you can solve this problem. So why aren't you solving this problem for me? And, uh, the, every politician is incentivized to say, okay, I can fix your problem. Yes, we can do that. We can do that. Of course, all of that is kind of an illusion because when, when you're fixing one problem, you're causing another problem somewhere else. So it's, it's really a zero sum game. When you're printing money, you're taking the savings of other people. Uh, so they're, they're not really fixing a problem per se. They're just causing new problems. It's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, and, you know, and government becomes this uh, giant moral, uh, you know, fixer of everything that's bad. So how does Bitcoin fix uh, a lot of this stuff? Well, well, Bitcoin first changes uh, the government to not specifically support large companies. It, it, it's not an, app, uh, an extension of uh, companies and government is not a, uh, and companies are not an extension of government. And because the control of money is politically neutral and is not controlled by anybody, uh, it, it means that there's no moral hazard. And that means that, they, uh, that governments have to actually adhere to a budget. Instead of deficit spending from super cheap loans that they get out of their central bank, they have to actually care about the price. And that means that, in general, that uh, governments become much more limited and in, in scope. And instead of trying to fix everything for everybody, they... they uh, um, you know, concern themselves with a much more limited uh, set of things like defense, for example. All right, so we've looked at the individual, the company, and the nation level. Let's, let's go to the final step, which is the global level. So what happens at the global level? What are the current incentives and how does Bitcoin change them? Well, first of all, we have we are under the dollar hegemony. Now, if you don't know what this is, it's essentially that the world runs on the dollar standard. Uh, one of the biggest events of the last century was World War II, of course. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that one of the most significant aspects uh, of the end of World War II was a little known um, uh, conference called Bretton Woods. And Bretton Woods is a hotel in New Hampshire uh, essentially, 400 different government ministers from all around the world came to meet at the Bretton Woods Hotel to decide the new monetary world order um, uh, after post-World War II. 
And if that sounds really creepy, that's because it kind of is. Um, what, what they decided there, a bunch of bureaucrats that were unelected mostly, uh, was to decide how the world was going to run monetarily speaking. Um, and what ended up getting decided because the U.S. at the time had most of the gold was to go on the dollar exchange standard. Now, up to this time, central banks held a bunch of gold in their vaults. And when a, when a citizen would come and, um, you know, take the bank notes and, uh, and say, can I redeem this for gold? They would give them the gold. Now, there were suspensions and things like that. But it was essentially the world was on the gold standard in some way, shape or form. What they decided with Bretton Woods was to put the dollar in the vaults instead. So uh, the U.S. would keep all of the gold and any central bank that wanted to uh, convert dollars could ask the U.S. Uh, to convert some of the dollars to gold. But everyone else uh, would not be able to do that. So instead of keeping gold in their vaults, <clears throat> central banks would keep dollars in their vaults. And that, mean, that meant that the dollar had a privileged position everywhere in the world. Um, and to this day, uh, something like eight, 70 to 80 percent of all global trade is settled in dollars for that reason. Now, in 1971, uh, Nixon uh, cut off uh, the convertibility of the dollar into gold. Uh, so from that point on, it became uh, the the dollar became uh, the global standard because of its uh, link to oil. So if you want to buy or sell oil um, from 1971 on, you had to use the dollar, and that continues to this day. And that's why it it's still uh, the dollar is still the um, exchange standard or the global settlement currency. Now, this may not seem like a big deal, except for something I pointed out earlier. <clears throat> There's a global Cantillon effect. There's not just a Cantillon effect of, uh, you know, uh, the people that spend first uh, in, within a country, uh, newly printed money first, get, get all of the benefits. It's that nations that get the newly, money print, uh, newly printed money first get all of the benefits. And this means that third world countries are absolutely screwed. Uh, because they are the last spenders of money. So all of the wealth ends up um, coming out of them and into, uh, into these uh, more first world countries. Um, and oftentimes what they have to do in order to keep up is to print more of their currency. And that in turn leads to hyperinflation. And that's the picture you see there. So when fiat money is not worth picking up, all of that money um, isn't worth picking up at all because they're worth so little. And that in turn means that there's a real lack of use of human capital. Um, so if you think uh, a lot of the individual um, incentives are, are bad, they're much worse in a third world country. So, uh, you know, storing value is so difficult that they use the dollar as a way to store value. Uh, one, one, one of the things in a third world country uh, that that uh, that is popular is to give gifts uh, of uh, crisp one hundred dollar bills because that stores value than anything else that they have, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know storing value is very difficult, um, and you know as a result people are running much faster in order to stand still. And that means that a lot of people aren't using their talents to the best degree that they can because they're 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 so concerned. Uh, with keeping up or keeping whatever value that they have and trying to trying to keep up with the inflation that they have to experience that they aren't really getting to create businesses or uh, or creating goods or products and finally uh, global uh, you know dollar hegemony also means interdependence and fragility and uh, and we're we're seeing this right now with with this per particular crisis is that uh, a lot of a uh, lot of industries are going to are, are already disrupted as a result, uh, and the Fed in the United States is printing lots and lots of money in order to try to stem the tide. But if you think back even to two thousand eight, a small sector, uh, um, you know, the real estate sector in the United States caused a complete global financial crisis. Um, there's interdependence and fragility in the current system, in large part because everyone runs on the dollar. And when there's a crisis in the dollar, everyone feels it. And that, that's what's, uh, what's about to happen once all, the, all of this lockdown stuff ends. We're, we're seeing unemployment rates of 20 plus percent in the United States. I suspect it'll be much worse in other countries as we go on. 
Now, how does Bitcoin change the incentives here? First of all, there's no dollar hegemony. We have a politically neutral money, and that means that there's no global Cantillon effect. Where, where uh, first world countries are not privileged at the expense of third world countries, and that means that all of those people that were <coughs> uh, that that aren't uh, you know getting to start businesses and create new goods and so on in third world countries now have a chance. And instead of interdependence and fragility, you get independence and anti-fragility. You have a lot of a lot more independent, smaller uh, places uh, to try different things and see how they work. And instead of uh, everybody in the world getting screwed, you have uh, you you have small pockets that are trying different things and uh, making the immune system of the world much much better. So. All that is to say that Bitcoin changes incentives in a spectacular way. It, it, it changes everything from the individual, company, nation, and global level. In Bitcoin, we have this saying, Bitcoin fixes this, which is a way of saying that almost all of the ills that you see in society uh, in some way usually um, lead back to some misaligned incentive as a result of fiat money. And, uh, and when, with Bitcoin, you can fix a lot of that as it comes. Uh, and and that's, that's why I am so bullish on Bitcoin. And that's why I think it is a technology that is very useful to humanity. Now, uh, before I end, there's, uh, there's one more thing that I want to add, which is uh, this is how I've been ending my speeches uh, for this year, and uh, it, it seems particularly uh, appropriate given all of the money printing that's going on all around the world. Um, so Cato the Elder, who was a Roman uh, senator, uh, he used to end all of his speeches in the Roman Senate with these three words, Carthago delenda est. And essentially what that means in Latin uh, was Carthage must be destroyed. That was because Carthage was the sworn enemy of Rome. And indeed that happened many years later, but he would end every speech with Carthago delenda est. So I'm going to end my speech with these three words, fiat delenda est. Thank you very much. There is a virtual applause right now, I'm sure, Jimmy. <laughs> Especially with that ending. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we do have some questions on Slido. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we can uh, look at them. Mm -hmm. Good, you should be seeing this right now. Um, mm -hmm. So let's start with the most voted one. I just want to remind everybody who's watching that you can upvote questions. So we go through the most interesting questions uh, for the audience first. What about the effort going into creating Bitcoin? Yeah, so um, there, there's, uh, I, I, I assume this is talking about all of the electricity for mining and things like that and uh, all of that. Um, if you think about the fiat money system, that is, there's way, way more money and, uh, and effort and resources going into creating that. So um, uh, I think in the US, the banking industry is something like 10 to 15% of GDP. Um, that's a tiny amount compared to, you know, what, what the effort going into uh, the mining and uh, mining resources and things like that. Um, whereas the banking resources are, uh, and, you know, they're kind of analogous in the sense that banking resources are there to sort of try to protect your money so that, you know, there's no, uh, you know, if there's a bank run or something like that, you can still get your money um, you know, there's Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, at least in the U.S., similar things abroad. Um, <clears throat> but all of that energy and effort and, uh, and money that's going in, it, 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 it's going into securing Bitcoin itself. And that's, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, otherwise, it would be forgeable, counterfeitable, and, uh, and that would lead to a lot of the same problems as fiat money has. Thank you for your answer. Then we have another very mm -hmm. active, uh, a participant uh, in, in our Real Real Press Live Week, Tom, what would you recommend someone who is new to Bitcoin and blockchain programming? How could they start out digging deeper into this topic? Well, it's, I, I'm glad you asked that because I've written a, a couple of books on the topic. Uh, the first one is 
for programmers. Uh, it, it sounds like Tom, you're a programmer. Um, so it's for programmers that are interested in Bitcoin um, that have uh, that have some uh, that know Python or something like that. Um, you can you can read my book, Programming Bitcoin. It's uh, published by O'Reilly and Associates. It's available in English. Um, Korean, Chinese, I think Japanese is coming out. It might be available in Polish. It's also uh, open sourced on my GitHub. Um, it's uh, Jimmy Song slash Programming Bitcoin, and you can you can go look at it there. Um, the other book that I've written is more for uh, non developers, and that's the Little Bitcoin book, um, and that's uh, that gives you um, just an introduction into a lot of the stuff that I talked about today, uh, but in a in a book form. Uh, it's a very quick read, and you don't have to know anything about Bitcoin to pick it up. And by the end, you should have a very good idea of what's going on. That's a good tip. I should actually also pick it up then because <laughs> not familiar with the topic either. Uh, this is more as a comment than I think uh, uh, a question. This was already written in the beginning of your talk. Uh, mm -hmm. Two minutes for a taxi license. Oh my God. Yeah. It's it's kind of crazy. Uh, they're they're I think down to five hundred thousand or something like that right now because of Uber. Yeah. What do you think will be the future of applied blockchain technologies? Well, so I think the only application of blockchain is Bitcoin. Uh, a lot of the other quote unquote blockchain tech is uh, I, I've looked into a lot of them and I, I I've evaluated them from a technical perspective. Um, and I, I've written a, a pretty lengthy article on why blockchain is hard. And this uh, it's probably my most uh, popular article that I've ever written. So if you Google why blockchain is hard, you should see first link uh, on all of it, but uh, on, on all of the reasons why I think so. Uh, but basically, blockchains are very good at uh, coming to a distributed consensus on uh, something that uh, doesn't want to change very much. Almost every other industry or every other tech requires a lot of iteration, a lot of uh, updates. Um, and that's not what a blockchain is very good for. Uh, it, it, it's very, very slow to change, if at all. And, uh, and you know, it, it's incentivized in such a way that you need everyone to agree. Um, and that, that's just not a very good fit for most applications. Um, for money, it's a great application because you want money to stay consistent. You want, uh, and the 21 million limit in Bitcoin is sacred. That's, that's how many uh, there will be, uh, at, uh, you know, eventually. And that's, uh, you know, no one can really change that. Uh, with, with, you know, like sort of corporate databases or any applications that people typically think of as blockchain, uh, that doesn't happen. I, I've written several other articles in this regard uh, about how blockchain is essentially like snake oil that people are using to sell their IT infrastructure upgrades to various industries. And it can, quote unquote, mag magically uh, solve almost any uh, you know, uh, the, the biggest problem in the industry yet. So I'm, I'm very skeptical of it because I've evaluated a lot of them and uh, they've all come up wanting. Uh, so you can check out the articles I've written on that if you want to know more. So Mike, you know what to, to do. And this is also a very complex answer, very insightful answer. Thank you, Jimmy, for this. Doesn't Bitcoin also need a switch in the mindset of society? Um, I would say so, and uh, and this is a uh, this is a mindset that a lot of people that I've observed that have gotten into Bitcoin, um, you know, go through, which is, um, which is what uh, an economist would call, uh, you know, a lowering of time preference. So when when I say a lowering of time preference, what I mean is that uh, you know, if you're saving for tomorrow, that would mean that you're you're willing to wait in order to get some of the benefits. A high time preference is not willing to wait and just get stuff now. So uh, what Bitcoin does uh, generally to, uh, just anecdotally from my friends and from people that have known in Bitcoin is, is to lower their time preference. Um, so uh, having a child, for example, is a very low time preference activity because as any parent knows, it, it's very, very hard to raise a child and it's, it's a lot of pain, uh, uh, mostly pain for like 18 years. And then you get your benefits way later when you're older and you're alone and things like that. Um, a lot of people in Bitcoin are having kids, which is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting observation, way more than, say, uh, people that are not in Bitcoin. 
Um, so it, it does require a switch uh, in the mentality of, uh, of, of sort of looking long term instead of short term. Uh, but in general, that's that's how civilization gets built. So um, a lot of economists would call the current state of things sort of like decivilizing in the sense that there, there's a lot of incentives to uh, you know, higher time preference in many ways uh, because of the economic policies, because of uh, various political leaders and their incentives. They're, they're in office for a short time. So, you know, they're, they're incentivized to have a very high time preference as well. So um, that mindset switch is something that you get along with Bitcoin. So I'm not, uh, I, I don't think you necessarily need to have low time preference in order to get Bitcoin, but they, they do sort of run together. And, um, and I, I think it does, uh, you know, sort of uh, create, the, uh, create low time preference and Bitcoin at the same time. And uh, I think in general, that's a good thing for civilization because, again, that's how civilization gets built. Thank you for your answer. Um, I think actually with this question, we finished the question. There's a couple of comments. Oslo with the heart. And this is also <laughs> of your talk. Um, great speech. Thanks for your talk. I'm always talking to Europeans on Bitcoin. Your talk added another view or your opinion added another view. Mm. Yeah, and with this being said, I just want to remind everybody that uh, right now you'll be seeing a short survey about Jimmy's talk. So um, I guess small feedback that we collect for each session. Jimmy, thank you so much for tuning in today, uh, participating in our event. If there are more questions uh, come up, we'll make sure we send them to you. So maybe you can tweet about them or answer them in another way. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. I have you, I wish you a great day ahead. I think in your time zone, it's still uh, pretty early. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not that early, uh, but yeah, I, I th thanks for having me for this uh, last session of the day. I think you, you guys have one more day left. Um, enjoy yourselves and learn something. Um, you know, it, it's times like it, it's stuff like this that kind of makes things feel a little normal. I think if we were all just sort of trapped in our homes and not not uh, at least getting some interaction with uh, with people, uh, we would all be going crazy. And uh, and yeah, the world might be a worse place. So uh, conferences like this are very important, and uh, and your connection with them uh, it kind of connects you to humanity. Yeah, thanks. You. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, we were actually preparing for two days of an event. Berlin starting was supposed to start today. Well, um, <laughs> happened. So for us, it is very nice to actually bring new faces and also uh, previous speakers to this virtual reality that we are creating uh, this week. So thank you very much for joining. We really appreciate your uh, your input. Thank so you. I'm gonna stop here my video and I'm gonna mute my. Are back in our. I guess we're back in our studio right now. Uh, we just finished our last session for the day with Jimmy Song, and what a day has been! So many different formats, such a nice uh, way to explore everything and explore what you guys like. Because we had panels, we had sessions, we had code, uh, we had uh, personal development for developers. Um, a whole workshop of two hours and now ending with Bitcoin. So the day was really insightful, very diverse. And I cannot tell you what is expecting us tomorrow. Our last day of the Weird Developers Live Week. It's a bit sad that it's coming to an end, but the day is packed with such a good talks. So make sure you set a reminder for yourself because tomorrow we're starting at 12.15. So a bit later than the whole week. 12:15 uh, Central European time. I just want to make sure, and we're gonna start. I just want to tell you what is happening there, so you can plan your day. We're gonna have front-end performance testing. Then we're gonna go into GraphQL with Uri Goldstein, quantum computing with the 18 years old Alexandra Waldherr. Then we're gonna dive into deep learning and finish the day with conversational AI. So, as you can see, so much to explore tomorrow. A lot of talks for developers. So make sure you send, share this with your friends, set your, uh, um, set your reminders, and you also get an email in the morning with the whole agenda so you can plan your day. I'm Vilana, the community manager for your developers and also host of this whole week. And I wish you a great evening because 
I also cannot wait to go and have some dinner. Bye!